Gwyn Saga, Volume 22, A Day of Destiny, by Keiro Kurimoto. You don't know what it's like to be depressed. In the pale light of the moon, in the dawn of man's blindness, the drop that becomes a pearl. From the Song of Phaedra, the characters, in a play or novel, Gwyn. Leopard-headed super warrior, Marius. The wandering bard. Aldin, brother of Nerys, vizier of Paro. Achilles, Emperor of Chironia, Darius, Grand Duke of Chironia, Emperor's brother, Iris, Octavia, Beautiful Swordsman, Darius' niece, Sylvia, The Princess of Chironia, Aulus, Is the elder of the Twelve Electorate of Chelonia, Elector of Anten Zenon, Head of the Emperor's Pro Army Thousand Dog Knights, General Seninu, Baldur, Viscount of Chironia, Paris, Silvius Ascort, Linus, Count of Paro, Valerius, The Mage of Paro, Linus Right Hand Man, Chapter 1, In the Morning Mists, the people danced all night long, the sound of the kithara playing the Chironian waltz, which had been ringing all through the night, seemed to be still faintly ringing at the bottom of my ears. I wonder if the morning breeze is stirring the strings of the kithara, which were left behind in the drunkenness. The forest has sunk into black shadows, and the morning mist is slowly beginning to swirl over the cobblestones of the streets. Morning will soon be here. The cobblestones were covered with confetti, food scraps, pieces of cups, flowers, ribbons, and many other things. The carriages were carrying people who had fallen asleep on the street after getting drunk or who were going home to take a nap. Without paying attention to it, the lovers are sitting side by side on the stone at the foot of the fountain, hugging their shoulders, putting their hands around their waists, leaning their heads on their shoulders, and falling into the continuation of their private dream. The bonfire had burned out and was emitting a thin cloud of smoke. Black wisps of smoke and ashes flew in the wind and fell into the fountain. The early morning wind was still cold. The frenzied glow of the carnival that had been held in the northern city still lingered in the stone-built streets. The hooves of the horses of the cleaners and patrolling militia clattered as they slowly bent their backs to remove the rubbish and put it in the large baskets on their backs. By now, Obsidian Palace will have finally fallen asleep. The sound of the heels of his shoes clicking on the cobblestones blended with the sound of his hooves. Slowly, a slender figure in a black cloak walked out into the sleeping town, Iris. My sister, the only daughter of the Emperor of Chironia, must be sleeping in a luxurious bed and dreaming of the man she loves. In the blue-gray sky, the white moon Iris floats like a piece of white petal cut into thin strips. Like a figure appearing on the ground, Iris turns the corner of the town without a sound and walks toward the little moon palace. Wherever you look, you can almost smell the lingering scent of the festival's endless paws. The streets will be cleaned, the decorations repaired, and by this evening the appearance will be completely renewed, and the people will once again flood the town for the celebration. Until then, it's time for a short rest. The air was cool and fresh, and the smell of fir trees and dead grass, peculiar to the north, mingled with the smell of smoldering bonfire smoke created a kind of unique and unpleasant fragrance. As if in the throes of some strange and unaccountable excitement, Iris paused and looked behind her from time to time. And when he turned a certain corner and was almost to the Kogetsu Palace, Iris suddenly stopped in her tracks. He looks back to his left and right, and quickly puts his hand on the rapier at his waist. Who's that? His voice was low but clear. It's me. It's me Vir and Baldur, the Viscount. There was an irritation that seemed to be filled with poison. As soon as she heard it, Iris let out a low, mocking laugh and turned away to walk away. Wait! You scream. A small figure came out in the morning mist. Baldur had become somewhat miserable. He was wearing a black cloak with his hood pulled up tightly, but he flipped it off to reveal his face. In the past day, he had already grown thin and his eyes had grown dim, and this Talion half-breed whose physiognomy was even worse than his own, had become even worse, his eyes glittering with mad grief and envy. What's wrong? Iris says with a smile. At this hour of the night, walking alone in seclusion, have you been kicked out of the princess's bedchamber? 
Hey, shut up. Shut up, shut up. Baldur gritted his teeth violently. You blonde devil. How dare you talk to me like that when you know full well what happened to me. I don't care what happened to you. Iris is cool. Either Empress Mariah is displeased with you, or you've been found out and banned. You're just trying to make things worse. Baldur spat into the street. If you're not the one who knows everything. The devil, Archduke Darius' scheme worked. Empress Mariah's plan to assassinate the emperor was exposed. The empress was imprisoned. And I and Marquis Denay were both suspected of having conspired with Yulania and detained at home. The empress is defeated anyway. I knew the Grand Duke had forsaken me for the empress's son-in-law and turned to you. I thought I'd have a better idea, so I went to Marquis Denay and sided with Empress Mariah, but it backfired on me, I can't just sit here and wait to be disposed of. At this rate, I'll be a fool. A fool who's been bamboozled by the spies of Irania. I've come out of hiding to do one or two things to make up for it and then get the hell out of here. First up was you, Iris. I'd cut you down to crush Darius' ambitions, then I'd kill that bastard Gwyn, and if she were any prettier, I'd snatch her away, but she's a pale little thing and I don't want her. It's not going to end like this anyway, but before it does, I'm not going to let you and Gwyn be the only two I have to kill. There's no need for recriminations, Baldur. I don't know what happened, but I don't think Darius saw you the way he did because of me. He only gave you up because he realized that your ugly face and your even uglier nature made you utterly despised by Princess Sylvia. Fuck you. A man like you with a face even a woman would envy doesn't understand. I would have done anything, any dirty thing, to have risen in Chiron's court and brought the others to their knees. I wanted to make them crawl in fear at my feet, the one everyone hates and despises, the one with the bad origins. Now that I've done that, all I want to do is slice your beautiful face into a thousand pieces for revenge. Come on. The rapier is shot out with a sharp sound. The rapier is also sheathed in Iris's hand. Interesting. Iris said as she pulled up the hem of her cloak. There's a reason I've been having such a rough time. Besides, I've always wanted to see who'd be better than you or me in a head-on fight with that rapier you're said to be so good with. It's the sword of a twenty-year grudge. Come at me with all your heart. Otomo. Baldur unfastened his cloak. Iris places the tip of her rapier in her hollowed left palm and flicks it. But wait a minute. Then there's been a political upheaval. Darius hasn't returned to the small moon palace for a long time, so Empress Mariah is an assassin of the emperor. So those two men and women are the empress's pawns. What kind of a poisonous woman would be born a princess of Kumu? and yet sell Celonia to Yulania to get her hands on her husband? She is not only a rare ugly woman, but also a rare evil woman. Don't pretend you didn't know. It's all part of Darius' plan. Baldur's rapier sprang out like a silver snake, and touched Iris's sword with a crisp sound. Enough is enough. What are you really to Darius? You're going to be Sylvia's son-in-law. What's your connection to that bastard minstrel? I'll ask him on his deathbed. I'll teach it to you on your deathbed. Iris said with a funny smile as they struck each other with blinding speed. Hear that and die in peace. My name is Iris, brother to Sylvia's mother and the only legitimate prince of Chironia. What what? Even Baldur was momentarily taken aback. Emperor child. Quickly. Iris stepped in. Gaw. Baldur barely dodged the sword's tip, which pierced his breastplate with great force but he could not dodge all of them. The second thrust, which came after the first, pierced Baldur's side. Whoa! Baldur rolled over with his rapier in his hand. He spasmed violently a few times and stopped moving. You got it. Iris twitches her lips. She lets out a breathless gasp. Look here. The poisonous scorpion of Teruin and the red-haired devil are nothing compared to a nobleman like me whose blood runs through his veins and he's worked himself to death every day knowing no other way to survive. It was an untimely end, well, you can dream of being on the throne in the afterlife. I'll finish you off. He wiped his bloodied rapier on the edge of his cloak, then took it back and staggered closer to Baldur. 
Farewell, Viscount Baldur. It was a brief affair. He took it in his hand and tried to strike a final blow to the throat. A moment. Baldur's body springs back with a flurry. Just in time, Iris's rapier hits the cobblestones and snaps, sending her flying. Baldur's strong arm wraps around Iris's waist as she stumbles, entangling her and knocking her down. You were careless, your highness. Baldur chuckled. No matter what you say, a prince is a prince, a man of refined birth and upbringing is naive. No matter how you look at it, I'm more powerful than you. Now, take off your rapier. Let me go, let me go. As they rolled around on the cobblestones in tandem, her wrists were twisted tightly and a piece of Iris's rapier fell off. Baldur mocked. Come on, it's all yours now. I don't care how you cook it, what? What the hell are you? Suddenly, Baldur's face changed. She rose to her knees, released Iris's wrists, and with great force tore off her cloak and blouse. In the morning light, her breasts, white as suds, were exposed to the naked eye. Baldur sticks out his lower lip and thinks for a moment. Then he smiled slowly and venomously. Iris struggled to repel the man's body as he rose to his knees, but there was no way she could resist his power. Hmm. You're a hell of a prince, huh? Baldur said in a deliberate, languid manner. That's why I thought your face was too pretty for a man. I've always avoided looking at him too closely, so I've been fooled, but in retrospect, I should have known sooner. If you're a real prince, it wouldn't hurt to give Sylvia to me so that I could take her place as Grand Duke. If you're the real prince of Chironia, it wouldn't hurt to give Sylvia to me so I could take her place as Grand Duke. Hey, pretty boy, confess. You're Darius, what? Is Achilles' blood really in your veins? Iris gave up struggling to hide her breasts and turned her face sideways, wildly showing her rejection all over. With a snap, Baldur cruelly grabs Iris' white breasts and twists them. A faint moan escapes from Iris's mouth. Say it, said Baldur, suddenly in high spirits. When it comes to women, Baldur has many ways to enjoy himself. Tell me, what is your name? Let go of, stubborn. Baldur gave Iris a light slap on the cheek. I clearly identified myself as Prince Caronian. That's a very serious misrepresentation of your identity. You'll be tortured and crucified. Are you Sylvia's brother? You don't look much alike, or are you of Darius' blood? Kill him. Iris gritted her teeth. I'm ready to die. Kill. Outrageous. Baldur grinned and moved his hand to groping his chest, at this time clearly. Iris's eyes widened and a look of fear came into her eyes. What to do? His voice has become a little weaker. It's all I know. Baldur mocked. What's a man to do with a woman? You're in the middle of nowhere. Pull her into the alley. No one will come out for a while. There, there. It's an old saying that the fastest way to a woman's heart is through her body. Yes. And... At last, he was lifted up and Iris's voice became a scream. Don't let me go. Forgive me. You said it, finally. Baldur smiled with pleasure as he dragged her struggling body into the alley with great strength. It is the most pleasant thing in the world for me to listen to a woman's cry for help like that. And just like you, the proud one who has deceived me so many times, made me laugh and even wounded me, finally can't hold it in any longer and cries out in a sobbing voice, reminding me that women are no match for men no matter how hard they try. No matter what. So, cry again in that cute voice of yours and scream, Devil! You bastard! Get off me, you animal! As you wish, princess! Baldur clutched Iris's struggling limbs with his knees and tried to tear off her clothes. Or you could just come clean and tell us everything. Huh. Princess, what is it? Oh. Iris closes her eyes in contemplation. Tears welled up in her eyes. Her lips moved of their own accord. Mari, us Marius help me. Marius. Baldur heard him loud and clear. I've heard that name before, but oh. I remember. That lanky, female-faced minstrel. So that's your man of color. He giggled. And Baldur laughed like a snake. 
Oh, my God. Repeat slowly. This guy's good. He's got a grudge. If I kill him and snatch you away, Darius will be on his knees. That's good. No, don't. Iris finally let out a scream. I, I don't care what happens to you. Marius, don't do anything to Marius. He has nothing, nothing to do with all of this. As your lover, that's all I'm good for. Baldur scoffed. Or will you confess? That handsome poet didn't have a sword half as good as yours. It would feel so good to gouge out his clear eyes, slit his mouth, cut off his nose, and kill him piece by piece. Marius has nothing to do with this. This is all about me and Darius. Iris gasped. She struggled to endure the disgust of a man's hands creepily crawling all over her body. Well, then, I guess you'll just have to talk quietly about everything. What's your name? Oh, oh Octavia. Octavia. What of Achilles? Moo daughter. Of Princess Yulia Euphemia, favored princess of Eulania born. I see. Sylvia's half-sister. I see. Instead of having the sister princess come out again and talk about her son-in-law, he wanted her to quickly turn into a man and make her the crown prince of Chironia. Baldur thought for a moment. Princess Octavia. I'm sure, unlike her sister, every prince, prince elector and prince at law would want her even if they had to give up their wives. It would only make the struggle for the heir even worse. But now that Empress Mariah is what she is. Sylvia is a traitor's daughter. Even if you're a concubine's daughter, you're old enough not to be a traitor. Hmm, that's something to think about. Viscount Baldur, please, loosen your hand it's painful. Now you're playing games. Sorry to hear that. It seems you're not skilled enough to use a woman's sex appeal as a weapon. Maybe he's trying to get her to loosen her grip and take the sword. Hmm, I don't know what to do but it's in his best interest to get you anyway. After that. I see. Stop. What are you doing? Stop it. There's nothing to be done. Now, you can think about that later. You're going to be mine. No. I'll bite my tongue. Marius. Marius. Octavia was desperately struggling against Baldur's hands as he tried to break her legs. What are you doing in there? A muffled voice said, Marius, don't. Marius, where is he? Hi. A moment later, Baldur's hand involuntarily slackened. Octavia wriggled out from under Baldur's hand like a weasel. Hey, you. As soon as he saw you, Baldur's face changed. He must have realized that he could not stand against them in his wounded state. Remember that. He said a few words and left. Oh, you, you, you. Octavia was left behind, her blouse and trousers half torn off, her skin bare, as she struggled to cover herself with the edge of her cloak, her voice strained. Paris. What, how did you get here? Just like, standing there was Paris, the guard of Princess Sylvia, with a face as grim as a dull ox. Suddenly, Octavia grabbed the rapier that Baldur had dropped. Instantly, I cut him down with a sword wind. But as expected, after the horrible experience he had just had, his limbs were weak and the tip of his sword did not have its usual vigor. Paris easily dodged the blow. I'll kill you, Octavia shouted, no longer trying to cover her chest. Now that you know I'm a woman I won't let you live. Please wait, please wait. Paris, however, still replied sluggishly like a dull ox. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not interested in whatever you are. What do you mean? I, I'll be the one to lead you to the edge of Darius. Yes. Paris raised her thick palms and squeezed her voice lazily out of her thick lips. Such things. But I have nothing to do with it. You look at me like this and you have no idea what I'm going through. Yes, sir. I'm not very good at thinking, so I try not to think about difficult things. This is ridiculous. Octavia stared at Paris suspiciously. Can I have your cloak? I command you. Paris silently took the cloak and held it out. Snatching it, Octavia finally hit her naked white body. Then what are you thinking about, 
Ha. Huh. I'm only interested in fulfilling Princess Sylvia's orders. A little disgusted and a little annoyed, Octavia stared at her sister's attendant. But there was no expression on her tanned face. I see Sylvia has found herself a loyal squire again, Octavia said condescendingly. Paris kept quiet and bowed quietly. You were saying something about Marius. Yes. What are you talking about? The princess commands me to find the bard Marius by tonight, no matter what it takes. For what? I don't know, sir. There's nothing you don't know. Say it. The princess insisted that I bring the minstrel to the imperial palace before tonight's ball, so that all those in attendance would be amazed. What? Octavia thought for a moment. Then she snapped out of it. She's not thinking about something trivial, is she? Speaking of tonight's ball, it was the day of Sylvia's selection for a son-in-law, and everyone already knows that the first man Sylvia danced with was the man who wore those glasses. I can't let you do something so stupid. Octavia lowered her voice. Paris does not raise an eyebrow. If you know the whereabouts of Marius, I would very much like to know. I don't know. I don't care. Octavia's blue eyes flared in a blaze of fire. Even if I knew, who would tell him? What do you want to do with the poor minstrel? He'll be dragged to court and humiliated. He'll be dragged into a dull clown show and assassinated. Let your whims and selfishness be at an end. You too, Paris. Sylvia's just the sort of girl who'd come up with a good prank and announce at a ball that the princess of Chironia was going to marry a nasty minstrel. But you, you're okay with that, Paris. You're secretly in love with Sylvia, aren't you? I don't know how you can let such misbehavior get to you. Hmm. I don't know if it's because he's in love or not, but he doesn't even seem to have the pride of a normal human being. Octavia's lips quirked up in mockery. Don't you dare say a word against me. You're stubborn. You're like a stupid cow. I don't have time for you. Oh, what if? What, you're mad at me? If you know the whereabouts of Marius the Bard. It is the princess's command that you find him tonight and bring him to me. This time Octavia stared at Paris as if she were looking at a hideous monster. Then he pulled up the hem of Paris's cloak and walked away without replying. I walked straight to the service gate of the Kogetsu Palace, knocked softly, and disappeared inside. In the morning mist, the everlasting lamps of the Kogetsu Palace were finally disappearing one by one. Fall that Baldur. When she returned to her own room in the small moon palace, Octavia slipped her cloak off easily after making sure that no one was around to lock the door. The remnants of the clothes that had been roughly ripped off barely clung to the slender, smelly naked body. Oh, my God. I almost fell into the clutches of that thing. Octavia bit her lip roughly and tore off her clothes. She threw them into the fireplace and lit a fire. Even the thought of such a man's hand touching me is horrifying, to think that your mother met such a tragic end at the hands of a man like that makes me wonder why there is such a thing as the desires of all men in this world. If I had the time, I'd like to yum and cleanse myself, but I can't afford to do that. At least, with a cloth wrung out of water, he wiped his chest and waist where Baldur's hand had touched, rubbed in the fragrance, went to the closet against the wall, and opened the door. A row of clothes is revealed. All of them are men's clothes. We have to be inconspicuous, but it's a festival, so we can't be too plain or we'll attract attention. With a thoughtful look on his face, he picked up several of them, and then selected a blue silk tunic, a black silk robe, and matching trousers and threw them toward the bed. That Paris idiot. I unconsciously called him out on it, shook my head at him, and tried to pull up his sleeves. Suddenly, Octavia stopped. Without knowing what made him do so, his white face suddenly darkened. He stopped to put it on again, and then went to the wall where he saw a beautiful carving on the wall. A beautiful young figure wearing lacy white underwear is shown in a dark mirror. Her body is well proportioned and extremely slender. However, she has such a firm frame for a woman that even Marius believes her to be a man and dances with her in his arms without any doubt. Her shoulders are broad. Yes, it's true, she's far from the graceful figure of a very slender lady, an imperial princess. 
Octavia murmured as she gently lifted a hand to lift her hair, or put her hands on her hips to deflect her breasts. Besides, I've been practicing sword and horse training every day, so I've got muscles. You really look like a man. Yes. It's no wonder you look like a man. She's got no breasts and not a shred of extra feminine flesh. I bet if you wore a rosy dress, everyone would swoon. And on top of that, yes, on top of that, you're on the wrong side. Next to a warrior like Gwyn, even I would look small, lithe, and feminine, but that Marius is hunched, squat, pale, and curly-haired. She's almost as tall as me. My shoulders are probably wider than his. Maybe he's not a woman, really. No, he's not. I know that. Octavia blushed alone. There are men like that. Just as there are women like her. We're the same height, we're the same build, I have a much stronger sword and temperament. And yet he acts like a full-fledged man. He's strange. He's younger than me, he has a gentle voice, and his favorite things are singing and playing with women. I can't believe I've fallen in love with him. Octavia, Princess of Chironia. He's always slowing me down, and I'm the one who's helping him, and he's the one who's putting me in danger. Yes, you are out of your mind, Iris. Octavia peered into the mirror at her own face, her eyes blurred. It doesn't mean you'll never see it. He mumbles, tracing the mirror with his fingertips. Yes, my body isn't very feminine I'm older, burly, and big. But I think I'm quite beautiful. If you're even a little like your mother, people will think you're beautiful. She was known as the Rose of Urania. Yes. Marius, I've said it many times. You're beautiful. Suddenly, as if waking from a dream, Octavia unrolled her clothes once more. Then he suddenly lost his temper and threw it away. Man's clothes. He mumbled angrily and stomped his foot lightly. The only dress I've ever known that was made for a man, that was tailored for a man. I've never worn a woman's dress in all my life, except as a disguise. I was raised as a man, I acted as a man and I've known for my whole life that I'm a woman. Yes but why, then, do I, oh, why do I suddenly hate to wear this own, man's clothes? Octavia strode madly about the room. Then she sat down on the bed. It was true that she had been brought up as a man for a long time and that her manners were rough, and put her head in her hands. Her head with her hands. Sylvia. A pained whimper escaped her lips. She, that selfish, good-natured girl, is she going to take everything away from me at the last moment, then? Marius, she loves Marius. And she's six years younger than me. Yes. Every day, she wears a new, gorgeous, famous designer dress, her hair is beautifully coiffed, she's feminine and dainty and graceful, and yes, she's the daughter of Empress Chelonia. I'm sure that most men, even if I'm a little more beautiful, would prefer a younger, fluttering, pretty girl like a butterfly or a flower to an older, voluptuous, large woman like me, who is not sure whether she is a man or a woman. Moreover, the princess of Chironia, the daughter of the rightful queen, who was recognized by both her father and the world, could marry that girl and enjoy all the glory she desired. Even if Marius is now frightened by the difference between being a minstrel and being the son-in-law of the princess of Chironia, well, frightened is a good word for him, and then he realized how he should behave, and that Sylvia was young, and feminine, and pretty, and oh, bitter. Squirming violently, Octavia ruffled her glorious hair. Oh, no, no, oh, my God. I'm jealous. Yeah, I'm jealous of. That's ridiculous, that's. She suddenly shouted as if she were going to hit him, and as soon as she stood up, Octavia roughly put her hands into her tunic, her legs into her trousers, and dressed herself with an effortless energy. Yarn is also available at. He puts his hand on the mirror and murmurs. John has played a terrible trick. They're the only two sisters in the world, even though they have different mothers, and yet you let them both fall in love with the same man. Such a disgusting, soft, disgusting, womanizing, weak-willed, clownish, unfaithful man. 
Seeing that this was not enough to heal her heart, Octavia added, Lowborn, weak, spoiled, little pretty-faced philanderer. That's unfair. Marius doesn't put on a pretty face. No, he's not soft. Remember him in his uncle's dungeon, a philandering flirt is no defense. But, oh. Have mercy on me, Jarn. Octavia kneels down, puts her elbows on the bed and clasps her hands. She recites the scripture from John. O oh John, God of destiny, who reveal all. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, help us mortals at the mercy of your fingertips. You alone know everything. Nothing can be done to us before you. Oh, I love that curly-haired flirt so much that even I wonder why I love him so much, yarn. For a few moments, Octavia murmured her prayers, her knees resting on her folded hands. Then, as she stood up, brushed her knees, and brushed her hair back, she saw the stern, cold face of Iris. From the bed, he took up his leather sash and tightened it around his narrow waist. He fastens the lacing from above, puts on his sword belt, takes a new rapier from the cupboard, sheets it with a clattering sound, and hangs it on his sword belt. He pulls out his new cloak, fastens it around his throat, and pulls up his left side. After a moment's thought, he took off the mask with only his eyes and put it on his belt. Finally, he took his black leather shoes from the cupboard, put them on the bed, and pulled the braided laces up to his knees tightly and fastened them tightly. When he was completely dressed, he looked at his figure in the mirror. What appears there is, for all intents and purposes, the mysterious, coldly beautiful, dark figure of a nobleman. He gave her a condescending glance and rang the bell to summon the maidservant. Yes, Miss Iris. And your uncle. Yes, yes, um, it is. What's wrong? You're not here. You don't know that. Where's Saul? Yes, here. I've got a call for you. Welcome back, Lord Iris. And your uncle. Well, that's the thing, he's not coming back today. Whatever. But there will be preparations for today's big ceremony. Well, that's Sara, stay back. Yes. Lady Iris. After he had escorted the maidservant away, the Lord Commander lowered his voice. You look strange. Just now, last evening, a messenger from the Palace of Obsidian came to tell me that the Lord is staying at the Palace of Obsidian tonight and that I should bring him clothes for the celebration and other necessary items for tomorrow. But the messenger was not from our family, but from the King's Guard. What? I thought it was very strange, so I arranged the items and gave them to him, but then a book was returned to me, a book that did not belong to the Sovereign. I thought it was strange, so I opened it and found this. Iris, you're writing to me. Let me see. Snatching it up, Iris read. Iris he. He writes with an unseeing eye. Everything's been exposed. Empress Mariah's plan has been discovered and yours could be too. You're our only trump card now. Do whatever you can to get into Wind Hill and contact me as soon as possible. The Empress might find out about me in court. I'm trapped. Please help me. Hmm. Iris set fire to the piece of paper and let it burn on a marble tray in her desk. Ask for a horse. Ha. Back door. I'll be right there. Once again, he returned to his room, took up the package that he had hidden in a bundle, and, realizing what he was doing, examined the contents of the small bag around his neck. It was the love letter of his father Achilles, which Gwyn had given him. It seems we're nearing the end of the line. My twenty years of vengeance, and the struggle for the throne of Chironia. He murmured and left the room, but returned and looked up at the portrait of his mother. End of show. Suddenly, such words crossed Iris's mind. Mother, I tweeted. What nonsense. This can't be happening, Saul, Saul. Are you ready? It is done, sir. Listen, tell the captains of the Grand Duke's Knights to be ready to mobilize whenever the order comes. Yes, sir. Anyway, I'll call you as soon as I know what's going on. He tied the wrappings to the horse's back and fluttered astride. Don't worry. Just do as you're told and wait for me. Don't say that. Hi. Hi. 
When he kicked the horse's belly, the white horse immediately started running at a great speed. It's still mourning in the silence. Hi! Hi! As she clacked her hooves through the streets, the morning mist finally fading, Iris was seized by a strange fluttering and buzzing in her chest. Yeah. Somehow, everything is finally moving. All the patterns that have been tangled and waiting for so long. Empress Mariah's ambition is fulfilled. All that remains is for her to recognize me as Crown Prince of Chironia. I'm just restoring my mother's honor. Oh, mother, it's almost time, it's almost time your soul, which never had a grave, will be at rest. Who the Kelonian Emperor really loved, who killed him, and who embarrassed him, all the things that have been hidden for twenty years, will be revealed, Jan, do as thou wilt. Janice, give me strength. Leave me, Saria. I will die for the blood of the Emperor of Cheiron and live as Prince of Cheiron. Even if that means I have to spend my days on the ropes. Go away, lost and frightened. I've made my choice. I'm a man. I am the crown prince of Chironia. There's no going back. There's no going back. Marius O, oh, my dear, the first person I ever love this is goodbye. This will be the last thing Octavia does, once we leave Hikari, I'm a man. He rode through the city of Silen his hair fluttering like a whirlpool of light, to the outskirts of the city, where seven hills spread out before him, and straightway Iris's horse rode up to the hill of light. The seven beautiful hills are still in the pure silence of the morning. I can hear the chirping of the birds, the murmur of the stream, the faint lace of the sunlight, it is a peaceful and quiet morning in Hikaragakaka. Sighs. Suddenly, Iris turned around with a furrowed brow. It's just my imagination. He shakes his head when he seems a little preoccupied. But when you get a little further, ah, oh, now there was something clear in his eyes. That was, he cowered a little, looking about him, and led his horse off to the side. Iris's brow furrowed. There is an army lying low around the detached palace on Hikarigakaka. Mutter in your mouth. That light is indeed a glimmer of armor, and there are more than a company of them. Well, maybe there's a Ulanian delegation at the palace, and there, he raised his head, thinking that the battle was near. Of course. When the time comes, even if it's against my mother's homeland of Ulania, I'll lead my troops as Prince of Chironia and proudly make my first stand. If by doing so, I can gain my father's trust and the trust of the court and the people. With a faint smile, he dismounted in front of the Marquis of Waldstad's annex and tied him to a tree. Marius. The man I'm in love with is right around the corner. Just the thought of it makes my heart beat faster and my breath catch. However, this is probably the meeting that will be the end of the long separation and the first love. Marius I am the Prince of Chironia. Hooded and stooped, Iris slipped effortlessly into the outskirts of the Marquis of Wallstadt's villa, still reeling from last night's feast. With my heart beating painfully in my chest, I walked under the window of Marius' room, which I already knew, and gently pulled myself up. He put his hand into the window and tapped on the glass. Marius Marius. No answer. He's probably asleep. Marius, Marius, it's me. It's Iris. Iris tapped the glass again. I'm in a hurry. Open up, I have something important to say. Every second counts. Marius. Marius. To Iris's impatient mind, Marius would never wake from his sleep, and she wondered if this window was a dead one, or if the secret meeting of last night had been discovered and Marius had been immediately moved to a deeper room. But a little later the window opened. Marius came out, dressed in a long nightgown, his hair crumpled, looking sleepy, but he looked up and saw Iris. What's going on? What time is it? What time do you think it is? The sun has already risen. Well, I went to bed late last night, so, come on in. It's cold in here. Finally waking up a little, Marius smiled. Anyway, it's always good to see you. How can you be so sober? All the firmness of his resolve was shaken by that one word, and he said, without effort, Iris, ha, huh? I don't know what I'd say to you if I were you. You're terrible. Sometimes you just catch me off guard like that. 
but, but, yeah, that's the last time. As if to say to himself, he threw his hands up in the air and jumped into the air. What? What? It's nothing aw. I'm glad to see you. I feel like we haven't seen each other for a very long time since we broke up last time. Marius grabbed Iris by the shoulders, pulled her close and kissed her. I'm sorry, are you mad? No, no. But I'm not here to do that, don't get me wrong. No, I didn't. I was just expressing how happy I am to see you. Something something's wrong. What? It was late last night when I left you, wasn't it? Yeah. It hasn't even been Zan, and you're like, what? You look different. I mean, oh. I've reopened it. Marius grinned. He hurried to fix the bed and beckoned her to sit on it. I've been thinking about you since you left. And I didn't fall asleep until the wee hours. Do you ever think about it, too? I'm not mad at you anymore. I'm not mad at you anymore, not even for your prickly little comments. Marius smiled. Iris looked at him weirdly. You're a strange one, you know that. Oh, my God. But, you know, this, uh, this was a pretty big shock for me, too. To admit to you that I'm seriously in love with a man. Anyway, I've always been an admitted ladies' man. I mean, you're in this business. I mean, I'm not saying that I've never done anything with a man, but, you know, just out of curiosity, and, you know, I was bullied by this stupid, tone-deaf guy who kept calling me a man-whore. It made me very uncomfortable, and I think that's why I claim to be a womanizer. That's because I'm not the type of guy who's very masculine or manly to look at. But you know, I was alone last night, and I was thinking a lot, and I realized that I've fallen in love with you, and if that's the case, I have no choice but to be honest about it. There's no such thing as a man or a woman who falls in love with a man, right? Besides, pretending not to like someone for the sake of some tone-deaf idiot who isn't here anymore is really stupid, that's what I thought. Now, you can call me a pervert no matter how much you want to, and maybe I'm a little crazy. I think I'm still obsessed with my brother, to the point where I can't fall seriously in love with a girl because of it, like you said. But if you knew your brother, you wouldn't find that strange at all. There are no two men like him on earth. More or less everyone who's ever been around him thinks his life is different because of him. And he's my only brother, how much, yes, how much I love him. And how I hate him. I worship him like a god and I hate him like the devil and I pity him, I do. But now I'm gonna stop hiding it. Maybe that's why I fell in love with you when I met you and found out that there was someone else who was even a little bit like my brother, but even so, I did fall in love with a man, even if he was older than me. My brother didn't steal my heart, my heart is free and belongs to me. I've dreamt of killing him, of running away with his corpse, but I can tell you now, that you're more important to me now than my brother. I don't care if you accept it or not, if you believe it or not. I'm still me, nothing more, nothing less. I don't care if you accept me or if you run away. I like you. I don't know why, but your coldness and your sharpness and your sarcasm and your inaccessibility don't hurt me anymore. I don't know why, but behind those thorns and sarcasm, I can't help thinking that you're really lonely, that you're suffering. I trust my instincts, even though I know you'll be angry again. And now, somehow, I... I know now. Maybe he was lonely in his own way, maybe he was in pain, maybe he loved me and I couldn't love him back. I don't know why, but that's what I feel when I look at you. I can feel the pain of being a chosen, special person oh, it's me who didn't understand, it's me who ran away but it's too late. And but this time I won't make a mistake. I will not let go of this hand, not from my side. That's all I am now. I've bared all my cards. And if you don't like it, if you think I'm stupid, it doesn't matter, I'll keep saying I'm in love with you, I'll keep singing my love song. That's it, I love you. The way you look, the coldness, the jealousy, the whimsy, everything. My brother was the lure, but you were Iris, goddess of the moon. The sun is setting, now the sun is setting, the moon is rising, and... 
For me, the first free night is coming, it seems. I'm glad I came to Chironia. I'm glad I met you. I love you. I love you because you rescued me from the ice that held my brother's body. I love you because you were the iris that replaced the lure and kept me alive. And most of all, because you're youth beautiful, cold, enigmatic, mysterious, out of this world iris. Oh, I love you, and I'll smile and tell Istvan he's an idiot. Yeah, I love a guy, but what's the big deal? I love you, that's all. Mata. Iris listened with half-closed eyes, as if intoxicated, but finally opened her eyes and said forcefully, I'm sorry. Why, again, such a of all things, at such a time, such a killer. What? I beg you, do not use your fabulously eloquent voice so carelessly. You have a very beautiful voice, as a minstrel should. The stone people of Canaan would start to move if they heard that kind of rhetoric one after the other in that beautiful voice. You don't use that word recklessly. Just you. So, so. Iris shook her head violently, finally remembering the purpose for which she had come here. No, I didn't come here to hear your love language. I just don't have the time. Biting her lip and calming herself down, Iris said. Thank you, Marius, for everything. It's been a strange match, but it's been a pleasure knowing you. I pray to John that we meet again someday, somewhere. Ha! Huh. Marius furrows his brow. It sounds like you're saying goodbye. Or not, but it is. Iris's answer was somewhat contradictory. But Marius wasn't about to let that get to him. Well, then I'm sorry. Let me rephrase. I'm... It's not that. Iris summoned up her courage. Listen to me. Paris is looking for you. If you don't leave the silence now, if you don't leave Chironia, you're in danger. You've disobeyed my advice several times before, but not this time. Baldur is after you, too. It's all over. What do you mean you're done? Yes, for Baldur. And maybe for you, too, if you stay a silent. I can't tell you exactly what's going on, but Baldur is about to be found out and punished for his treasonous intentions. He's the kind of guy who's always looking for a way to get even. But that doesn't mean that I can't. Because you're my lover. After he said it, Iris huffed, clamped her mouth shut, and went blank. Oh, no that's why Baldur thought. Iris. Marius' face immediately lit up. Then you, too, must know that I. Hey, wait a minute. You're all about love, aren't you? That's why I was so careless. I didn't think Baldur was that bad and I let it slip. I don't think Baldur is going to find us. That foolish princess is ordering Paris to capture you. And why do you think that is? To make you the husband of Princess Chelonia by force. What the fuck? The man Sylvia will be dancing with at the anniversary ball tonight will be her potential husband. Said Iris, speaking quickly. But both Baldur and Marquis de Ney were put under house arrest. That is to say, the matter was once again dropped, but Sylvia would not be allowed to marry whomever she liked anyway. So Sylvia brought you in and danced with you and made it known that the princess of Chironia had a nasty, excuse me, minstrel for a lover. She wants to make it known that Princess Chelonia had a nasty, excuse me, bard for a lover. Why would you do that? I don't know, maybe I thought it was a nice joke, or maybe I really am in love with you. I'm not sure what to say, said Iris, showing the remnants of her earlier jealousy. Well, maybe I've been doing something foolish. Maybe I was trying to ruin your chances of becoming Grand Duke or Emperor of Chironia. That's rude. What's the matter? Isn't Sylvia pretty too? If a pretty young girl like that likes you so much, you must be very happy. Stupid. But I'm sure you won't feel bad about it. What the hell is wrong with you? Are you mad at me for what I did? Not exactly, Iris snarled. Or, you've been saying that you don't mind if I'm a man, but that's just a pretext, and you really don't mind if I'm a man. Whoa, 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 whoa. The truth is, I knew you were. Fine, if that's how you feel, I won't say anything else. You can think what you want. Marius. In any case, I'm a disgusting, man-whoring minstrel, 
and you're the emperor of Chironia's prince. Oh, Iris has finally calmed down a bit. I'm sorry, I didn't come here to tell you that. So, unless you want to be the son-in-law of Princess Chelonia, you'd better leave the silence now. Sylvia is quite persistent that way and Paris is just another one of Sylvia's tame goals. He only listens to Sylvia. I know. And also, from now on, I'll be stuck in the Obsidian Palace for the time being. I can't help you if something happens to you. My ambition is about to be fulfilled. Now, I don't have time for a bard's love anymore, do I? Marius said cheerfully. I've been wondering. I've always wondered. Why in the world would a man or a woman be possessed by ambition, have ambition, and be driven mad by it? I can't even think of it. Why do they want power and the throne so badly? And what does that do for you? You'll be happy, is that what you really think? I think that thrones and power are detestable things that make you and your family unhappy the more you have them. Is there a king or an emperor who is happy? A minstrel would be happier. Is it loving, singing, flowers and birds, blue skies, kind people, kind words, good food, wine, and fun all that matters in this world? You left those sorrow in your mother's belly. You're not a man. Roughly, Iris affirmed. And what the hell do you know about that? What it means to have ambition and to fulfill it, to have throne and power. For me it's living and avenging my mother's death, without which I wouldn't have survived one day. If you weren't like that, maybe I wouldn't have had to tell you to leave the silence. But, well, it's over now. It's all over. We'll never see each other again. I'm begging you, get out of Chironia. Or if you'd rather hang out in the canal as a corpse, then so be it. But now, now. Iris bit her lip and finally gave in to the passion that this was really the end. I can't help feeling sorry for myself. I don't know what kind of foolish tricks Saria played on me, but it seems I'm a little in love with you. If it's true that you love me, even a little, then don't let me weep over the corpse of my lover. Chironia is now a battlefield. A fool like you wandering around will get you killed by one side or the other. Before that happens, get out, Silen. For my sake, for my sake that I might love you. Iris. Marius looked at Iris with wide eyes, not knowing what to say. I can't believe it. I can't. I'm begging you, pull yourself together. Whether you're a minstrel or not, you've already been dragged into this. It's not that. It's not about that. Marius breathed heavily on his shoulder. Youth proud, prickly, prickly moon spirit, that's what you are, a minstrel, a clown, a weakling, who loves me. Don't get me wrong. You can think of it as a kind of friendship. Anyway, I'm not going to see you again, so I told you. I've never seen anyone as crazy as you before. I'm sure it made me crazy too. But that's okay, I'm going. I don't have time for this. Iris. I'm not afraid of anything anymore. I'll never see you again. I'm going to the Obsidian Palace, to the battlefield. Iris. From the first moment I saw you, I have loved you forever and ever. Take care, Marius. And for God's sake, get out of Chironia now and go to a peaceful little town that suits you better, and sing for all eternity. The first time I heard you say the word love. For that alone, I'm willing to die. This time, don't get involved in such a trivial matter, keep a low profile, and remember, this time, you'll meet a cute, quiet village girl who deserves you, fall in love, and be happy. I'll never look at another human being the same way again. No man, no woman. Forever, you're all I've got, and I'm, I'm yours forever. Don't be unfaithful and take your life in your hands, but be moderate. A woman's jealousy is scary and you don't know how easy it is to make someone fall in love with you. No one can win in the face of your vulnerable smile, but you smile too much at everyone. If you look into it, it's all yours forever. Iris, my beautiful Iris, I will never be troubled by my brother's spirit again. Take care, Marius. If you're going to leave town, do it from the north. Don't go east, go north, around the block. 
to Paro. Avoid Gora. Especially the Gora border. Are you listening to me, Marius? Iris, I love it. The beautiful and enigmatic moon Iris, queen of the dull night. Wait, wait. No. Flustered, Iris pushed away from Marius' embrace, almost as if she were pushing him away. Marius had a sad look on his face. Why not? No, it's not, so goodbye, Marius. All right, when you leave the silence, stay out of the west. Get out. The silence? Marius shouted, as if waking from a dream. Why? What? You didn't hear a word I said when I was coughing up blood. Stunned, Iris shouted. Did you not listen to me? You're a real piece of work, you know that. I heard you. I heard you. But I didn't think you were serious. I'm more than capable of defending myself, and you're as stubborn as an ass, you know that. Angry, Iris said. So you're saying you don't care how sad I am. That's fine. I'll do what I want. I'm going. I have to go. You have to leave the silence within the next two days. Otherwise you'll surely be caught up in political strife and you'll die. This is no time to indulge in idle pleasures. If you think that because I'm a little in love with you, I'm going to give up my ambition because of it, you're mistaken. For me, the ambition and vengeance that I've put all my energy into for the past 20 years are far heavier than any random love. If you insist on interfering, I'll bury you with my own hands. Listen, Marius, the carnival is over. Don't you ever show your face to me again. You understand. Iris. A trifling spectacle on a carnival night. Listen, if I see you wandering around the silence before tonight, I'll cut you down with my own hands. Goodbye, Marius, I mean, goodbye. Iris, but, you and me both. Their entangled cries finally rang out almost like a scream. But I love you. I love you. Goodbye, Marius. This is goodbye for now. Take care, Iris. No, I swore I'd never run away again, Iris. Finally, Iris looked at Marius with a mad, desperate look in her eyes. His eyes seemed to reveal the full extent of the pain in his heart. Goodbye forever, Iris. Wait talk, talk. Talk some more, Iris Iris. Iris fluttered through the window. Iris. Goodbye. Goodbye, Marius. Goodbye, Octavia. The despair in my heart was accompanied by a dreadful cry. I'll never see you again. Stay safe, oh, please. Iris suddenly pulled down her hood and ran across the garden. He jumped on the horse, which was waiting for him, and roughly pulled on the reins. To his surprise, the horse started to run. Obsidian Palace to the Windy Hill, Iris screamed. And she rode madly down the horse's belly and threw herself down on its neck and stifled a sob. A tad, a tad, was the distance that separated her from her lover. Iris. Marius, on the other hand, was left behind. He immediately chased after her and tried to run away, but found himself in a state of discomfort as his legs were caught in the hem of his nightgown. I rushed to take it off and put on my clothes. Iris, Iris. I don't care what happens to me. Iris, I'm not letting you go. You. He went to his desk to write a letter of thanks to Gwyn and the Marquis of Wallstad for all they had done for him, and did so hastily. He folded it neatly, placed the paperweight on it, slung the kithera that Alina had given him over his shoulder, and was about to run off. Knock, knock, and someone tapped on the window. Iris. Marius's face lights up. I'm so glad you came back. Without hesitation, you open the window. Marius snickered. It wasn't Iris. Oh, you're. I knew you were here. A quiet voice said. Paris climbed to the window and climbed over, agile in spite of his huge stocky body. I knew if I followed him, I'd find him. I finally found him. What the hell, Garm? I have no use for you. The Lady Sylvia wants to see you. With a strange light flickering in his little eyes, the squire said. Come with me. I say no. Marius took a step back. Sylvia has nothing to do with this. Tell her that. 
The princess wants to see you, Marius. Come with me, Paris repeated lazily. I told you, I don't want to. I'm not going to see Sylvia again. The princess wants to see you. Come with me, Paris repeated lazily. Marius was at last beginning to feel a terrible fear of this wall or cow. All the words were sucked up into the air on the way, and it seemed as if they did not even reach Paris' ears. You monster! Quickly, search the escape route with your eyes. Paris is standing between you and the window. And Marius is unarmed. Hey, tell Sylvia. I'm glad you feel that way, but I'm not the right man for Princess Chelonia. Forget it, and tell her that I have someone I love. And yet, again and again, Marius tried to persuade him. But, Marius, come with me. The princess wants to see you. Like a wall rebounding from a voice, the answer just came back. Look, Paris, you know me, I don't want any trouble. I don't hate her, but she's like a sister to me. Wait a minute. As Paris stepped forward, Marius rushed back. You know where we are. You're at the Marquis of Wallstadt's villa, you walked in there, unannounced, and took the Marquis guest. Paris stepped forward, inch by inch. A tree root-like arm, certainly twice the size of Marius's, was quickly stretched out. Hi, I'm calling someone. Then you'll be in trouble. It's a matter of honor for the princess. Marius' voice trailed off. Paris drew his sword with ease. Hey, wait a minute. Why why would Sylvia want me dead? No, she wouldn't what? Put that thing away, anyway. Hey, I'm unarmed. Marius became sluggish. It may have been unavoidable, since she talked so much, but what frightened Marius the most was this silence of Paris itself. There was no act that was so different from Marius' worldview as to remain silent and appeal only to action. Hey, Garm. When Marius' voice caught in his throat, Paris fell on him. He. Marius almost screamed like a woman, but Paris's thick arm pulled him closer and his palm covered his mouth. With one hand, Paris thrust his sword at Marius' throat. Marius can't speak anymore, his eyes are just black and white. The princess wants to see you, Paris said, a hint of triumph in her small eyes. Come with me. You. You. Marius barely glanced over his shoulder at Paris with slack-jawed eyes and winced. At once, Paris half-turned Marius' slender body and poked him in the midriff with the hilt of his sword. Marius's body collapses with a faint groan. Taking it lightly, Paris lifted him on his shoulders as if he were a sack of flour and sheathed his sword. With his arms still wrapped around her, he climbed through the window, jumped down, carried her to the horse that was tied to the far side of the road, and placed her in the saddle. Then Paris, too, gave the horse a whip and rode off in the direction of the windy hill where Iris had disappeared. The abduction took place in an instant. Everyone was asleep from the festivities, and none of them noticed the commotion. Only the open windows clinked faintly in the morning sunlight. Iris had no way of knowing that she was being followed. And then, when her figure appeared in the Obsidian Palace, where did she change her clothes? She was already dressed as a courtesan. Her hair is combed, she wears a lace veil and a shawl. The Grand Duke has long since obtained the official papers proving her identity. Even if she hadn't, no one would suspect her in the Palace of Obsidian where there are a thousand maids. In the Palace of Obsidian, where she walked, making a sound of rustling and shifting, at last the traffic was beginning to become dull. With those who had woken up from their morning sleep after the feast and were slowly preparing for the celebration, and those who had been working hard since long ago. We have to prepare an early breakfast for the many guests who are staying at the court. There are also several breakfast parties planned for the envoys. The men and women of the imperial household passed by incessantly, carrying wagons laden with many plates and other things. Slipping past them, Iris's disguised maid entered the familiar eastern wing of Grand Duke Darius's small palace in the Obsidian Palace. I brought you your morning tea. Darius was waiting for him in his chambers when he entered with a tray of provisions. He seemed to have not slept a wink. Oh, finally, you're here. I've been so worried about you. The Grand Duke quickly and briefly recounted the events of the previous evening, 
the rhapsody of the Grand Duke's death, the survival of the Marquis of Langobard, the arrest of Empress Maria, the imprisonment of Baldur and the Marquis of Danae. I told him about it. I have, by definition, one. The Grand Duke whispers with a pale face as he stretches out his hand over his morning cup. But if my brother has been listening to me all this time, it's a problem. I don't remember what I said during our argument, but I might have said something that would give away his deepish feelings, something that would make it strange for me not to hold the throne. At any rate, all of this would have been possible if my brother had remained in good health, and if he had died, everything would have been different. Another careless thing you've done, unlike your uncle. But don't you think it's unreasonable? My brother is a straightforward man. He has never devised such a deceitful scheme to deceive anyone. That's why we had our ways, but no one would have expected him to suddenly throw himself on his back like this. That's why the Empress fell for it so helplessly. That leopard-headed man set me up for everything. That leopard, pretending to be a mass of muscle like Zeno, is a monster. She's quite a schemer. I wish I'd seen it sooner. But then again, he's a simple warrior, Hazos is dead, and there's no one else around to pull off such a trick. That was a ridiculously hasty letter to write, then. Um, that's the thing. The Grand Duke frowned. I was deceived by that Gwyn, by his dull appearance, and I urged him that he might be one of Kumu or Yulania. At that time, I said that if he was one of Kumu's men, I might be willing to comply. I'll be back. We were desperate, too. It was obvious that the Empress was working with one of us, and if we didn't work with the other to counter her, we'd be crushed. However, if this happens, if Gwyn's guy reveals what happened then, not only the Empress, but also me, may be considered to be in league with other countries and willing to betray. I can't help it, it's a fact. How dare you? You're all in this together. That's why you risked so much to sneak in here, isn't it? What do you think I should do? Can't you turn off Gwyn? If you do it now, you'll confess your treason. Gwyn is a witness to Empress Mariah's treason. If we eliminate Gwyn, we won't be able to bring the Empress to justice. Ugh, you fucking leopard motherfucker. So it's a seven-mile boundary. Don't say it like it's funny. I'm not a stranger. So, well, here's what I've been thinking. As soon as this celebration is over, the day after tomorrow, the Empress will be judged in the Star Chamber. At that table, I will expose the Empress old evil, not to mention her secret dealings with Eulania, and accuse her of that as well. Of course, Mariah will deny it. Then you will take off your veil and be summoned. The boy who survived has grown up to be the Prince of Chironia. Well, I hope it works. You've lost your nerve, haven't you? No. I know you've been thinking about this for a while. I'll miss my chance to make an appearance. I'll make my brother take you as his wife in front of the lords and duly recognize you. It'll be a problem if Sylvia gets a son-in-law from the Prince of Kumu or the royal family of Paro. Now that Mariah and Yulania's betrayal has been exposed, there's no reason for me to join forces with Kumu. You can say that Gwyn knows that you're interested in her, but you haven't exchanged any letters or promises yet. I'm sure. Now you're getting tough. Don't be an asshole today. Uncle. What the hell, Iris? If he calls himself the crown prince and then turns out to be a woman, he's a serious traitor. Can't I just call myself the other princess and go? What do you mean? No way. You know what I'm talking about. You're in a better position because you're a man. A woman would be nothing more than a princess with a concubine. But with the Empress's downfall, Sylvia's backing is gone, too. But you have Uranian blood. It's your blood that's the problem now. Then we're about fifty to fifty. I'm older than you. What's the matter with you? You're the one who told me to name the prince. Gwyn is. Iris hesitated. Gwyn knows I'm here. A woman, huh? The Grand Duke raised his voice and, realizing it, lowered it in a panic. What a hell of a guy of all people. But also, it's not just Baldur and Paris. What? Iris explained simply that she had been threatened by Baldur, who wanted revenge, and that she had been saved by Paris. Oh, my God, now. Not yet, uncle. 
I'm beginning to wonder if this is a warning from John that you can't live in the eyes of heaven, earth and man. Baldur, Paris, and the others, if we kill them and shut their mouths, it will be over. The Grand Duke shook his head. And what? Sylvia's using the minstrel to do something like that. That stupid girl. Nevertheless, she's funny. Very, very funny. Just let her have one. Sylvia dances first with a nasty minstrel as a son-in-law and the whole court goes crazy. It'll be the ugliest thing that's ever happened at court. Hmm. He's good. Sylvia's fallen into disgrace and her honor's fallen and her mother's a traitorous empress. You're Julia's son, the one he loved so much and you look just like her. I'm sure he'll grow fond of you when he sees you. He's good. I'm sure Gwyn knows. He might try to blackmail me if I keep on being a prince. He's not that kind of man. I don't know what you're thinking, you son of a bitch. The Grand Duke frowned and looked at Iris. What's the matter? One way or another, your wish is about to come true. What are you thinking about? Why do you look so glum? It seems to me that to name a prince is a straight path to the execution table. The people, the emperor, and even the gods are about to be killed. Iris giggled. I've always thought that it would be fine to do so in order to fulfill my mother's vendetta, but what would happen if I was named an imperial princess and officially welcomed as Sylvia's sister? A woman is just a woman. Even if Sylvia is spared and I am recognized as the heiress, will I be forced into another political marriage with some prince or nobleman whom I don't like? Or will there be another vicious struggle like Baldur's and Laos's for my husband's position? How could I love as a husband such a man who would win me in a battle of self-interest, or a man whom I had never met before in a political marriage? Then, what on earth am I giving my name for? Isn't it like giving up the name of princess just to be an object of people's desire and power, just so I can be a glittering living doll instead of Sylvia? For the rest of my life, I'll never be able to do what I want, go where I want, have freedom, love, I'll never be emperor of Chironia. Then what am I doing here? Hey, Octavia, you can't stop thinking about that. Darius is a catnip. That's why Baldur and Paris shut their mouths, and Gwyn, I can handle Gwyn. Anyway, once he's unveiled as the prince, he's all yours. Even if she's discovered as a woman after Sylvia's done, then she's the only princess I've got, and I'm not about to execute her. You want to clear your mother's name. She wants to avenge her mother. There's more. Iris muttered. To have Sylvia introduce Marius to the court as her son-in-law, that's. Why not? It's the perfect match, it'll be a big scandal, and we can delete it later. Or you. What is it? You don't think he's gonna. Darius looked at Iris with a scowl. He may have been a bad man at heart, but he had a good instinct. What a fate. How dare the sister of an imperial princess be seduced by the same man. All right. So you're the one who helped him escape from the dungeon. Blame and kill an innocent man and the fate will come to you, uncle. Hmm, well, it's done, I don't care, but... The Grand Duke stared at Iris. So, even though she said all that stuff and acted like a man, she was still just a woman. I'm not a woman. Hmm, we've come this far to be at odds with each other. I guess Darius has finally had enough. In the face of love, even the death of my mother and the throne of Chironia are vanquished. Rude. If you're going to insult me like that, I don't need to know who you are. You don't know what I just went through and you don't know that I've put it behind me once and for all. Oh. That's a bold move. It's not for you. Only for my late mother. Whatever. Then I guess you'll have to name your prince. Iris hesitated. I can still hear Marius's voice in my ears, and I can clearly see his smile and the look on his face when he saw Iris, as if he had come to life. I've wondered for a long time, why on earth do people get caught up in ambition, why do they have ambitions, why do they lose their minds over it? Why do they want power and the throne so badly? To that question, Iris simply replied, you don't understand, and never answered squarely. That was not unreasonable. For even he himself did not really understand. But now that I'm here, well, now that I'm here, ha! Huh?
There's no going back. There's nowhere to go but back. Yes and no. Hearing him, Archduke Darius shouted. That's why I'm telling you. You and me, we're on the same side now. I'm sure my brother, the only one who ever stood up for me, has given up on me now. But I'm not going to stay a lord. How can it be unfair to be born of the same parents, but to be the emperor of Chironia and a grand duke just because you're my brother? You can't be born to the same father and the same daughter and leave Sylvia to her own devices. You're the son of the same emperor of Chironia. Besides, think of that time. Your mother Yulia Euphemia, still young and beautiful, was raped repeatedly by the empress thugs and beaten to death with thirty wounds all over her body. You haven't forgotten that time, have you? You have not forgotten those griefs, those sufferings, my mother's screams, the blood that was spilt, and your cries as you clung to the corpse. No more. Turning pale, Iris shouted. Enough. Just stop. Don't remind me of anything else. Poor Iris, even if you are the son of a concubine in this world, you are the son of an older man, and as the son of a beloved concubine, it is no wonder that you are the love of Achilles. Darius whispered as he patted Iris on the back with a very caring hand. It will take more than the recognition of a sister princess to redeem me. As the only crown prince of Chironia, I will have Mariah and Sylvia executed for their treacherous bloodline. Janus for Janus' light, Dole for Dole's darkness. No. Okay. Madly, Iris muttered and cradled her head in her hands. Okay, I get it now. Chapter 2. Sister Sister. And so it was that Iris of Octavia was being coaxed by Grand Duke Darius to once again take part in his schemes. In the Seventh Day Palace, which was deep inside the Black Day Palace, secret discussions were also held. In a few weeks, the anniversary celebration will begin. Gwyn, the Thousand Dragon Chief is here to see you. All right, I'll be right here. The leopard-headed warrior entered the Emperor Achilles' chamber, still wearing the armor of the Hundred Dragon Chief. The official announcement of his promotion was to be made after the celebration. The Great Emperor, too, was already awake and drinking Kalam water in the early morning, although he was still in his room clothes. Oh, Gwyn. He kneels at the entrance and nods to Gwyn, who gives him a night salute. How's it going? Nothing after that. I think it's time for you to get ready. I know. The Uranian mission is still in Hikarigakaka. At the invitation of the emperor, Gwyn went near him and said in a low voice. General Xenon, although he has his troops lying low, has not found the moment to carry out his majesty's orders. I know that, too. I'm with the rest of the delegation. Achilles frowned. What shall we do, Gwyn? When should we detain the Ulanian delegation? I think we can make it after the celebration. Gwyn said gravely. The most urgent thing is to prevent the delegation from communicating with other countries' envoys or their own agents. Now that we have prevented the assassination of the great emperor, the mission itself is of no great importance. But that's what I'm worried about. Achilles stared at Gwyn. Gwyn, you know what? Probably. What? The Ulanian delegation is not only a Ulanian delegation, but also a representative of the Emperor Gura. Even though he is nominally the Emperor, Ulania is only the Grand Duchy of the Emperor Gura. If you detain the Gura's representative, Kumu will have no choice but to protest against it as a matter of course. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Achilles shook his head. If at all possible, we should only strike Yulania and not let Kumu take action. If we have to face the allied forces of both nations, even Chironia will have to make a concerted effort. Do not let the Kumu envoy send a secret message. Mm, doesn't that mean that Kumu's conspiracy against Yulania isn't real? If you're forced to take a gamble somewhere, that's when you take it. All right. That's what I was thinking. I'll see Kumu soon. Detain the Ulanian delegation, and bring the Kumu envoy to His Majesty as soon as war is declared. Do so. Saul's deputy, Count Elia, what's up with that? I think it would be best if you were placed under house arrest separately from Baron Leroy and then met with Emperor Gura to ascertain his true intentions. Yes. But, suddenly, Achilles said in a pensive tone, Eventually, Gura will not be able to survive in its original form. 
The current state of the kingdom of Gora is very irregular. That's why there was the founding of Mongol and its destruction, but now, in the not too distant future, either Kumu or Yulania will reign over Gora. This time, too, it's not so much a case of trying to take advantage of Chironia, but rather a strain brought on by the irregularity of the situation in Gora. And you see, Gwyn, it is truly against my better judgment that I have the misfortune of starting a war with Yulania this time. Gwyn bows his head in silence. In truth, I'd rather it be Yulania than Kumu who starts a new dynasty in Gora. Either is true, but Kumu is more brutal, more conquest-hungry, more aggressive than Yulania. Yulania is a more desirable neighbor for Chironia than Kumu. It would be undesirable for me to see Yulania weakened by this war and for Kumu to become more powerful. As much as possible, I will do my best to make peace with Yulania as quickly as possible to save both sides from having to fight an all-out war. But in war, once it begins, neither side can afford to lose. And when Yulaninia tries to assassinate me, the national sentiment of Chironia will be unsettled. Do you not think that Yulania is being seduced by something, your majesty? Slowly, Gwyn said. I don't say Kumu's minions, but something that would like to see Chironia fight Urania, and both sides get tired of fighting. That's a possibility. After a while, Achilles said, lost in thought. But I don't have time to figure it out now. We have to pay for what we've done. Gwyn bows his head in silence. And so, Gwyn. Achilles beckoned Gwyn to come even closer. If possible, I would like to keep the true reason for the outbreak of war against Yulania as secret from the people as possible, and only say that we intercepted the Yulanian army because it had violated our borders. My wife Mariah's treason should be dealt with in private, and if possible, Mariah's treatment should not result in her execution. That's Kumu's wife. If Kumu makes a false accusation, it will complicate matters even more. How? We will not hold a public trial, but we'll hold a secret tribunal this evening after the half-celebration to determine Mariah's fate. Perhaps Kumu is ill and withdrawn, at worst, if he is executed, we will treat him as dead of illness. Of course, Yulaninia is a belligerent nation, so anti kalanian sentiment must be expected to exist, but if at all possible, Emperor Guran Kumu should be kept as outsiders as possible. Yes, Gwyn. You're saying something. At the very least, your majesty doesn't seem to have any ambitions to unite the Gora or even the world at all. Of course. I don't believe any country has that kind of power at present. I only want to hand over a prosperous and peaceful Chironia to the next generation without destroying it. I have long believed that the time when a great empire like Canaan was possible is past. There is no country in the Central Plains today that can have such ambitions. Even Kumu's greatest ambition is to unite the three kingdoms of Gora. What are you thinking about, Gwyn? Of history, and of people. Of John's work, and of our place in history. Aulus has described you as a philosopher. Achilles laughed. I agree with you. But for the moment, the issue is the timing of the detention of the Yulania delegation. In my opinion. Say it. The festivities will include greetings from the ambassadors and they will be watched by the public. Until this is done, we will leave them under surveillance and cut off all contact with the outside world. And after that, when they rested, the Yulanian delegation was casually separated from the acting Emperor Gura and taken to a separate building in the Black Palace where they were disarmed. The night's banquet was huge with 50,000 people. Even if someone noticed the absence of the Yulanian delegation, it would not cause a stir. Of course, I've agreed with the Kumu envoy in advance. As for the treatment of Count Elia, as I said before, Kitai and Primorsky cry have nothing to do with it, and they will not interfere in the affairs of our country and of Yulania. The problem will be the Paro envoy. Probably. Paro defeated Mongol in the recent Battle of the Black Dragon, thanks to the participation of Kumu and Yulania. In other words, we owe a debt of gratitude to both nations. On the other hand, our Chironia, from the beginning of the war, at the request of Mongol, silently overlooked the invasion of Paro by Mongol's army. In other words, although he did not join the war, he showed his willingness to be close to Mongol. Because of this, the sentiment between Paro and Chironia is very cold. 
The other day, at the celebration of the accession to the throne of Paro, we should have sent one of the electors to act as the emperor's representative as a close neighbor. But on the pretext of the third anniversary of the empress's death, it was Viscount Paulin, who was much lower in rank. In return, the other side also sent a young Linus Holy Knight Count for this celebration, when they should have sent a Holy Knight Marquis or a Duke-level diplomat. Of course Linus is of noble blood and is well-groomed. That's not the kind of thing a new king of fifteen or sixteen can do, as I'm sure Lord Regent Crystal will tell you. But the point is that Paro has not yet surrendered all his anger to Chironia. Fortunately, Paro is more inclined to Kumu than to Yolania. But he can use this war as an excuse to intervene if he wants to. But that's not likely. Paro now has a new king and is devoting all his energy to the unification and reconstruction of the country. I know that. But then there's that man Aldo Neris. He's the most scheming man in the Middle Kingdom. He may have figured that we simple-minded Kelonians are comfortable with the idea. And while I don't doubt Demos's loyalty, there are a great many Paro peoples living in the Kingdom of Wallstad. Because I don't want to be surrounded by Elenia, Kumu, Paro, and the Triumvirate in a place like this. Will it also be said that the confrontation between Yulania and Kumu over the interests of the now defunct Mongol is a cover? I don't say that, but I don't want to be thrown on my back by Aldo Neris or anyone else. Don't worry about Paro, I guess. Gwyn said slowly. I believe that the new King Remus I is not necessarily a character who leaves everything to the Lord Regent. And if the appointment was made by the direct will of King Remus I, there would be no such hidden meaning. Even if we don't know what will happen in the future, for now, I don't think Paro will intervene even if the Battle of Chironi Urania starts. You seem foolishly sure of that, Gwyn. What makes you so sure? The character of Remus I. Do you know enough to say that? And, I think. Hmm. Achilles thought. Then good. At some point, I'll send a messenger with some more pretext and try to repair relations with Paro. As long as there's no risk of raising troops in support of Yulania for the time being, that's fine. Sooner or later, there will be civil war in Paro. Slowly, with blunt conviction, Gwyn said it all. Achilles stared at Gwyn. Until we see the results of that civil war, I think it's safe to say that Paro will not be a factor in our strategic considerations against the Gora. What do you know about it? Achilles' voice was hushed. Gwyn. The character of Remus I. Personally, personally, what kind of man are you? He's obsessed with something. If he is not careful, he will destroy either all of the other nations of the Middle Plains or Paro. What about Lord Crystal? I don't know anything about him. Hmm. That's all right. For the time being, as long as we can conclude the immediate war against Urania. Achilles, sinking into some thought, we'll have to hear your side of the story at some point. But, do you think we can keep the Paro Envoy? The Paro Envoy, Count Linus the Holy Knight, can be left alone. Something's wrong. I don't know. Maybe I'm thinking too much. Say it. I'm curious about the entourage the Count had with him. AIDS? I think it was Valerius, the mage. What are you up to? No, but rather, he was the kind of man who made it seem like a bad idea to show weakness in Chironia. But we can't just leave the legate alone and detain his aides. Certainly. And there's no evidence that the man was in any way manipulative. But he was too lowly to be a deputy and too much of an aide. Valerius, I think, is a name that should be kept in mind. Then we'll be extra careful not to let that man come in contact with Eulania or Kumu. Is there anything else? For now. Gwyn. The emperor said sincerely. For thirty years I have been emperor of Chironia, and have passed through many foreign troubles, domestic disturbances, diseases, famines, and all manner of difficulties. Compared with these, the present one is neither particularly difficult nor even a predicament. Is it because I have been betrayed by my wife of many years, or is it because of my age? Perhaps I, too, am getting old, as is the emperor of Chironia, Achilles Chironius. You flatter me. Gwyn. I'm blessed with more people, more power and better subjects than any other king. The only thing that grieves me is the lack of a good successor. 
Now you've hit the nail on the head. Even emperors can't have everything their way, Gwyn. If you could arrange an informal meeting between me and that son of Julius, I could, for example, meet him on a walk. Your Majesty, Gwyn said. I would ask you to keep that matter to yourself and to no one else. Especially your Imperial Highness. I know. Achilles breathed out. I'm terribly tired. After this celebration I think I'll postpone the search for Sylvia's son-in-law and go to Langobard or Sards to rest or go on a tour of the country. You can take care of Yulania, and there won't be any problems. The more I think about it, the more I feel sorry for Mariah. I think I'll reduce her death to first class and build her a mansion in Longzania or Rhodes and let her live out the rest of her days in peace. It all started when I couldn't help loving her as my queen. Yulania, too, if you look at it that way, was seduced by the envy of a woman whose husband had forsaken her. What a wretched woman. In any case, I'll see to it that the first degree of death is reduced at tonight's secret trial. Keep it that way, Gwyn. Joy. Oh, my God, it's late. The emperor said in surprise. I'd better get ready. Gwyn, when you get back, tell your men to come here. Let's hope this day, somehow, someway, ends without a hitch. But, we know that Achilles' hopes had already been dashed before the dawn of the day. It was just as Achilles the Great was entering the dressing room to prepare for the festivities that Iris, a.k.a. Octavia, who had changed into a lady's dress, came back from Darius's living room with a pale face, having finally finished the long-drawn-out secret discussion. At last, the whole court was in a flurry of activity before the approaching noon, when the celebration was to begin. The corridors, corridors, and gardens, which had been quiet earlier, were filled with people, who were beginning to prepare for the event, stowing and picking up things. In the midst of all this, without being seen, Iris walked swiftly in the form of a courtesan. Just as Achilles the Great could not have known at last that, during the debate, the child of Julia, who was searching for him in the same court, was walking about within arm's reach. Iris, too, had no way of knowing. That at that time a carriage was attached to the back door of the imperial palace and from its driver's platform jumped the strong and silent servant of Sylvia. He opened the door, pulled down from the seat a sack of flour, wrapped completely in a cloak, and carried it on his shoulders, without any help, and entered the palace of the princess. The carriage was carried away by the servants, and neither Paris nor the baggage he had been carrying appeared again. Of course, Iris does not know this. He believes that Marius has long since taken his advice and left Chironia for good, or at least is preparing to do so. It was not long before John's intricate, ironic composition, woven by the threads of fate, was complete. At long last, most of the major players are gathering here in the glittering palace of Obsidian for the celebration. Unbeknownst to her, Iris was walking down the corridor, her pale face hidden behind a veil, her face drawn into a beautiful but stern expression. A keen-eyed observer might have been tempted by her graceful figure, but she was walking a little too briskly. However, as the celebration was about to begin in just a couple of hours and everyone was getting excited, no one paid any attention to the lone lady. Now, the delegations of each country had finished their breakfast and were already preparing for their departure and making final arrangements. The glittering national costumes of the first formal dress sprinkled the cool corridors of the high-ceilinged obsidian palace with lively colors. Thousand Dragon Knights, 1st Battalion, Roll Call. Thousand Tiger Knights, 3rd Battalion, Assemble. Dispatch Dispatch. Count Deus, Protector of the Realm. Into the Middle Room. Lord Chief Deus, please proceed to the Middle Room. Bath. There's no birth. Barth. Captain of the 1st Battalion of the Thousand Dog Knights, Lord Gideon. The beautiful voice of the attendant, with its distinctive mannerisms, is heard everywhere in the court, and the temperamental lady's tantrum to the steward, her yells, commands, and rantings are all mixed together to form a chorus. In the stable, in the stable, the horses roared, thousands of flowers were hung, and the final cleaning and watering took place. It seemed to him that the nobles and merchants of Silen and the Seven Hills were all in uproar over the same thing. Today's Silen was like a battlefield. There, ah, uh, inside. Iris is creeping along. 
Her eyes were fixed on the Empress Palace and the Empress Palace, which occupied a quiet and secluded corner of the rear palace. Look, I'm sure she's fine now, but we need to find out if Empress Mariah is up to something. I also want to know if Sylvia is aware of this or not. If she is, she might be up to something. She's young and not very smart. I don't think she can do anything, but that palace is not for us men. That's what the Grand Duke Darius said about Iris. First, you will enter the rear palace by bypassing the Grand Garden where the Grand Ball will be held tonight. The entire inner palace is under the command of Empress Mariah. In the middle of it all is the splendid Biang Palace where the Empress resides. As I walked into the room, I found that there was a quiet, heavy silence that made me wonder if the previous atmosphere had been a distraction. Where are you going? Name. Belong to. As is customary, it is blocked by the corridor at the entrance to the inner palace. My name is Tavia. I'm in the service of Her Highness, Princess Antonia. Your Highness, please accept the letter from Grand Duke Darius. Identification, please. Yes. Good. Go. Come on through. Her handprint is, of course, an official one. It was easy to get through. Was called out again. Oh, here. That corridor is closed to traffic today. If you want to go to the Grand Duchess's chamber, take the northeast corridor and go around the north entrance. Yes. Without asking anything back, he walked around the opposite corridor and when he came out of sight of the guard. Iris looked around, fluttered over the elegantly carved balustrade of the cloister, and jumped into the hedge. The Cilician Palace is composed of a number of splendid buildings, connected to each other by a foyer and a circular corridor. Between the buildings, there are many trees, flower gardens and ponds, and the whole palace looks like a garden. In the midst of it all, Iris quickly went from tree to tree, hiding herself like a butterfly, fluttering closer to the core of what she sought. The deeper she went into the palace, the more clearly Iris felt the presence of something strange there. Perhaps there is an order to act as if nothing had happened. As much as possible, it is made to look as if nothing has changed. The festive decorations have been put up, and the daily routine seems to be closed today. However, in spite of this pretense, the expressions of the ladies who passed by occasionally were surprisingly stiff, and when they passed in front of some hut, there were always several women gathered there, chattering in secret, without any preparation for the festival. They would jump at the sign of someone passing by, and turn their eyes in panic. In this part of the city, where many women of the royal family reside, the women's veils, coats of arms, and dress styles are slightly different so that they can be easily recognized. Iris is wearing the uniform of Her Royal Highness Antonia, Grand Duchess Darius, who is the second highest ranking lady after Empress Mariah and Princess Sylvia. In Chironia, women of high rank, both royal and noble, do not live in the same house as their husbands. In the provinces of Anten and Wolstad, it is common for the whole family to live in the same castle, as in the case of the lower classes. But this is a provincial way of doing things and is not considered sophisticated. Iris crept to the vicinity of Empress Mariah's apartments, keeping herself low. But that was as far as he got, and before he could go to the Empress's side, Iris was forced to choose between risking a great deal of danger if she went any further, or turning back to avoid the risk of being questioned by whoever she was. In spite of the fact that the Imperial Palace was supposed to be a place where men were not allowed, a huge company or more of the Imperial Guards were packed in tightly, cutting off, so to speak, the Empress's living room and its surroundings from the rest of the palace. His armor and spearheads glittered in the sun. Iris decided to turn back from there. In any case, it was unlikely anyone else could get close enough. Having seen the guard, he had achieved his goal. Still, she hid there for a while and watched, but when she realized that even the maids were not allowed to come here, she left again, taking care not to be seen. He then went to the Imperial Princess Palace, a little further south. It was a very unpleasant task. If possible, he did not want to get too close to this half-sister. The people around the Empress Palace were very lively, as they had not yet been informed of Empress Mariah's treason. People are coming and going. Iris, who had been watching from the shadows for some time, 
eventually drew a female officer into the shadows of the trees, knocked her unconscious with a blow, and stripped off her uniform and put it on her. They tied up the unconscious woman in her underclothes, put a gag on her, pushed her into the bushes to hide her, and then, with unconcerned faces, crept into the imperial palace. In order to avoid being seen and regarded as unfamiliar, they took a bundle of linen from around the corner, held it up graciously to cover their faces, and walked down the corridor with their faces covered. As you can see, as the Lord is a young girl of nineteen, the interior of the Empress Palace is much more youthful and flamboyant than the surroundings of the Empress Palace and, in fact, the Duke and Princess Palace that Iris knows so well. Although the size of the building itself was much smaller than that of the Imperial Palace, its interior walls were all covered with white marble and rose-colored weaving, and the trees planted around the Imperial Palace were all flowering trees. A white, elegant building stood over a courtyard with a small fountain patio. It was filled with the scent of linolea in full bloom. The upper part of the corridor is covered with a weave and there are beautiful statues of Saria in many places. In addition, there are huge plaster snowflake jars filled with flowers everywhere. As she walked slowly through it, Iris began to feel distressed at the strong scent of the flowers. In order to catch her breath, she chose a room with no dusk, and entered it to find herself in the princess's wardrobe. On all four walls, shelves are hung with colorful dresses, cloaks, furs, jackets, shoes, and accessories. The silks of Kumu, the laces of Paro, and the cushions of Kitai catch the eye. Happy girl. Unknowingly, an annoyed cursing voice escaped from Iris' lips. You're so happy, so carefree, so full of everything, and yet you want to take away my only dream. You don't know what kind of atrocities, cruelties and sins your mother committed to build your current glory and splendor on, and yet you are praised and adored as the only princess, you've never wept, you've never been denied what you wanted. Iris' eyes burned blue. Suddenly, she stretched out her hand and snatched a dazzling Paro-style dress made of the most beautiful rose-colored silk and lace like snowflakes. Gently, hesitantly, I walked over to a huge portrait mirror attached to a part of the wall and placed the dress on my chest. Sylvia was much smaller than Iris in terms of size, so it was obvious that she was too small for Iris. So, so thin, your torso. Your arms, your shoulders, your neck. I'm sure it is. She's a real princess who's never ridden a horse or wielded a sword. I've never had a sunburn, and my skin is as white as water. I'm sure if I wore it, I'd look like a clown at a festival. For a while, Iris was enjoying the light, fluffy, smooth touch of the silk and lace. Then, in a flash, she pulled out a small knife that had been fastened tightly to the inside of her ankle to hide it, bit her lip, and roughly cut her dreamy, beautiful dress into pieces. My mother's sorrow shall be repaid to your mother a hundredfold. Iris looked down at her mangled dress with a mad gaze and muttered, I'd like you to have a little of my longing and envy. I'm sure this dress is your favorite, Sylvia. You'd be horrified and horrified to find it torn to shreds by who knows what. You deserve to feel that way. Envy of your mother, of your sisterhood, of injustice, of love, don't feel bad. With a sister like me, whose life was brought to life by a doll, I'm really sorry for you. Sister, I'll sneak back out into the hallway. Yes, my sister. What a surprise. That selfish, bratty, helpless little girl with half my father's blood running through her veins. And, and the same one man who has a thing for the dastardly minstrel, Iris turned her head and walked down the corridor, unable to decide what to do. Should he go closer to Sylvia and see how she was doing, or should he be satisfied that nothing had changed and return to his home? Then, faintly, from behind the curtains of a room he was just passing, he heard a voice. So, Clara, you tell her. After all, you're the princess's favorite. No, that's not true, you know perfectly well that the princess has no favorites when she's not in a good mood. You want me to take the blame for this? It's terrible, but someone has to tell her. It'll take a good part of the day to get the princess ready, and there's bathing to do and a loincloth to tie. But, Zoe, the princess said that no one should ever come until she called. 
But if we don't, then you should go, Miriam. No, no way. Have you forgotten about Lena? That's not very nice of you to make me feel so poor, is it, boys? That's why you're my favorite. You don't care if I'm whipped or killed, do you? Yes, I do. Oh, come on, Clara. No one said anything about that. Normally, I just say I'll tell your mother and that would take care of it. Hey, hey, what the hell happened to you, huh? The soldiers. Sure. Anyway, something's happened. I don't think it's something to do with the Empress, but it's something serious, I'm sure. Of course it is. There's no way I'm letting the King's Guard into this palace if it's not important. That's ridiculous. But it is the order of the Lady Superior of Parlia that we are not to discuss or speculate about it. What should we do now? About the princess. I'm still good for another half a dozen. Why don't you wait until you're on your last legs and say so? We might have something by then. But I'm on the edge, and then I'm really on the edge. Isn't that better than being beaten by a princess Sama? Oh, my God, you're so selfish. If it was my daughter, I wouldn't have raised her like that, but, but hey. His voice became shrill, and was replaced by a shrill laugh. If you're a little more beautiful, a little more clever. But it's the princess anyway. It's a shame. Clara would have been so much better off if she hadn't. She's not Mariah's daughter, she's better than that. Shoo, 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 shoo. But why is that person so selfish? That's what princesses are like. If I were a man, I wouldn't want to be Princess Chelonia, not like that. Shoo, you're talking too loud. After hearing that, Iris quietly left the room. I can easily recognize the Imperial Concubine's living quarters because she's always looking at the map and keeping the geography of the entire Palace of Obsidian in her mind. She quietly crept into the next room. The Imperial Palace is in a state of great excitement, but only the drawing room and the next room are still, probably because Sylvia has kept people away, and the curtains are still closed and heavy, facing away from the morning light. Are you still asleep? Self-defeating. Iris stepped onto the heavy carpet and entered the living room. The living room is empty. The beautiful and luxurious furnishings of the daughter appear in the faint light that leaks from the curtains. A large, beautifully inlaid musical instrument, the tamer, several fine paintings on the walls, and a statue of a nymph supporting a jar on her shoulder and twisting herself gracefully. Opulent, tapestry with scenes of Ilana and Marion, beautiful, squat chairs with weaving on them, flowers and fruits in abundance. Everything was worthy of the heiress of Chironia, the mightiest kingdom in the Middle Kingdom, with all the luxuries that would make Iris's heart swell with bitter and mad jealousy. Iris glared at the large portraits of Emperor Achilles and Empress Mariah hanging on the wall. Ha! Ah, and, when his eyes landed on Empress Mariah's gaunt, beautiless face, there was a glint of fire in his blue eyes. Murderous intent is. Yes. Faintly, Iris' lips twisted into a shape that could not be described as laughing or crying. I don't want to be crowned Princess of Chironia. I just want to be rid of the pain, the tragedy, the envy of my mother's death, no matter what. I just want to get rid of it. If Mariah has to go through what I went through, I lost my beloved mother let me tell you the pain of being murdered. As a mother whose beloved daughter was murdered, you will be disgraced, and your daughter, your only hope, will be killed, and you will die mad with disappointment and despair. Even that much punishment is not enough for that cruelty you inflicted on my mother, Sylvia, my sister, you have nothing to envy but love. So why did John allow such a crime to be committed against your mother? And hate her, curse her, weep for her. In return, I won't make you suffer like my gentle and beautiful mother did. Just one thrust and I'll take your breath away. Sylvia. Marius's pining face became distant in his eyes and disappeared. Call it envy, call it jealousy, call it jealousy, call it whatever you want. I'm the poster child for the doll. Who made me what I am, a cursed, lonely soul condemned to live in ice and darkness forever. I can't be saved, and I don't expect to live much longer. How many people and dozens of people have I survived at the hands of, my life, itself, is cursed. 
O oh God, have mercy on the flower of Eurelia. Marius, Marius, O oh, Marius. I'm glad I said goodbye to you. For someone like me who lives in the dark, your brightness, your smile, your voice, everything is too bright too painful. But, Sylvia, even you can't have Marius. You can't have Marius. You can die here at my hands and be free of the hassles of son-in-law selection and the pangs of unrequited love forever. We are siblings who have never known each other as sister or sister, but you can think of it as the last and final meeting between sister and sister. Iris' eyes were fixed and her face was whiter than paper. Iris quickly pulled out her sword and hid it in her sleeve. Sylvia, say your prayers. In return, I'm sure I'll be following you as soon as I'm caught. Marius, goodbye, Marius. I've always loved you. Sylvia. Where are you? Where are you? One step, another step. I'll go across the living room. The only thing that's left is the door to the bedroom. Iris looked around and went back to the entrance of the living room. Lock the door to the living room from the inside so that no one can get in, and then go back to the door to the bedroom. Sylvia. As if she were a passionate lover, calling out her lover's name and looking for him, she repeats his name in her mind and gently puts her hand on the bedroom door. The door was unlocked. Inside the easily opened door, it was pitch dark. From the living room, even in the dim light, I could see the shadows of people covered with futons in the huge canopied bed in the center of the room. Who? A faint voice said scoldingly. Iris boldly stepped into the dark room. Her heart was pounding so hard that she could hardly breathe. Who? A slightly muffled voice, a little louder than before, cries out from inside the bed. However, the figure in the bed did not seem to raise himself. I told you not to come in here and whip anybody, didn't I? Do you want to get whipped, princess? Iris said in as low a voice as possible while half closing the door behind her. It's time for you to get ready, sir. That voice, Clara, it sounds like it. Surprisingly, Sylvia said. What? You've got the flu. Your voice is ridiculously hoarse. Yes. Princess, um. His voice gave me the courage not to be disturbed. I can kill him. Kill him. I'm going to get it over with. Remember Julia's death. Octavia, no, Iris. It's the doll. Power. I told you not to go in there. Sylvia's voice is pointy. No one takes me seriously. All they do is talk about me, princess, princess, and I know what they say behind my back. I know you're not pretty enough, you're too thin, you're naughty, you're selfish, you're a slut, you're a silly princess, I know everything. Princess Sama. Iris clutched her sword tightly and drew closer. In one gulp, throat. Or maybe it's just a peck on the heart. Hold a pillow to your face to keep from screaming, a rumbling sound in the throat. Marius's stern, sad eyes come back to life for a moment, and then disappear into the darkness at the end. Daughter of my husband's lover's killer, you are at the mercy of your sister's killer. Oh doll, take my soul to thee. Oh, Marius, Marius, Marius. One more step, a few more steps. That's when I heard Sylvia's voice. Close that door, Clara. The light's too bright. I don't like it. It was the most unsettling thing I've ever heard. Iris stopped and wondered what to do. It seemed difficult to do the deed in the dark. What are you doing? Come on. Yes, sir. Reluctantly, Iris went back and closed the door. I can handle it once my eyes adjust. We can't hear you this way, don't panic, Iris. We've still got plenty of time. My sister's killer would be more likely to strike in the dark. I'll get the sword again. Where are you, Sylvia? Groping, he gently creeps toward the bed. It's the doll. If we follow that voice. The inside of the room is completely dark with the hot curtains closed. There was a silence. Iris walked towards the bed, but, suddenly, he froze in his tracks. Sylvia is crying. Faint, half-absorbed by the pillow, pitiful, heart-wrenching sobbing like an abandoned child. Iris's throat rumbled loudly again. Princess, is it that time already? Are you going to get ready? A broken voice, mingled with sobbing. Yes. 
So, another day begins. Just waiting for the day to pass. A long, painful, sad day. Clara. It's only ten Tarzan, isn't it? Leave me like this for a moment. Princess. Iris said, her voice as low as possible, whispering. Are you okay? Fitz, well, Fitz, yeah, bad. Same as always, you know that. These days I'm always in bad shape. Don't torment me by asking me why, because anyone in my position would be helpless to do anything about it but cry in secret during the brief moments they're alone. Isn't that right? Oh. Darkness can make a man bold and tempt him to confide in you. Isn't that right, Clara? Ha. Huh. I know what you're thinking, too. Sylvia said in a muffled voice, her face completely buried in the pillow. In such a splendid court, with all its luxuries, with nothing unattainable, with nothing wanting and nothing unobtainable, what is it that you lack, you selfish girl? You selfish, world-weary little girl, while all this time many poor people are dying of hunger, sickness, and war. I'm sure you think so. I know exactly what you think. That's what you're all thinking. No, that's that's a hell of a lot of. But the reason I trust you the most is that you don't pretend to understand my feelings at once, like the other women, and I have happened to hear you talking to other women. When they thought I was asleep, they said terrible things about me. About my, about my looks, about my character, about your mother. You were the only one who protected me. You told me I was selfish but loving and pretty. That you liked me. I don't know what I would have done if you hadn't told me that. I can't let you execute every last one of them. And when they ask you why, do you think you're gonna be the laughing stock of the nation because you said your mother and I weren't pretty enough? Yes. I always thought so. A princess really isn't happy or good enough for people to envy her. And yet, just because I happen to have been born a princess, even though I didn't want to be, people call me selfish and criticize me no matter what I do or what I want, and take it for granted that I accept all the rude mockery and excessive expectations that would never be said if I weren't a princess. And if I don't, you blame me as if I'm not human. I wonder if you've ever thought about that. At this unexpected misunderstanding and statement, Iris was bewildered, unable to move, and stood still in the darkness. This was an unexpected success. But on the other hand, Iris felt a strange and strong interest in him, and so she could not move from her place. Regardless of Iris's silence, Sylvia continued. What is there to be envied so much? You say you're a princess of Chironia, the greatest country in the Middle Kingdom, but this is your father's country. I don't care what you think. Whatever you think, I think. And what is so enviable about the position of a princess? You're free, you're watched all the time, you're regal, you're ostentatious, you can't do anything you want, you can't go anywhere you want, you can only be alone in the lavatory and in bed. Or else they think you're a deca doll with no human heart. Love, yes, I know nothing of love, I cannot choose a husband for myself, and I am suddenly asked to marry an old man, a black-hearted man. An ambitious man, a prince of a strange land. What is there to envy in my situation? What makes you so happy? I'd gladly give up my position as a princess to anyone at any time. Once I'm a town girl no one will think I'm selfish for doing what I do. I alone, as a little girl named Sylvia, can find my own love. Yes. I'll give up everything I have right now. I'm tired of this. Is there a single person in this court as unhappy as I am? Clara, people are always staring at me, searching me, looking at me coldly. Am I that bad a person? I have a bit of common sense. I don't think you think I'm the most beautiful woman alive. But that doesn't mean I'm not that ugly like you guys say in your snide remarks, does it? If it weren't for the crown princess, I'd be young, a cutie like any other, a bit selfish, but first and foremost a normal, ordinary girl of 19, and that's all. And yet, just because she's an imperial princess, they say she looks like a frog but her heart is a doll and her head is a worm. Oh, oh. Is there anything else as pitiful as me? Who else is as unappreciated, mistreated, abused, tormented, and mistreated as I am? 
I wish every other human being in this world, every Demos, every Laos, every Baldur, every last one of them, would die on Janus' raft. As she was saying this, her heart began to beat harder and harder, and Sylvia put her face to the pillow and cried out again. As you can see, this logic, though somewhat one-sided, was certainly not without its own merits. It must have been because this Princess Chironia, who had just turned nineteen, really felt so from the bottom of her heart that she could not bear it. But as you can see, this logic was not easily accepted by the shady sister and daughter. Rather, it was the haughty lament of one who had it all, and it aroused her passion. But Iris bit down on her feelings and murmured some sympathetic words in her mouth. Without hearing this, Sylvia continued for a while to sob unworthily. While she was weeping, the thought that there would ever be another as pitiful as she was came to her heart, and she was filled with grief. However, after a while, he seemed to realize that there was nothing he could do no matter how much he cried, and his voice became a little lower. Ah! Letting out a deep, despairing breath that only a nineteen-year-old maiden could make, Sylvia stopped crying and sniffled. I want to die. I could really do that. Without thinking, Iris murmured and gently took back her sword. However, she felt that there was an unexpectedly loud noise and rushed to look for a sign. What will happen to me now? At that moment, Iris heard Sylvia murmuring in a reluctant voice, like a child tired of crying. It was said that Baldur and Laius were both displeased with their father, but that did not make things much better. I'm not even sure I like him anymore, but that doesn't mean I don't like him. But Demos hates me. He doesn't care who I marry to Kumu or who I take as a son-in-law. He's just relieved to be rid of me. You know, there are so many men in this wide world, and there is no one who truly, sincerely cares for and loves me, a nineteen-year-old girl named Sylvia. Sylvia. They only look at me as if marrying me would make them king of Chironia. Even if I look like a literal frog, they will pour out sweet dreams and gifts to me as long as I'm the heiress. And it's the same with my father and mother. He doesn't care what I really think or even what kind of daughter I am. The truth is he's never loved me. He only sees his daughter, the princess of Chironia. And so is your mother. She's more exacting and only looks at me when I'm her good girl. If I disobey her, there's only terrible wrath waiting. I've thought about it for a long time. Why does something as miserable as me live? Father and mother are far away from me, and Demos won't even look at me, and the maids mock me. Sylvia, lonely, lonely Sylvia. So much silk and lace and jewels, so much flattery and dancing, so much loneliness and desolation. There is no one in this world who loves me truly. I'm not in love with anyone either. Saria is hard on me. There are other girls, far uglier and far meaner than I, crying and laughing because they found their love. And here I am, in my luxurious bed, sobbing miserably. When I wake up, I'll bathe in hot water, make up beautifully, comb my hair and wear a dress, a glittering celebration and a grand ball. Oh, I'm tired of living. I'm tired of flattery and lies and smiles. Just a piece of me. I want the truth. I want true love. I want to die. Instead of crying out loudly as she usually does, Sylvia sniffed quietly and wriggled weakly. Iris cocked an eyebrow and peered into the gloom. She doesn't even know about her mother's downfall and imprisonment. She mumbled in her mouth. This girl really doesn't know anything. Not about the past, not about the present. But that doesn't excuse her. The sins of this girl... Her father and mother are sins. Ignorance is also a sin. But if this simple girl knew about her mother and what her mother had done, even Iris could see that Sylvia was just an ordinary girl with nothing outstanding about her, and that everything was just as it should be. If only she hadn't been a princess, Sylvia said, it would have been true. A plain, little girl from Chironia, without responsibility, awareness, or ambition as the heiress, only dreaming of her own love. I must kill with my own hands such a little girl who can say with all sincerity that she needs neither country nor power before her love. Sister, this girl is my sister. Alone, sobbing that no one loves me, 
a small, ordinary, inconspicuous girl. What a yarn trick. What a fate. Yarn, have mercy. Me and this girl, born of the same father, sister and sister. Octavia listened to Sylvia's faint breathing, feeling a strange flutter of palpitations. Clara, if Sylvia's voice is familiar with her daily noble voice, it will sound surprisingly soft and gentle. Say something. Say something. Yes, um. Octavia blinked her lips. He felt his murderous intent for Sylvia fade away, but he still had mixed feelings about her. The uh, I can't bring myself to soothe Sylvia and tend to her wounded self-respect. Besides, if I talked too long, there was a risk that my true identity would be revealed. The the, the bard is. The words suddenly slipped out of her lips. Yeah. Sylvia accepted the question without much surprise. Marius, right? The mere mention of that name, coming from her sister's lips, was enough to cause a violent surge in Octavia's heart. Octavia doesn't realize that it's jealousy that's driving her. That's, well, that man is another story. Sylvia said, without knowing it. You're right, I don't dislike that man. He's beautiful and cocky and has a nasty reputation, but there's something classy about him too. Yes, I admit, there's a certain charm to him. Of course, I don't think he's half as good-looking as Demos. And he's a really good singer, anyway. That's a lot better than most men, if only to keep me occupied. But that doesn't mean I love him or anything. Sylvia pondered. I love you. What does that mean? Do you understand? Come on. Yes. Strange, said Iris, seized by a vague feeling in her heart. Just listening to Sylvia talk about Marius made his body feel hot and his head feel as if it was being squeezed. Iris forgot the thought of talking too much, lest she be recognized as not being Clara. In my opinion, love means that you cannot stop thinking about one person all the time, and when you find yourself thinking about him, you cannot help wondering what he is doing and where he is. I wanted to know everything about him, and no matter how much I looked, I could not get enough of him, and if he was hiding something, I couldn't help wondering about it whether age, status, or something else was an obstacle. He was always afraid that his age, status, or something else might be a hindrance, and he felt as if he were very much inferior, and whenever he was happy or sad, he wanted to share it with his partner, and sometimes he would rather kill his partner than give him away. I don't know what has happened to me at all, and I am perplexed, angry, and confused, but I just can't bring myself to solve this frustration. It is my opinion that love is such a thing, princess. Well you've he definitely got the flu, Clara. Absolutely. And I didn't know you knew so much about love until now. Sylvia said, amused. Let me ask you something. If you can answer so clearly and immediately, you must of course be in love with someone right now, right? Yes. How dare you? Even I, the master, didn't do that. What kind of man are you, gentle, diffident? She's so sweet. Princess, and so cheerful. What color is your hair? And your eyes? Her hair is a dark brown curl that glistens chestnut in the sun. And his eyes are a mischievous brown, somewhere between black and brown. Are you tall? I don't like short men. From me, sir. Iris chuckled. It's just a little bit higher, but if I wear sandals with a little bit more heel, I'll be higher. Clara is taller than I am. But on the side, she's sturdy, isn't she? That's why you're so much smaller than I am. No way. Is there such a man? Sylvia burst out laughing. What do you like about such a man who's shorter and saggier than a woman? Is he so rich? He probably doesn't have much money at all. Well. So you're a fallen nobleman with nothing but honor, I bet. He's a wretched man not necessarily a wretched man by birth, I'm afraid, but a wretched man by life, I'm afraid. But of course you have at least a knighthood, don't you? I don't have a title or even a house of my own. I'm a wanderer, wandering from town to town, looking for human affection. You look like a minstrel. It's a bit like that. Well, you know, we've known each other for a long time, and I've known him for less than a year. When I think about it, 
in the space of two months or so, he has entered my thoughts in a way that I will never be able to escape again. I've only known him for a couple of months, and I don't have any money. Sylvia murmured, as if startled. So you can say that you love him? Really? Yes, I would give my life and all my longings and desires for him. That's how much I love him. Ah. Sylvia exhaled, then regained her composure and continued. So, what about you, man? Does he love you, too? Yes. Iris's voice had a triumphant crack to it. But how do you know, how do you know that he loves you? Yes, I've said it many times. And it's the most beautiful thing in the world. How dare you? That's okay. Maybe I just needed to open up and talk more. At least then I would have known more. I've never had anyone tell me they loved me, to tell the truth. I wonder what that feels like. What did it feel like the first time a man said that to you, Clara? It was as if my eyes were blown out of their sockets and everything suddenly looked different, as if I could see things clearly for the first time and realize for the first time how much I loved my partner. It was as if I could see for the first time how much I missed you. Hmm. That means we're both in love. I'm jealous. You're so adorable, Sylvia said, embarrassed. I can honestly say now that I don't know why I was chasing Demos around so much. It's true that I didn't dislike him, but I don't think I was ever asleep at night or daylight without him as people thought I was. There were times when it was really close to that, though, when it was stirred up. Mostly, it was stubbornness and face value and the idea that I deserved to have a crush or two, which was much bigger. I've always liked Demos. But, you know, I've never wanted to marry him or have him. I just wanted to make sure that I, Demos, liked me. And, I don't know, the rest of it was just too much. Because Demos just avoided me so thoroughly. If she hates me like that, as an imperial princess, I won't be able to back down quietly. Don't you think? Anyway, if only Demos had been able to get away with it. I could have married her off to Mongol or wherever as a beautiful reminder of my first love as a child. And yet, Demos acted as if I didn't exist, and my bride was defeated by Paro, and my fiancé was assassinated. I felt as if everything was trying to make a laughing stock of me, even John. It's just a bunch of nonsense, I know that. Sylvia seemed to be beginning to become completely intoxicated with the urge to make an important confession. But I felt rather relieved that I did not have to choose between Laius and Baldur tonight, as if I had just woken up from a bad, long dream. And then, finally, I was thinking, what was I really doing, what did I really want to do, not as the princess of Chironia, but as a daughter of the Nineteen. And I've been thinking about that ever since yesterday. And now, finally, I know a little. I, I want to be in love. You may laugh but I want to meet and fall in love with the one person in my life that I'm meant to be with. I want to be able to choose and decide for myself the only life I will ever have. All my life I've been just a princess of Chironia. Your mother's good girl, your father's good girl, never doing anything for myself. But after what happened to Prince Mire and Laius and Baldur, I finally understand. I've had enough of being pushed around. But I was raised not to know how to decide for myself, not even what to wear today. Once I leave this room, I'll be nothing more than a selfish, whimsical princess, a courtesan who can't even meet a man she doesn't know to find love, a pariah, a big doll. I can't do anything, I have no power to do anything, I've never loved or been loved by anyone. I'll never have the strength to leave this room and face the ritual. Oh. I really wish I had been born as a nobleman's daughter instead of a princess of Chironia. Hey, Clara. Let me ask you something. How did you meet this good man, Clara? How did you fall in love with him? Who told you, when, how, and did you promise to marry him? No promises. I'm not making any promises. He's convinced I'm a man. Bitterly, Iris laughed. We've made no promises and we haven't even opened up to each other yet. Oh, but you just told me that you too. If you like each other, you will know these things somehow. The light in your eyes, your smile, the way you always look for each other with your eyes when you notice. But I'm not revealing anything. 
He told me he loved me. But I haven't whispered a word of love to him yet. Oh, my God. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Sylvia exclaimed, her curiosity completely piqued. You like each other, and you've told me, and you haven't said a word. Oh, is there something about you that you can't get over? Oh, okay. He's got a wife and kids. I know. No, sir. As far as I know, there is no such thing in him. So, Clara's parents are against it or something? No, not that either. We are, in a way, out of step. He's in a bad position, and I don't think any of us would congratulate him if he knew we were together. Well, that's not true. I bless you. I bless you. Sylvia even raised her body and said fervently, clasping her hands together in the darkness, entranced. After all, although her status and environment made her inexplicably selfish and conceited, she was fundamentally just an honest and ordinary girl, and she was neither mean-spirited nor crooked by nature. In fact, if she had been like that, she could have behaved better and gained a good reputation in the court. The sight of her sister's unknowingly sincere and compassionate nature made Iris a little perturbed. He felt his mind wavering and his hostility slipping away. That's because you don't know him, princess. Oh, no. Well, then bring him back and let me see him. I'm sure you will. Then I'll definitely be on your side, a good side. Do that. It's too sad that your love won't come true because of your status. If you want, I'll take your boyfriend to make him a respectable man, a man worthy of being the husband of an imperial consort. Then you won't have to be bothered by your relatives and parents who only care about formality, and no one will be able to point fingers at you, will they? Oh, no, that's not very nice. Why? I want the people at court who are always accusing me of being selfish and a terrible master to know that there are times when I'm not. Status doesn't matter when you're in love. I'm on the side of those in love, no matter what anyone says. Oh, at last, Iris's heart wavered and she fell into a sweet, carnal love. Her sister's mother, although she hated, cursed, envied, and envied the luxury and happiness that she had brought upon herself, felt unjustly, had no such hatred for her sister herself. Even the difference in happiness between the two sisters, which had separated them would become clearer if they were told by their own mouths that such things were not happiness at all, but unhappiness in these areas, and that the life of an imperial princess might not be unconditionally happy. Above all, although Iris may have grown up with an icy exterior, hidden within was a nature that was hotter than fire and more susceptible to emotion. It was for this reason that he still devoted his entire heart to his late mother, and it was for this reason that he fell in love with Marius. And it was because he knew this about himself that he wore the mask of ice over his entire body. By now, his desire to kill Sylvia had melted away like snow on a summer's day. Not only that, but Octavia, who was lonely and starved for the affection of her flesh and blood, could not help but feel a pang of longing for her sister that she could not hold back. Well, how sweet of you, princess. Octavia screamed as if she couldn't take it anymore. She had forgotten that her sword had slipped one day and buried itself in the carpet. The sound of her voice must have stirred Sylvia as well. Oh, you're the first person who's ever said that to me. Everyone always assumes that I'm stupid, unbeautiful, selfish, etc. without thinking or knowing me. How can you be a good person when you're looked at like that? But I'm really not the bad girl or the nasty girl everyone says I am. Am I right? People don't know anything about the princess. The princess is very kind, very pretty, and very sincere. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm glad it's so dark in here. I'm lying down right now, unashamed. I don't want anyone to see. But really, in 19 years of living, you're the first person who's ever been a friend to me. You and I are friends now, aren't we? Not master and lady. But friends, right, Clara? E. E. That call, ironically, brought Octavia back to herself. Yes. I'm not Clara. I've been so lost in the darkness I've forgotten how I'm an unwelcome visitor, an interloper of Grand Duke Darius, 
daughter of Sylvia's mother's avenger. Suddenly, my heart got cold. But it was not to Sylvia. Octavia, who had been completely awakened to the love of her half-sister as a sister, was pained to think how disappointed and distrustful Sylvia would be when she later met the real Clara and learned that all the events in the darkness had been a lie. Even kill Clara, Octavia thought. Sylvia was enraptured, and continued to speak in a tone of voice more innocent than ever, as if she were a nineteen-year-old girl. Of course, this is a secret between us. I'm not going to show you that I know anything about it or that I think you're special. I don't want other people to find out and get in trouble. I've learned a lot about how twisted and disgusting people can be with Demos. Other people want to reduce everything to its most hideous, filthy, vile form, don't they? Except when it's just you and me, I'm happy to hold on to my beautiful secret and know that I have a friend and that she'll never hate me or think I'm a nasty, selfish girl. I do. Oh, I'm on the side of the lovers, Clara. All who love and all who are in love with each other are my friends. I think love that overcomes obstacles is the most romantic. Identities. What's the point? If I was any more sure I loved the minstrel, whether he loved me or not, I'd run to him right now. Even if he doesn't look at me now, I'll make him turn with my love and fall in love with me alone. Oh, love. How lovely. How romantic. Only those in love are true. Only those in love are right. Only those in love are truly alive. Oh, I want to be in love. I want to cry in love, to be troubled in love, to die in love. That's all I want, and that's the only hope that keeps me alive. Love is not really such a wonderful thing. I'm not sure what to say, said Iris, in a somewhat curt tone. Naturally, every time Sylvia mentioned Marius, her heart hardened, and she had been tossing and turning in the midst of conflicting emotions ever since, from a tender sisterly feeling, to a cold one, to a heartbroken one, to a horrified one at John's mischief. It was just like a leaf on a tree. It was just like a boat of leaves in the midst of a torrent of water, running back and forth, spinning around and around, unable to stay still for a moment. Love is really just a painful, troubling, silly, unattractive thing. I know. But I still think it's better to be cool than not be in love. I'd rather die than live the rest of my life not knowing what love is. Isn't that right? The two girls were talking so much that they completely forgot what day and what time they really were, and even what was about to happen. After all, it was impossible for girls of their age to find anything more serious than love, and because of their different circumstances, it was the first time in their lives that they had ever talked openly about love in this way, and they both found it very seductive. They might have talked all day and all night, until dawn and dusk, if no one had interfered. But fortunately or unfortunately, at that moment, a reserved knock made them both jump. My princess, my lady Sylvia. A whispering voice, fortunately it was not the real Clara, came from outside the door. Oh, that's Paris' voice. Suddenly Sylvia jumped up and stumbled, her feet caught in the covers because it was dark. Oh, my God. I've forgotten everything. Clara, Clara, get out of here. I've got something important for Paris. And, uh, take my gown to the antechamber, but, uh, tell Paris to wait in the antechamber, and, uh, pay her respects. Hey, Clara. Although she was completely flustered, Sylvia nervously giggled and revealed the remnants of their sweet dark friendship. Well, then, it's time for the spectacle to begin. The beginning of my love adventure. Tonight, you'll be surprised to death and the whole court will be in uproar. You can look forward to it. What do you intend to do, princess? Octavia, who had somehow become accustomed to the role of a maidservant, was anxious and asked again. Sylvia giggled as if she had been giggled at. It's good, it's good. Yeah, but I'll tell you what, Clara. You're her best friend. You know, I sent Marius to get Paris. Ha. Huh? This time, Iris didn't need to disguise her horror. Well, that's... That bard may not be good enough to be Empress Sylvia's love interest, especially after that lure god Demos. But no matter. 
There are no good men in the court of Chironia anyway. He's a lot better than the rest of them. Best of all, he dismissed my proposal with a simple sniff. As a woman and a princess of Chironia, you think you can just walk away. We have to show Marius and the others in the court that Empress Sylvia is not such a naive girl and give them a surprise. What the hell are you? I'll tell you what, my friend. I'm going to sneak Marius into the party today, and when the dancing starts, I'm going to walk up to him with all eyes on me, and I'm going to introduce him as my man to the whole court. I'm not afraid of your father or your mother. Because I've been told over and over again that I'm free to choose whomever I want. Oh, funny, I can't wait to see their faces. A wretched drifter, an unknown minstrel and the heiress to the throne of Chironia, the greatest kingdom in the Middle Kingdoms. How horrified, confused and frightened they must be. It's nice to think of the chaos that would ensue. Surprised, you just shut up. But no matter what anyone says, I won't stop you from doing this. I've been played for a fool by everyone from Prince Mireille of Mongol to Baldur to Laius. This time I'm going to win them over. I will not be mocked, disrespected, treated like a child, like a puppet who cannot think for himself. Good. It's no use stopping, Clara. Marius is already here, you know. But, if Marius says no. Or Marius already knows. No, said the little man, how can I do such a thing as to humiliate Princess Chironia in the midst of a full house? Besides, I've already taken care of it. I'm not as stupid or naive as people think. I've got the means to make him love me with all his heart, so that he'll never say no. Yeah, but only for a while, of course. I don't want a fake love. I just don't have time for it today. We'll get to his heart later but for now, we're going to hypnotize him with magic. I've already arranged for a mage. He's been coming and going to your mother's house a lot lately. That Katai mage, Yang Su Fan, he's supposed to do my bidding and hypnotize Marius. Yang Su Huang. He should have snuck off in the other room and waited for us. I must have a word with Paris before she makes me change my clothes. I'm sure you'll be so busy after that you won't have any time for anything else. Clara, go away and bring me a light. And tell them not to come in for just ten Tarzan, and let Paris through. And you can't tell anyone what's going on and you can't try to stop it. I'm gonna do it anyway, no matter what anyone says. I'm just gonna do what I think is right. Where is Marius now? It might be questionable, but I couldn't resist asking. That's a secret. I can't tell you, even if you want to. I'm sure Paris will take care of it. Now, go on, we don't have much time. This declaration was so clear that she could find no excuse to disobey. Reluctantly, Octavia mumbled something in her mouth, stepped back, and quickly walked out the door, careful not to be seen. Her eyes were dazzled by the sudden appearance of light in a very dark place. Octavia waited until her eyes had returned to normal, and then she hurried to look around her, trying to find a place where she could hide and watch. But when he noticed that Paris was waiting for him in the room, he was very irritated and had no choice. The princess would like you to wait in the antechamber. So he whispered in a fake voice, turned his face away and went outside. She had to find a place to hide outside, and no matter what, she had to stop this dangerous and ridiculous scheme of her sister. By now, not only had her feelings for Sylvia almost disappeared, but in the heart of this princess, who was not related to her flesh and blood, there was even an irreplaceable sisterly love for her blood sister. But that was of course a different matter from the danger of her lover. I don't understand Sylvia's feelings. But Marius is the one who will suffer the most if he falls for her schemes. If he's not careful, he might be wiped out. I can't go to Gwyn or Uncle now and ask them to do something. They'll be lining up for the parade by now. Octavia's color is all over the place. Marius, if I don't help him, he'll be in trouble. I won't let that happen. I don't know how much more of this brainless idiot I have to deal with. Biting her lips hard, she disappeared from the corridors of the Imperial Palace in the next moment. On the other hand, it's Paris. You're too late. We're running out of time. 
Well, come on in and I'll hurry up and talk to you here. Claire is too late. I told her to bring the light, but what is she doing? The poor Paris stood at the entrance of the bedchamber of the maiden in love, completely flustered and stiff, as Sylvia invited her into the bedroom with a tongue lashing. Light is coming in through the half-open door, and the room is much more clearly illuminated than before. Hey, come on. How'd it go? I hope you're ready for what I asked for. This is the last meeting, and I have to get ready. Paris's eyes, which had been staring at the floor, turned away from Sylvia's annoyance, suddenly lit up. He stoops down and picks up what has fallen. Suddenly, Paris's little eyes glittered. It was the sword that Octavia had dropped. Paris frowned and seemed to be in serious thought. Hey, why are you so lazy, you? Paris came to his senses at the sound of Sylvia's fidgety voice and began to explain in a panic. Chapter 3 The Last Days of Baldur Noon A trumpet was blown at the same time as the lure was hit. All the great gates were opened. The guards raised their spears in unison and took an immovable posture. The seven hills surrounding the silence, Kazegioka, Ikaragioka, Yamigioka, Sugioka, Mizugioka, Torioka, Wolfoka. In the coniferous forests and hills, the trumpets are blown, echoed, scattered, and sucked by the wind. There was no one left to slumber in the dream of last night's eve. Departure. The national flag, the troop flag, the marquee flag, all flags are raised high above the head. All at once, the whip is raised and the spur moves on the horse's belly. The sound of hooves echoes on the cobblestones. It was the beginning of a grand parade from Wind Hill to the whole city of Silen. As if to show the people all the mighty military power of the powerful nation of Salonia, starting with the leading of the King's Guard, the Twelve Knights, the Twelve Electors, the Mercenary Knights, the Infantry, the Archers, the Nobles, and the Foreign Envoys, the parade seemed to go on forever. It was a parade that seemed to go on forever. At the end, Achilles the Great and the Emperor's family, protected by five thousand knights of the King's Guard, appear before the citizens of Silen. Early in the morning, the Emperor and his officials were holding a military review ceremony at the stable. Hundreds of flags were fluttering in the morning breeze. And now, the parade is about to begin. Both sides of the road from Wind Hill to the center of Silen will already be filled with loyal people who want to catch a glimpse of the procession. There will be stalls selling Kalam water and Vacha nuts, hoping for another crowd. At any rate, the parade will be so majestic and so slow that the last group will not enter the city until very late in the afternoon. In the meantime, the preparations for the Grand Supper in the evening will be carried out without a hitch. All the wealthy, the famous, the valiant, the scholars, the nobles, the merchants, representing all of Silonia, are invited to the open-air banquet, to which all the gardens of Wind Hill have been opened. The emperor and his family will be there first. And after that, the five thousand who are invited to the ball in the Hall of Mirrors are the true ruling class of Silonia. For townspeople, scholars, and those of lesser rank, the scene of the palace ball will be shown moment by moment at the outdoor banquet. Who the young princess danced with and who she smiled at will soon be reported by fast horses as far away as Anten and Gila, and as close to the border as Longzania and Verdeland. It's still noon. The long day of celebration has barely begun. After the reviewing ceremony, while the knights were leaving the windhill one after another, the Emperor Achilles returned to the audience hall accompanied by the twelve electors and received formal greetings from the foreign delegations and congratulatory gifts from the kings and their lists. The celebrations were also very lavish, showing the mighty power of Chironia. The female envoy of Kaitai, Tran Van Lang, offered a pile of Kaitai silk, highly prized perfumes, myrrh, rare white deer antlers and golden artifacts, a box of the finest kalam, etc. Needless to say, Kumu is famous for its silk. From Paro there is a magnificent mating of chestnut horses, perfumes, carpets, etc. From Paro there are many pairs of laces of a breathtaking quality, the finest of Salvio's perfumes, several rare and precious books, an inlaid kithra, a dal zither and a set of drums, a jeweled whip. I have been entrusted with this personally by His Highness the Regent, Lord Crystal. When Paro's envoy, Count Linus, a holy knight, 
proudly presented a small box made of virgin wood, which he said was for Her Imperial Highness, the people involuntarily gasped when it was opened. It was a hair ornament made of a huge crystal ball, and inside the ball was a small, small profile of Princess Sylvia, and it changed color every moment, it was just a moment ago that it appeared red, and the next moment it was gold, then silver, then blue, creating a mysterious evening glow of color. Even the princes, who were accustomed to the luxury and extravagance of Paro, could not help shouting in admiration. From Eulania came bronze reliefs of the emperor's family, ornamental swords, a pair of beautiful faria birds, purple cloaks, and jewel-like vacha wine. From the Primorsky cry, too, they sent fine fish, spices and food, statues of Dryadon, and slaves with the skin of the southern coktan. Sigurd, the lord of Talon, sent his envoys with a helmet and a spear, which he had learned to wear with his own hands, for the sake of his neighbor. Under the command of the envoy, there was no end to the number of splendid, rare and precious items brought in, and it seemed as if the spacious audience hall would be filled with them, just like the legend of the black dwarf's hammer, where treasures came out one after another. It was enough to amuse and delight the eyes of all the people present. Speaking of pleasing the eyes, the same was true of the two giants, the leopard-headed warrior and the young giant Zeno, who stood majestically behind Achilles the Great as two statues of the emperor's guardians. The two giants, who did not so much as blink, made one wonder if they were not real statues, but the piercing look in their eyes, which sometimes widened, showed that they were indeed real people. For this occasion, both heroes had been given matching armor, especially by the Emperor Achilles, who wished to make known to Chironia that there were Salinos and Balbus. Apart from their rank and position, it was a decoration given only to these two men. They both wore crimson cloaks fastened at their throats, and on their chests were silver and white with the emblem of Chironia and the Lion of Achilles inlaid. In order to show off the strength of his muscles, it was fastened with shoulder straps, leaving his shoulders and arms bare, and bronze petticoats were fastened with leather straps around his arms and wrists, which were as thick as any. Short leather footpads and bronze underclothes protected the vitals, and bronze shin guards were worn from the knees to the ankles, as well as burly sandals with lions, snakes, and wings as ornaments on the thongs that connected the shin guards. A huge treadmill of practicality hung stiffly and frighteningly at their waists, and Gwyn and Zenon stood with great spears with axes in their left and right hands, respectively, as if they were the gods of war and mythological heroes unrivaled in all the world, let alone in Chironia. From the beginning of the ceremony, the two men stood diagonally behind the emperor, acting as his guardians and living ornaments. They always accompanied the emperor wherever he went, and in the parade that followed, they stood side by side behind the emperor's chariot and presented themselves to the people. The emperor Achilles was enthralled by these two heroes like a child who had won a wonderful toy, but it was not unreasonable for them to do so. For all the people of Chironia knew that as long as these two men stood on the emperor's right and left, the safety and peace of the land would be assured, and all those who would oppose Chironia would have given up their designs. This was also the official presentation to the people and nations of Cheiron of the new hero, Gwyn, who would eventually be known as Zeno. And again, the people greeted the emperor and joined the parade. A little, or rather, a great number of people noticed that Empress Mariah, who should have been standing beside the emperor, had been missing for a long time, and this might have been a sign that something was wrong in the inner palace, and they might have secretly exchanged glances. However, as no explanation was given, there was no one who could question him head-on. The ceremony proceeds smoothly as people's secret doubts, admiration and praise for the two heroes, and congratulatory voices intertwine. After the last of the envoys had made their speeches and withdrawn to join the parade, the emperor, escorted by his entourage, went into a room prepared for him to rest. After resting for half a day and eating a midday meal, he and the imperial princess finally began the imperial parade. Make sure you're well fed, boys. After this, you won't be able to rest until the feast. Achilles was in a curiously good mood. It seemed as if he were trying to dismiss people's grave concern over the absence of the empress with his good mood. Well, Gwyn. Our military strength in Chironia. Gwyn only bowed his head in silence. 
Wouldn't you like to control such a large group of knights and troops at your command? It's the most rewarding thing you can do as a man. I love the reviewing ceremony. There is no view like this that makes my blood boil and my youth come alive. When I think that all the soldiers filling the stable are nothing more than the men who gave their swords to me, my power itself, and my country manifesting itself in human form, my heart is filled with joy and my mind is filled with excitement. It is at times like this that I realize how wonderful it is to be an emperor. The best of the vassals shouted their approval and praise. At that moment, a peasant stepped into the room. The hundred dragon chief. Twitch, leaning close to Gwyn and whispering. There's a visitor outside. Who's that? Gwyn was blunt. I have no private time today. If it's not urgent, I have an important mission to take care of the emperor today. It's urgent. Who is it? A little, here. That's a strange thing to say. I don't think there's anything wrong with asking his majesty and his vassals. That's the thing, the farmer said, perplexed. Very well, sir. If you can't come, this is the message I wanted to send. Iris, the moon on earth, is in danger. The moon on earth, Gwyn thought. Then he glanced at the Emperor Achilles. Is that it? The Emperor quickly realized the meaning of the blink. You may go, Gwyn. I'll be back in one piece by parade time. Don't worry. After all, it's Chironius. Achilles added with a faint smile. It concerns Iris, who lights up Chironia, so be it. Gwyn bowed politely and stood up. Where is it? Over here. Hurriedly, the farmer gave him a hand. With his great sword at his side, Gwyn walked out of the resting room alone. The next room and the antechamber were all filled with people attached to the emperor and the military officers of his bodyguard. The sound of dishes and plates clinking together and the sound of talking was deafening. As soon as Gwyn had gone past, all eyes followed him, and for some time afterwards they talked about him as if they were in agreement. Gwyn was unconcerned about this. As he was led by the maidservant, he passed through the corridor, went out to the gallery, and came to a green garden between the stable and this part of the house. This garden must have a name, but as a newcomer he did not know it yet. Not yet. In a moment. Before they knew it, the busy people had disappeared, and they had entered a deserted area. Chiron's obsidian palace spans all of the hills and far surpasses even Paro's crystal palace in size and vastness. It is roughly divided into five blocks, each of which is further divided into many buildings and wings. Within each block are numerous gardens, gazebos, and corridors, and between each block are large gardens, wide pavements, and woods. It was equivalent to a small city by itself. Of course, no matter how many court servants there are, the places where they can be found are generally quite isolated. There are more places that are completely empty. Gwyn looked around without any fear. On both sides and in front of him were dense trees. The stone pavement of the road under the trees twisted and turned slightly. I was about to ask him if Iris was here. Gwyn's keen ears caught the faint sound of a crack. Reflexively, he twisted away. But on this day he wore a long, heavy cloak, reaching down to his ankles, and a cloak of bare shoulders and upper chest, which was different from what he usually wore. All he had to do was dodge. He quickly missed the vital point, but a small steel arrow flew at the top of his bare right arm. Gwyn rips off his cloak with his left hand and holds it above his head, dispelling the second and third arrows. Before he knew it, the little lord had disappeared. When he had received several more arrows with his cloak, the whistling ceased. Has he caught the arrow? Still undaunted, Gwyn drew up his cloak, listened carefully, and drew himself up. In his haste, he strained his muscles and managed to avoid being struck by an arrow, but the arrow still pierced him to a great depth. The arrows could strike again at any moment. He has no time to cast off his cloak, remove his arrows, or draw his sword. Moreover, the sword of the day was wrapped around the hilt with a decorative rope for the ceremony. It would take a long time to pull it off. But Gwyn didn't seem to be phased. He then stood up and threw away his cloak, after confirming that the attack with the bow and arrow was over. He looked about him without hesitation. The world is still and silent. Faintly, 
a little bird's voice could be heard, and from far away, on the wind, a voice that seemed to belong to the parade, mock, came from far away on the wind. Silence. The sunlight fluttered on the undergrowth, weaving a pattern more delicate than the lace of Paro. And, Gwyn suddenly jolted to his feet. Get back on your feet quickly. He quickly pulls out the arrow and throws it away, then slowly pulls out the cloth from the hiding place and ties it tightly over the wound. Tightly tying it up with his mouth and left hand, he held up the sword with his left hand, bit off the string with his mouth, put the sword in his mouth, and grasped the hilt with his left hand. His right hand hangs slack. The wind whispered in the treetops. Again, Gwyn's leopard head bobbed slightly from side to side. But Gwyn said nothing. He doesn't speak. Doesn't do anything. He stands still and strains so as not to use even a single ounce of his strength. Then, a huge Baltic bird flew away from the house with a rustling sound of leaves. A large shadow fell on its undergrowth. Gwyn. Slowly, a voice that sounded pleased, as if it was dripping with venom, said, Thank you for your help. The man who looked down through the treetops was a man with bristling red hair and serpentine eyes, needless to say, Viscount Baldur himself. His red hair is deeply covered by his hat, his cloak is gathered around his shoulders, he carries a hatchet diagonally across his back, his feet are planted on thick branches, and in his hand is a crossbow held ominously. Baldur, Gwyn said in a calm voice. Baldur looked like something out of the ordinary. He had a bandage wrapped tightly around his torso. It was soaked with blood. Baldur's face was earthy and gaunt, as if he were a ghost wandering from Hades, and his eyes were burning with a strange fire. What about the wound? Can I move it? Gwyn asked. It seems it angered Baldur. I don't need you to tell me what to do. You and I are mortal enemies, even if I die, you can't worry about me. Gwyn. We've known each other a short time, but this is the truth, the very last time. Say your prayers if you have any to say in the matter of the beast. I was going to slice and dice you to the bone, but I may not last much longer. I'm on my way to Hades. I'll give you ten swords at most and you can thank me. I don't know what you're talking about, Viscount Baldur. E.I., that kind of thing about you annoys me to death. All is lost, and there is nothing I can do to turn the tide, I'm trapped, I can't run away, and I'm just waiting for death. And you still talk about the Viscount Baldur, as if you were making small talk in a salon. Oh well. There are only a few more days when you can show off your composure like that. Baldur laughed, panting, and coughed a little. The more you think about it, the more incompatible you are with it. He continued in a voice that could almost be described as sincere. From the beginning, I have disliked you, disliked you, and felt I was going mad. That day when you appeared to the silence, saying that you were going to be taken care of by that old Darcius, was nothing more than a morning bell to let me know that my bad luck had finally run out. From the very beginning you've deceived and humiliated me. After that, you interfered with my attempts to snatch Sylvia's little girl, injured me, turned aside my offer to join hands with you, exposed my secret dealings with Eulania, and, once or twice, when I was at a disadvantage, you appeared only in the wrong places and hindered my ambitions. You must be the Garm who wandered from the hell of Dole only to bring me to the end of my days. If it weren't for you, all would be well, but what do you want from me? You've driven me to my doom. That must have been pretty weird. I'm sure he was laughing at me under that disgusting leopard head, huh? When I think of it, my heart boils, my guts burn, I feel like I've drank boiling lead. I've never had a grudge against you, Gwyn said, somewhat puzzled. I don't care what kind of ambition a man has. I don't know, it's just fate. I'm loyal to my friends. When a woman is in danger I can't help her as a man even if I am a beast. It's because I've always come across you trying to kill my close friends or harm women who have no way to protect themselves that I've come to be in such a situation. You are free to be ambitious, but only if you do it in a way that does not expose you to Janice scrutiny, Viscount Baldur. I hate, hate, hate you so much that I think I'll go crazy just looking at your righteous attitude. In a rage Baldur cried out. 
Startled by the voice, the bird flew again. Don't let Janice see you like this. What are you talking about? When has justice ever existed in this world? It's always been power, 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 the strongest trample the weakest. You don't understand. You don't know what I've been through, what I've been through. A half-breed Taluan, a bastard, a little red-haired man, hard to see, hard to like. Aith Gwyn was tortured in the Taluan village for being a bastard and driven out of the village because of my Chiron blood. At the silent court, where I had arrived based on my father's writings, I was treated as if I were a dog and a beast. You've trained your rapier, you've used your sycophancy, you've grasped your scepter, and you've finally managed to get yourself on the short list for the princess's son-in-law. But now all that is undone. This wound, inflicted in an attempt to kill Iris, is more than a little pleasing to me. I don't like the thought that I'll have to start all over again even if I follow my way to some court. Perhaps it would be more fitting for me, a miserable man, to end my miserable life. But that's why, in the end, I'm going to vomit all I can and carry you and that Iris to hell with me and make her pay for what she's done to me. I won't leave it at that. Gwyn, you'll be the first to know that your Janus justice is of no use in this world. Gwyn seems to be quietly lost in thought. Baldur glared at him and continued with more venom. It's a shame I missed Iris, but she's not worth the trouble, and I'd be quite content to go to my grave if you could, Gwyn. But did you know, Gwyn, that this Iris is a woman? Daughter of Achilles. Well, are you surprised? I knew it. Gwyn said, annoyed. When I rescued Marius and her from your men, I held her up, but I didn't tell anyone because it was none of my business. Baldur, breathing hard on his shoulders, glared at Gwyn, looking as if he would kill her if his eyes could. I hate you, man. That's what I hate about you, that's what kills me, that's what drives me crazy, that's what I hate, that's what I hate. A whisper, squeezed between the teeth. At any rate, your saintliness, the way you alone know everything, the way you take everything in your stride, the way you are so calm that you know everything, the way you take everything in stride. No matter how angry we are, as if you were a little dog barking around a huge camel. It makes me sick. You know, Gwyn, it's only when people are suffering, worrying, pleading and groaning for me that I finally feel a little relieved, drunk with the consciousness of power. You are strong, stronger than anything I've ever seen as strong as a god of war himself. This is enough reason for me to despise you, but in spite of your confident, calm demeanor and your unborn leopard head, you are somehow strangely liked and adored by people, gaining their trust and quickly becoming the emperor's trusted favorite. How can I not hate you for this? It took me ten years to win over Gwyn and Darius, and I know Achilles still doesn't care for me. And yet you wandered in here and became the emperor's favorite aide in a month or so. Where in the world is justice, fairness and equality? I don't believe in that. I was shunned like a caterpillar by men and yet I rose to become the son-in-law of an imperial princess on my own merits. I'm not going to let you get away with it, and I won't let Iris get away with it. All the happy people in the world should fall, be destroyed by luck and die. I'll curse you as the doll you are instead of living and dying. I'll curse you for everything, Viscount Baldur. Gwyn protested, somewhat slurred. What is it about me that makes me such a happy man to you? You are, after all, a man of honor and nobility. I'm an unborn freak, lacking even the memory of my birth, and that beautiful unskilled Octavia. Iris, with her beautiful mouth, is exactly the same as you. I heard her curse the world and mankind, saying that no one else could know what she had suffered for the past twenty years. Happiness and unhappiness do not lie in beauty and ugliness, in luck and bad luck, or even in success. It lies solely within the heart of the person. I've known a young man who was born a prince of a noble family but gave up his status. You can curse and envy me all you like, but I think a man's life is too short to let it die like that. Don't preach. Preach, preach. Preach like a vicious beast, Baldur said in a rage. At any rate, 
I'm afraid you've got the kind of loud mouth that won't back down no matter what, that will go out on a limb no matter what, that will forgive and understand even the worst of people. But listen, Gwyn, at least I'll win in the end. You don't understand, but the game is already over. You're already dead. Gwyn's topaz eyes looked up at Baldur's index finger as if to ask him a question. Perhaps he took this as a sign of trepidation from Gwyn, but Baldur was suddenly in a good mood. Even I, a wounded man, would not dare to face such a god of war. And I'm Italian red scorpion with a reputation for doing all sorts of dirty things to win. Do you know what tricks I've come up with since I swore I'd kill you no matter what? You still don't understand, when the truth comes out, when you realize you can't escape death. How your calm and composed attitude will break down, how you'll cry out for life from the mouth of that leopard. That's what I wanted to hear even if it cost me my life. That's what I wanted to hear. Gwyn, that arrow was smeared with a powerful numbing potion that would make a horse unable to move. A smile of delight twisted Baldur's pale face into a ghastly grimace. What's the matter, Gwyn? Are you so terrified you can't speak? Scream, you miserable wretch, and call for help. The favored war god of Achilles is at the mercy of Baldur who is not half his size, and if he is helpless to call for help, even if he survives, he will lose face and the favor of the emperor, and help will not come. It's a long way from the resting place. Come on, Gwyn, you brave warrior, you hundred dragon chief, you can cry, you can howl, you know it's useless, but before the numbness gets too bad, you can get down on your knees and beg for your life. Why don't you get down on your knees and beg for your life? If the way you beg for your life seems to be pitiful enough, you might be able to show mercy and let him die easily with just one sword. Baldur's tremendous laughter cracked. Gwyn stood there unmoved. No, he could not. If I wanted to prevent the poison from spreading as quickly as possible, flailing and struggling would be like cutting my own throat. Baldur watched him, looking quite pleased with himself. Come on, bark. Don't you scream. Don't be stingy. Give me a good sound, he said with satisfaction. But you're still a tricky one. I don't know what you'll come up with at any time. When I'm sure you're much weaker, and the drugs have worn off, and you can't stand still, then I'll have plenty of fun. First of all, yes, I've always wanted to know, first of all, I've always wanted to know if it's really a leopard or if it's got human skin underneath. Then, I'll tear off your skin while you're still alive to see if it's got leopard skin underneath. Then cut off your fingers, cut off your muscles, finally gouge out your eyes, cut off your ears, cut off your tongue, live as long as you can, so that my pleasure may last as long as possible. Because of your size, you won't die so soon anyway, but if time permits, I'd like to torment you, torment you, and cut you up for a month or a year, not to mention a day. For now, anyway. Fool gall. Fool gall. Ha! In response to the call, Baldur's men appeared from the shadows of the trees, disguised as the peasants from earlier. Do it. Baldur threw down his bow and snapped his fingers. Ha! Fulger took the mantle from his shoulder. His hands seemed to be strong, and he pulls the rope out easily. The weighted rope snaked its way around Gwyn's thick ankle. Gwyn quickly thrust out his sword to ward it off, but his movements were slower than usual, as if he were struggling in water or a mire. Fulger pulls his rope, and Gwyn kneels down to support him. A dizzying numbness runs through his body. How's that? Baldur exclaimed in pleasure. Say a last prayer or a great line or something while you're still able to speak. If you have a message for me, I'll take it. Just make sure it's for a doll. I'm surprised. So the numbing agent works on me at least as well as it does on anyone else. Gwyn gestured with his nearly crippled mouth. But Baldur could not hear him well. You can't even talk now. All right, well, let's get you there. Normally, he would have flown down, but as expected, he was wounded, and he grabbed the trunk of the tree, and he went down to the ground. I'm trying to get out. Gwyn used all of the strength he had gathered. He didn't care about Fulger and his rope. His huge body dragged Fulger into the air. The numb look on his face earlier had only been for show. Gwyn's huge sword swept through the air with a single stroke. 
Oh. A terrible, deafening scream of desperation. Gwyn, G, Gui, N. Baldur's belly was almost severed in a single blow. I can only say that it was a tremendous destructive power. Baldur's face still bears the remnants of his earlier delighted sneer. Froth of blood spurted from his mouth, and Baldur's upper body snapped around his lower half, striking the trunk of a tree and slamming him to the ground. From his body, which was bursting with flesh and bone, white bones protruded in a strange way, as if washed, but the blood flowed out like a fountain and stained the area. You are! Fulger was thrown to his feet, rope and all, and fell to the grass, leaving rope behind. At last he drew himself up, but being a stout man, he held his ground and drew his sword, even in the face of this terrible slaughter of the Lord. Oh, my God, my God, my God, my God, you monster. He grits his teeth, but bravely holds up his sword and charges at Gwyn. Gwyn was on his knees with the sword in his left hand pointing at the ground, and was motionless with the sword as his staff. He had already expended all his remaining strength in the blow and was powerless to withstand the attack of a three-year-old child. His eyes flared up in a fierce yellow and seemed to burn Fulger. Monstrosity monstrosity oh. Fulger held his sword to his chest and rushed forward with a scream. Gwyn dragged his huge body, which was unable to free itself, and barely dodged the tip of the sword. At this point, the weight of his huge body resembled an iron statue. Fulger's sword sliced Gwyn's shoulders, severing his leather straps and causing his gauntlets to fall off. Oh, Doll Doll Incarnate. On the contrary, Fulger, realizing that he was no longer free to even move around, began to rapidly regain his composure. How dare you do this to your master? You have avenged your master. So even Baldur, the hated one, had a retainer who wanted to avenge him. Again Fulger thrust at him. Gwyn dodged, rolling to the ground. The point of the sword cut again, this time through the shoulder strap of his armor. Once, twice more, with all his might, Gwyn dodged the attack. Once, twice, blood spurted from his strong body. Now, Fulger is covered in blood and looks as terrible as a red devil. Don't run, don't run, don't run. Breathing heavily on his shoulders, he leaps to his feet and flicks off Gwyn's left sword. He kneels on his huge, bloodied body and holds up his sword. Avenge the Lord, I will. The sword was pulled tightly. Gwyn won't close her eyes to the idea. Such actions have no place in this leopard's mind. Always in the midst of battle he is a true beast of burden. Until his last breath, he knows not to flinch, to retreat, or to give up. It knows only to fight, driven by instinct. He can no longer move his body. He can't lift a finger. Gwyn puts all his strength into his shoulders and glares at Fulger as if he were trying to kill him. A moment later, gaw, a strange thing grew in Fulger's throat. The destination of the rapier. Behind him, a rapier protruded from his neck as far as the palm of his hand. The whites of Fulger's eyes were bared, and he looked as if he had no idea what had happened to him. His tongue was spat out and blood stained Gwyn Fulger gasped for breath as the Lord of the Rapier twisted his sword, and he fell back onto the grass with a thud. What a mess. A cool, sarcastic, but coughing voice said. Black clothes, black cloak, hair of cascading light mixed with silver and gold, blue glazed eyes. Even you can do this, Gwyn. It makes me feel kind of good. Iris laughed. You're human, too. But what's the matter with you? I can't believe I'm being dragged into this. And. Gwyn mustered up all his strength. Bye. Remedicine. Detoxification. Agent. What? What? Iris listens back and then seems to realize. Oh, I see. Baldur gave you a dose of his own medicine. That's what he'd do. That's the only way to beat him. Let's see. Without fear, he walked up to the horrific carcass and, not caring that his hands were stained with blood, cut off the hiding bag from his waist. People who use numbing agents usually have the antidote with them. You don't want to make a mistake and get yourself touched. Hold on, Gwyn. Thinking for a moment, then smiling, Iris bent over Gwyn. I'm sure Marius will forgive me. 
I've never kissed a leopard before. I feel like a princess in a fairy tale. He poured the antidote into Gwyn's mouth and brushed back his hair, laughing hilariously. The beard stings, you know, it's funny. I'd like to know how you do it when you do it. How's that? Yeah. Thanks to you, I've managed to I think save the day. The antidote seemed to be quite powerful, and soon the numbness that had been clamping down on Gwyn's body began to lift little by little. Thank God you're here in time, I've been looking for you. Iris says with a sigh. Gwyn Sylvia's foolish daughter has used Paris to kidnap Marius. Tonight at the ball, she's going to introduce him as her lover and cause an uproar. I've been looking for him, but I can't find him. And now I'll have to leave the court with Marius. That's too much even for me, and I've thought about what to do, but I can't help myself, so I've turned to you again. But it's Marius, after all. Okay. Finally, Gwyn sat up and groaned in pain as the numbness went away, as if he had been pricked with thousands of needles. But let it go. I've got to get back to the parade as soon as possible. What? Immediately, Iris's willow brow furrowed. Who do you think it was that saved you? First first, you're going to a parade with that body. Are you insane? Therefore, we must hurry. Wash them and replace them with new shoes. That's not what I'm talking about. That scar still has some numbness in it. It's nothing. I've endured worse. Gwyn said he was fine. It seems I have a high tolerance for pain. It's one thing to be in pain and another to do what you have to do. But my eyesight has deteriorated. I'm sure the Emperor will be disappointed. You people are out of your minds. You're driving me crazy talking to you, Iris said in disgust. But then he remembered what he had to do and got angry again. Well, what are you going to do about Marius? I know you'll take care of him, you're his friend. Are you willing to let Marius be captured as a great criminal or assassinated? No. But we don't know where he is for the time being anyway, and if that's what Sylvia wants, at least Marius' life isn't in danger right now. Gwyn stood up, slowly rubbing his hands and feet. Then leave him be. The plan can't be realized unless you bring him to the ball anyway. Until then, pretend that you don't know him. After Sylvia has taken Marius to the small room near the mirror room, you can slip away with him. If Paris becomes a problem then, I'll take care of him. If you make a big deal out of it, Marius won't make it out of Wind Hill. Sylvia, Paris, and you are the only ones who know. Even if Marius isn't here, Sylvia won't be able to humiliate herself by making a fuss in front of her father and the council. It would be better to make good use of the time until then, set up a carriage, have the gatekeepers grab the money, and make plans for escape. You've got a good head on your shoulders, and your leopard head seems to be pretty handy. Octavia looked up at Gwyn with disapproving admiration. But I, I understand there's a hearing to denounce the Empress in a secret court half this evening. I've been told by my uncle to finally present myself as the prince there. If I run away with Marius, it will be too much trouble to come back and my uncle will be suspicious. I'll look for a room somewhere and hide Marius in it. That idiot wouldn't dare run off on his own, of course. What a stubborn and troublesome man he is. Maybe we should say we're a good match. Gwyn took up his cloak, flapped it lightly, searched for his sword, wiped it clean and put it in his sheath. It seems that you are not so bad at understanding, princess. You will not lose your love and your young life to such foolishness. You'll be named Prince of Chironia. He will change his body and you can't deceive him forever. Why don't you live happily with the man you love, and spend the rest of my life as a disgusting, poor, unfaithful minstrel's wife, stoking fires and playing the harlot? I have every right to try my luck. Isn't that right? That's true. But that doesn't mean I'm not going to place a single bet on Dolls 13. It's my life. So said Octavia. It's my right to do as I please. Don't meddle in what I do, Gwyn. If you were my father's loyal subject, you'd be my subject too. I command you to keep this secret from everyone. Obey me, princess. My sword is for your father alone, but you are a young and beautiful woman and you have the right to command others. 
If you tell me not to, I won't tell anyone. I'm sure we'll see each other again before the party. And when you do, I need your help. All right. I've got to go. Gwyn stepped under the tree and draped his cloak softly over Baldur's ghastly corpse. It's a terrible way to die. So this is what happens to ambitious, brutal snakes, Octavia said. Gwyn shook his head gravely and sadly. You didn't have to kill him. People die all the time, but they don't choose to die. If I hadn't been drugged, you wouldn't have had to kill me. It's a terrible thing. Then he nodded and walked away. Octavia watched her go. Time flowed incessantly, sometimes seeming to stagnate, sometimes even to slow down its movements. The lure hung high in the azure sky and scattered golden drops. As if longing for the twilight of the north and the beautiful night that was approaching again, the white moon appeared in the sky like a petal of a flower. People shouted cheers until they were parched, and clapped and waved their hands until their hands ached. The parade was long and splendid, and was a spectacle such as will not be seen again for some time. The formal attire of each of the twelve great orders of Knights of Chironia is magnificent, majestic and valiant. The black dragon, the golden wolf, the white tiger, the golden dog, the golden sheep, the golden hawk, the golden monkey, the white snake, the flying swallow, the silver fox, the white whale, the white elephant, according to the nickname of each knightly order, they wore a helmet in the shape of the head of each beast, drew the cloak of each color, and their bodies of silver and white glittered in the sun. The body of silver and white glistens in the sun. Of these, the four great knightly orders, the dragons, wolves, tigers, and serpents, are the pride of Chironia and the strongest rangers in the world. The Knights of the Thousand Dogs, as the Emperor's bannermen, protect the Emperor together with the Knights of the King's Guard. The Knights of the Giant Whale, defenders of the sea. The Knights of the Flying Swallow for messenger scouts. The Golden Fleece and Golden Eagle guard the frontier. The Knights of the Colossal Elephant, a heavily armed troop of big men who charge on chariots, armored with heavy, iron armor with piercing thorns on the outside. Each group wears a suit of armor that can be recognized at a glance, is led by a standard bearer at the head, and marches solemnly in five horizontal lines, led by the general or his deputy. Of course, not all of the twelve order were here today. The borders must be defended this very day. There are also troops who have already left for the borders of Urania and Sards as only Gwyn, Achilles, and Xenon know. At any rate, however, it was a great march. Some of the foreign delegates watching the event from their special seats might have counted the number of knights and chariots with the ulterior motive of assessing the military strength of Chironia, but the cunning Chironian chiefs of staff had interspersed their numbers with mercenaries and civil servants, and had put up all sorts of window dressing. Almost all of them would have been useless for reconnaissance, if not for showing off. Following the twelve grand knights, the knights of the twelve electors, as well as the nobles and civil servants, in other words, all those who practically ruled and administered in Cylonia, appeared one after another in full dress and dignity. When Demos, Marquis of Warstadt, who was as beautiful as the sun god, appeared on horseback with the knights of Warstadt, who wore long silver feathers on their hats, there was a great outcry. The Blind Black Robert, the black-robed Marquis de Rhodes, and the imposing Marquis d'Antenne were also the object of admiration and ridicule. On the other hand, the Marquis de Sardes, who had become famous for falling off his horse, and the Marquis d'Anais, whose house arrest had been suspended and who had been allowed to take part in the parade so as not to arouse the suspicion of the delegation, were met with boos and laughter. And laughter. After the floral procession of civil servants, ladies and princesses had passed by, the parade of the delegates who had prepared to leave the spectators' seats began. This was a great spectacle for the citizens of Ceylon. This was a time when transportation was not easy. There are far more people who will never leave the land of their birth in their entire lives. The common people, who are neither rulers nor wizards, are not given the means to know about the faraway lands. However, during these celebrations, people were able to see and hear rare things by taking advantage of the king's hospitality. They awaited the mission with excitement. And the mission did not disappoint them. Indeed, 
it was a rare and insatiable sight to behold. Even the delegations of Qum, Urania, Paro, and other neighboring countries, when dressed in formal attire and dignified, looked different from the travelers, merchants, and mercenaries we saw every day. The round headgear with many small protuberances and the bulky armor of the Kumu soldiers, the high collar, round hat and fur cloak of the legate, and the fur bodyguard of the holy knight who served the mages of Paro were also unusual. The black-haired female delegation of Kitai, dressed in strange and tight-fitting costumes, appeared on huge elephants and camels to frighten the people even more, and at some places they stopped and scattered silver coins as a congratulatory gift, which caused a great commotion in the crowd. The blonde-haired, blue-eyed, beautiful people of Simhala are also rare, and the red-haired Vikings of Tartuan, with their horns protruding from their heads on both sides and their majestic physiques, are also striking. And there was also Ali Trevan, the younger brother of the Prince of Wallachia in the Primorsky cry, who wiped his sweat incessantly on his palanquin, and whose plumpness was enough to make the people of Chironia roll their eyes. Of course, there were fat people in Chironia, but they were rarely as fat as those in the warm and prosperous Primorsky cry, because of their military temperament, their love of exercise and dancing, and their lack of a habit of eating well. In Primorsky cry, because of the abundance of commodities, the originally short stature of the people, the custom of eating plenty of sweet food, and the fact that the main deity is probably the obese dry dong, there were rather a lot of terribly obese people. Regardless, the people enjoyed watching and listening. In between the processions, they sipped kalam water and nibbled kababu to fill their stomachs. The sun was gradually setting. Once they had completed the parade and entered the small moon palace in Ceylon, the first group of people were invited into the hall of the small moon palace for a midday meal and rest, or rested in the square in front of the small moon palace, depending on how early they had left, and waited patiently for the arrival of the last emperor. The area around the small moon palace had already been completely decorated, and it was packed with loyal people who wanted to shout for their emperor and they were held back by the guards when they tried to get a closer look. All that remains now is to await the arrival of the emperor. In celebration of the emperor's arrival, the citizens of the city will present the finest songs, dances, and plays. The performers of these dances and plays are nervous, wiping the sweat from their palms with the sleeves of their costumes, and huddling in one place. The party of Achilles the Great did not show up. By that time, however, the emperor had already left the resting place. Gwyn's bloody arrival caused a commotion, but Gwyn only told the emperor what had happened after he had been secretly escorted away. What? Baldur's dead. I'm sorry. It was an untenable situation. The Viscount is of his majesty's blood. I ask that you dispose of him as you see fit. In terms of bloodline, the fact that he has a father who is related to a very distant relative, one who has the blood of the previous emperor as his father, is only his word and has not been officially confirmed. The emperor shook his head. It is Baldur who is to blame, and you were merely defending yourself. Baldur, on the other hand, is a man under house arrest for betraying the empress and betraying Urania. He should have been punished for violating my order of house arrest so swiftly. But no, Gwyn, you merely carried out the punishment on my behalf. So there'll be no repercussions. Of course. I've had his house searched, and I already have a copy of the Ulanian. He's an idiot. Thank you very much for your generosity. I'd like to ask you for a favor. What? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, and do unto thee as thou wouldst have them do unto thee. Oh, sure. But even you, Gwyn, you can't be sure. I can't believe Iris saved your life. The emperor gave a sly smile. My son is a good man. To help the god of war. Gwyn, I want this matter with the empress settled as soon as possible and I want to know your son's name. What's the matter? If you don't mind, I'd like you to arrange for us to meet at the feast. For the time being. What do you mean? No because I don't know what the right thing to do is. When you say things like that, there's always a good reason. But my son must be my son. I'm sure he is. Indeed, there is no doubt in my mind that he is the son of Princess Uria. 
then what is the matter? Our Ceylonians will have a son of the rising sun. There is nothing more wonderful. Why don't you add a little joy to the celebration? For a while, for a while, I'm afraid you're gonna have to let me handle this. It's well. Achilles grumbled at being doused. I've done exactly as you said and I've never been wrong. But there's no man who gives orders to the emperor like you. You're so careless. I'm sorry. Nay for I owe you my life. But Baldur's death leaves us without a witness for the emperor's trial. After all, Laius is one of the twelve electors, I have my reservations. But that's a matter for later, tonight and a half. What's troubling me is your appearance. But there's no armor that will fit your physique. Achilles shook his head in disapproval, as he really wanted to stand on the balcony of the small moon palace with Gwyn and Xenon on either side of him. As a result, it was decided to give Gwyn hot water, treat his wounds, and wash his feet with water. But the cloak and body were so torn and soaked with blood that they were useless. So they brought in Xenon's cloak for his formal attire, and saying, if we can't fit in anything else, we might as well, they made Gwyn strip off his armor and under armor, anoint his strong body with Vasha oil, and put on him in person a leather crossbow strap. Then he reattached the laces of his gauntlets, and made him wear gauntlets, shin guards, and an undershirt. On top of this, in order to conceal the bandage on his strong right shoulder, the peasants had him put on a wide leather belt, which he slipped over his shoulder and around his waist, fastened with a belt, hung his sword on it, and draped Zeno's cloak over his right shoulder. In order to make the cloak, glasses, and belt suitable for the ceremony, they made them huge ones with jewels and inlays, and over them they put many strings of ornaments. And finally they made him wear a large pendant with the emblem of Achilles on his chest. The result was a hero of mythical times, a leopard-headed figure with a magnificent physique, which seemed to have come to life as if it were a painting or a statue. The emperor was already all set to go, and he waited in suspense, but as soon as the proud-looking peasants led Gwyn in, there was an inaudible groan in the resting room. Excellent! Reviewing it admiringly, Achilles exclaimed, Surinos indeed! This is much better than his old regalia. The whole of Chironia will know that Achilles has the real Silenus. Let's go and show it to our people. And so, we're all set. It was time for the lion-hearted emperor of Chironia to make his appearance before the people. The people began to rush about at once. They made final checks on their harnesses, their formal attire, dusted themselves off, put on their headgear, and fastened their cloaks. Outside, a specially ordered, high-floored, ten-horse, uncovered carriage, capable of carrying more than ten people, was waiting for them, dazzlingly decorated with gold ornaments and flower garlands. Alas Alain, the son of the Marquis de Alantain and a beautiful young man, was in charge of the reins. The carriage was equipped with two seats covered with purple just in the front and back. Oh, Achilles narrows his eyes. You're here. Yes, father. This is nice to meet you. Would you like a dress? Very beautiful. The white flowers of the Chironia. It's a little white flower. The emperor has no love for his daughter. But Sylvia, who had always been a bit cynical, thought it meant that she lacked the glamour and beauty of a large flower, and she became a little puffy in her fine clothes. However, it is true that she is not the kind of woman who is ashamed to be shown in public. The pure white dress of lace and silk, which revealed her slender shoulders and neck, gathered lace like snowflakes around her breasts, emphasized her slender waist, and cinched her waist, was made by the famous Paro designer, Caris. It was one of the dresses she had ordered for the occasion. Kaylee's skill in creating a dress that was pure white, symbolizing the dignity and purity of the 19-year-old princess of Chironia, and that accentuated Sylvia's slender figure, was superb. Originally, Sylvia's torso was fine and her neck was long, but her immature body was too thin and made her look like a child. But the lace of her immature body was too thin and made her look like a child. And on top of that, a huge, jeweled sash was tied in a long, long tail. Of course there were all kinds of ornaments dazzlingly shining in every imaginable place, even in her mere hair, at her throat, on her gloved arms. 
Sylvia's beautifully made-up face was puffed up for a little while, but she soon recovered her spirits and turned into a smiling face when the courtiers, who came forward to greet her one after another, praised her beauty with words. Eventually, he had two maidservants in formal dress pull up their sleeves, and then had them pull over their sides the cloaks of the imperial princesses in crimson with fur trim. Sylvia took her seat at the back, and the maids of honor, after arranging the lace and ribbon so that the folds of their garments looked the most beautiful, knelt down two by two on either side. Then, at last, the Emperor Achilles, wearing the long purple cloak of an emperor, the splendid crown with the Chiron star in the center, the treasure of Chiron, the royal tin, and a wide sash over and under the white silk, entered. Then Zenon, Gwyn, and two of his favorite maidservants rode up, the maidservants kneeling on either side of the emperor, and the two heroes stood behind him with spears in their hands, guarding the emperor. Oh, man! Sylvia frowned when she saw them coming in. She was about to complain that she had to sit with them, but, oh, my God, that's beautiful. Excellent. It's like Silenos and Barbus all over again. It's like a myth. Oh, those muscles. I'm creeped out. When he heard the maids of honor murmuring in secret so that the emperor would not hear, he seemed to have changed his mind. He gazed down and up at Gwyn's statuesque figure several times, with a ridiculous, but slightly intrigued, first-time look in his eyes. Well, princess, isn't this a wonderful sight? The emperor calls out to him, proudly. The mightiest god of war on earth now belongs to your father, even though you are too. Well, at least if it means that a face like the sun gods will appear from under that leopard's head. Father, please come and see me. What? Isn't your mother coming? If she's so sick, Sylvia, shouldn't she go to visit her instead of going to this parade? No, not even close. The emperor raised an eyebrow. Castor's opinion was that although my mother was not well, she was not in any way life-threatening and there was nothing to worry about. However, as she was showing symptoms that made it somewhat difficult for her to appear in public, she would not be able to attend the parade or the banquet. This is his wish, too. I have ordered you never to approach him, lest you should catch it and be affected by it. Anyway, tomorrow when the party is over you can visit your mother. But if it becomes known that you have such a disgusting condition it will disgrace the celebration and bring shame on my mother. Don't tell anyone. No. I don't know what's wrong with me. Sylvia shouted. You looked so healthy. I thought you said your father was in bad shape. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. You don't have to think about anything. Leave all that to my father and think of tonight's ball. Yes, yes, but, have you thought about who you're going to dance with first, yeah? Yeah. This time, Sylvia answered with apparent pride. Then she added, smiling to herself, your father must be surprised. I'm sure he has no idea who I'm in love with. You're on my mind again. Well, let's just say I'm looking forward to tonight. Hey, Dad. Sylvia glanced slyly at her father. But isn't it true, really true, the promise? The one I danced with at the ball tonight will be my son-in-law. I didn't say that. Achilles said. But when he saw Sylvia's face change quickly, he added. I said only this. If the man you dance with tonight has the right qualifications, he may be considered as a candidate for Princess Chironia's son-in-law. Oh, well, that's not the story. Anybody, anyway, who dances with me at the beginning, that's the deal. Sylvia, don't be so selfish. That was when Laius and Baldur were your official candidates for son-in-law. I think you decided to conclude it that way so that both of you would be satisfied with the outcome. But now that you don't have to choose between the two of them, you must feel much better. Nevertheless, I would like to know who you have in mind for the future of the great Chironia, and in some cases, there may be an offer from abroad. You will have to think it over and choose the best way for you and for the happiness of Chironia. Well, I guess that's a very different story. Foreign countries. Well, father, I don't want any of the three princes of Kumu or Lord Crystal of Paro. Well, why is that? again. My father was amused and asked her about it. We are a father and daughter who seldom speak to each other in close proximity. 
No, I don't want to be like those three brothers. I believe a man's face is his face. A man has to be beautiful to look at. Those three Kumu boys are all dull country lads. There are no two men in the world as beautiful as Lord Crystal. Even Daimos, the pride of Chironia, is reputed to be more beautiful, the emperor said in an attempt to tease her. Sylvia cringed. Father, you don't understand a daughter's heart at all. A man who's beautiful is good. A man who's too beautiful is even worse. If I were standing beside him and everyone who came to greet him praised his beauty, I'd want to pour fire on his beautiful face. And I don't like Lord Crystal. I don't want a piece of him. Besides, Princess Amneris was said to be very beautiful. I don't want to be compared to her. The rest, Sylvia murmured in her mouth, secretly. Hmm. That's a lot to take in, isn't it? Achilles is very impressed. Well, then, I don't expect my father to give in to my wishes so easily from the start, so I won't ask him to marry my first dance partner right away. But I'd like to ask you here in the presence of everyone, anyway, will you allow Sylvia to marry the man she loves? Of course, my daughter. The emperor said with a sincere smile as if he were comparing himself with me. A loveless union is ultimately a source of unhappiness for both parties. But, my daughter, it's worth remembering that sometimes it's only after marriage that we come to love each other. That's true. But if I have someone I love now, I can't love them no matter who they are with. I'm not that naive. Is there someone you love now? But I have a wife and children. It's not Demos. Sylvia lifted her little chin in triumph. Sylvia, it's tonight, you'll know everything. Tonight, before the court of Chironia and the ambassadors of all nations, I will show you the man of her dreams. This, my daughter, is not to be taken too lightly. I'm single. He's young, and he loves me very much. Sylvia chuckled. Besides, what's the problem? A nobleman. The son of one of the elected princes. You've already told him. Here, Sylvia, here. This evening's entertainment. Sylvia puffed out her bare breasts in her best climax. Anyway, let's just say you're all going to be very, very surprised. Wait a minute, Sylvia. How old are you? Of course, you're someone I know, right? I'm not going to be a very picky and uncomprehending father, and I might even let you do as you please, but I'm not married, I'm not an enemy, and I'm not sick. That's all I can tell you right now. Well, father, it looks like we're ready. He'll start moving. You'll fall off the wagon if you go that far. Do it, do it. Achilles breathed a deep sigh of frustration. But Sylvia did not speak any more, but only became proud and enjoyed the great effect of her words. Then the emperor gave up and returned to his original position, looking at Balbus and Silenos on either side of him, as if to say, women are. He breathed deeply once more, as if to say, women. The trumpet sounded loudly. And the head of the procession had already begun to move slowly. Finally, it was time for the emperor's departure. And, the day passed slowly in glorious gold and red. It was a day of great festivity, presented to the north as if it were a little spring sunshine blessed by Janus. All day long, in Silen, cries of mock. And the horses' hoofs thundered on the cobblestones. The city was filled with dazzling golds and silvers, purples and crimsons, flowers and blossoms, and brightly colored dresses. The solemnity of the parade was followed by the grandeur of the parade, and the people repeatedly shouted with joy for the beloved emperor and his beloved princess. The people were filled with joy, reassurance, and reverence at the sight of the emperor's heroic figure, which was only occasionally seen by the people, and they were enthralled by the lovely white figure of the princess. And for a long time, nothing excited the people of Silen more than the two heroes who followed the emperor like a shadow especially the leopard-headed Salinos. Everywhere, after the emperor's carriages had passed by and in the square under the balcony of the little moon palace, people were heard shouting with excitement and admiration. Ha! Hurrah! That's it! That's it! What the hell is that? What? You don't even know that. Isn't that the leopard-headed warrior, 
the hundred dragon chief Gwyn, now rumored throughout the silence. Are you strong? Strong or nothing? He's a demon god himself. People argued among themselves whether the leopard head was real or not, whether it was a mask or not, and they were so intrigued by it that even the great emperor himself was distracted. There were many who said they would bet on it, but in the end not a single bet was made. But in the end, not a single bet was made, because no one had any idea how to ascertain the outcome of such a bet. Sylvia's search for a son-in-law and Sylvia's illicit love for the Marquis of Wallstead, which had been the main topic of conversation among the silence until then, were all overshadowed by Silenos. For a while after that, Gwyn was the only topic of conversation for those who had a glance at him. So much so that the existing mythical Silenos attracted the eyes of the people and was full of mysteries, and above all, the leopard head, standing tall and straight. With Topaz's eyes that seemed to wonder what he was looking at, and with his cloak flaring out to one side to show his splendid muscles, standing in the emperor's service. This leopard had this leopard-headed hero, with his topaz eyes, his cloak flung high on one side, and his magnificent muscles displayed, stood in the service of the emperor. Without saying or doing anything, this warrior of a different shape seemed to have a fragrance that filled the hearts of the people with longing and imaginative stories. Besides, it would have been enough for him to have been the hero of the bard's song if he had been, at least at first sight, as different from the others as Gwyn was, and if he had been. He would have been unforgettable, but on top of that, Gwyn had already been surrounded by many legends since his arrival in Chironia. I heard that you easily defeated the rapier master Baldur. No matter how many of General Dulcius' men were at his side, he could not touch them. Not even Thor of Atoya. On the contrary, he threw that monstrous child, General Xenon, with one hand. Really? So that Silenos is stronger than Xenon. In the midst of all this talk, Old Lapin, who owned an inn on Taba Street, and the boy Ram who came with him, Karuna, Thyra, and Myrina, who were laundry women, and Mao, who sold water from his stall on Tala Street in Terrid, became the envy of the people and the favorite of the people. They were surrounded by crowds of people who wanted to talk to them. At the height of their fame, they told each other of their encounters with Gwyn, and they never tired of telling each other what Gwyn had eaten at the inn what he had said, how he had behaved, how he had carried a fainting youth up from the river in a wet rat's nest, and how he had fought against Baldur's men. And how he had fought with all his might against Baldur's men. Anyone who had seen Gwyn even briefly was the star of the day, and if he spoke at all, it was as if he believed that he, too, had become the hero himself because of it. It was as if, long ago, when Marius met Gwyn for the first time, he had said to him by the fire, People will point at you, and instead of cursing and screaming at that monster, they will look at you with open mouths, and then go home and excitedly tell their wives and children about you. He'll go home and excitedly tell his wife and children that he saw the real Gwyn today. And that man will talk about the day he passed you for the rest of his life, just because he saw the real you, he'll be a minor hero in his own neighborhood. These words seemed to indicate that Gwyn had been in Chiron for only a few months, not a year and that they had already come true. It seemed to me that these words were an indication that Gwyn had already achieved his goal in just a few months, not a year. From that day onward, it seemed that there would be no one in Silen or its suburbs, or in all of Chironia in less than half a month, who had not heard of Gwyn, Chironia's pride and joy, other than a newborn baby. For one thing, the legend of the wanderings and adventures of Silenus and Balbus concludes with Silenus crossing Tartuan into the land of ice and snow in the north and falling asleep forever in tarred ice. The legend of Silenus was very popular in Chironia, the neighboring country of Tartuan. The people of Chironia had always had a strong warrior's temperament, and above all, they admired a man who was strong in arms. Moreover, the people of Chironia have a broader understanding and appreciation of people of different appearance than the people of the inland countries of the Central Plains, as they have traded with the two tall, red-haired, wasteland-haired Taruan Vikings, the Kitai, and even Lagan. Gwyn's leopard-headed deformity, once you get used to seeing it, becomes nothing more than a source of legend. It was no exaggeration to say that the silence were dawned on by the rumors of Gwyn that day. At sunset, as yesterday, the bonfires are lit and the silence are born again into the darkness. 
There are platforms in the squares here and there. Tonight, all the squares are filled with dances. Here and there, the sound of tuning strings and experimenting with the flute could be heard, and by the time the crackling bonfires had grown large, the first Chironian waltz had already begun to be played. Skirts were fluttering and children were shouting with joy. Tonight, no matter how late you stay up, you are free to talk about your love. The young people, therefore, immediately began to dance. The older ones and the elderly, however, did not join in the dancing, but sipped kalam water and ate sweet pastries. While they gathered in groups by the stone steps and fountains, where they could see the stage, and talked. The talk was usually about the mysterious leopard-headed warrior, sometimes about who would be the future ruler of Chironia, sometimes about the unseen empress, about the delegations, about the reputation of the various entertainments. Before they knew it, everyone was talking about the leopard-headed warrior. It was the first time that such a strange creature had appeared in Chironia since the beginning of the history of the country, and it was a wonder that no amount of talk could describe. They talked, sang, danced, drank and drank to their heart's content, and sometimes, as if in agreement, they raised their eyes and looked in the direction of Kaze Ga Oka. At sunset, a large open-air banquet with 50,000 people is held in the Grand Garden. Most of the people who have any kind of fame, position, money, or anything outstanding have been invited. The people who filled the square of the silent did not care about such things at all, but in the great garden of the Windy Hill, there were high officials, beautiful princesses, poets, rich people, noblemen, artists, and military officers. And somewhere among them was the emperor of Chironia, and that leopard-headed warrior with topaz eyes, eating and drinking, talking and answering greetings, like them, and that they were responding to greetings. The melancholy strains of the Chironian waltz, the laughter, the cries of Marek, were repeated again and again, and the sun was setting, and the lights were spreading like jewels in the heavens and on the earth. The stars in the heavens and the lights on the earth were shining together, and it seemed as if they were determined to fight boldly in the depths of the night. Occasionally, a fresh, fur-scented night breeze blew through, blowing away the smoky odor of the bonfires. The atmosphere was basically the same as that of the previous night's festival, but unlike last night, when there was a sense that tomorrow would be the big day. The thought that after tonight the festivities would be over and there would be another long winter and hard days of work to look forward to, lent a touch of sadness to the hearts of the people. Tonight's Colonian waltz was especially lilting, the kithra was especially high and low, the tarka was especially cheerful, and the dancers' feet seemed to be lifted even higher. Malka Silen, Malka Kirona, Malk, the hot cheeks, the crackling of the bonfires, the throaty laughter of the daughters, the whirling steps, the clipping of the kima kababu, the children who try forever to keep their eyes open, but before they know it they have fallen asleep with their mouths hanging open in their mother's lap. Some of them must surely have dreamed of the magnificent processions, the strange herds of Elhin, the glittering Yorikabuto, and the strange, leopard-headed hero, like the statue of the patron god of Cylonia. The night of the silence drew to a close. It was a night of true festivity, worthy of being passed down for years and generations to come, a night of joy and a night that we do not want to see end. And again, of course, here on Kaze Gaoka, the Chironian waltz played by the Kithra and lute was played again and again, high and low, through the deeper darkness of the hills. What a grand and sumptuous feast this must have been. In the city of the silence, I was struck by the fact that so many people lived in the silence, but when I came up to this windy hill, I was also struck by the fact that most of the population of the silence had moved to Windy Hill tonight. So many people, with their eyes pale and their cheeks burning, were wandering back and forth in the great garden that was the stage for this great outdoor banquet. With 50,000 guests, the number of people sent to serve them alone would be over 10,000. And in order to satisfy so many guests to the utmost of one's satisfaction, there was prepared for this day a sumptuous array of hospitality and extravagance, which made one wonder if a large part of the vast wealth of Chironia had been dissipated. In the great garden of runes, the largest in the palace of Obsidian, was formed a huge and amazing mountain of delicacies. The proud chefs of Chironia, using all their skill, first built a literal hill, and then covered it with huge boards to make terraces. 
On top of this, they erected large trees in various places. Of course, all the tops of the terraces were filled with food such as sausages and poultry, and the trees were filled with fruits and flowers. The trees were full of fruits and pastries, and the hills of Gaudi were covered with herbs. Beside it flowed a stream of wine. Every guest was given a cup and a plate at the entrance, and could drink from the river of wine and eat from the pile of meat at will. Of course, that was not all. There were many large tables with cold fish, all kinds of pies, and various rare local dishes. And in some places in the garden there were large stoves in which grilled meat was constantly served. People lined up with their plates, their faces glistening with grease, while frantic cooks spun the long skewers around with all their might, and little helpers spun the gravy around with long ladles. The skewers were filled with fattened langobard chickens, ducks brought from Anten, sheep's legs and dogs, all of which were grilled to perfection. The people were asked to cut off a large piece of the food, and they fetched gaudy and herbs from the pile, and licked their burned fingers. But when the plates were empty, the people again lined up. The largest camadou was the most popular. There, rows and rows of skewered and roasted little pigs, roasted to a fragrant color, went round and round. The people, the noble ladies, the noble high priests, the noble artists, and the merchants, all of them ate like baths and drank like dry dong. Everyone's face was red as well as covered with thousands of bonfires. Some of them ate and drank so much that they became sick and were carried away by the waiters. But when the wind blew a little and they felt better, they would return to the garden again and again. This was the feast of a lifetime. The people ate as if they had never eaten before in their lives. It was as if the older people were more stuffed than the younger ones, the women more than the men, and the emaciated old scholars more than the fat merchants. Even those who had finally had enough of meat and gaieties went to other tents and ate endlessly of column jellies and sweet pies, confectionery, and baked goods, spicy and savory sweet drinks and refreshing ice cakes. Of course, similar feasts were held not only in the great garden of Rune, but also in the garden of Saria, the garden of Lenoria, the garden of Vasia, the garden of Iris, and more than ten other gardens. No matter how large the gardens of Rune were, they could only hold a few thousand people at most. As a general rule, the gardens were open to the public, but people were not allowed to enter the palace buildings, and according to their status, they were given tickets in advance to which garden they would go to drink and drink, and in return they were given plates and cups. However, as the sake was gradually passed around, people began to walk from garden to garden. The gardens of Moria, where most of the foreign delegations were gathered, were a favorite place for the people. It should be mentioned that Ali Trevan's gluttony was worthy of special mention. The younger brother of the Duke of Wallachia seemed to have been starving all his life. He took whatever he could find and devoured it on his plate, to the extent that it made me sick just to look at him. Even when other envoys from Primorsky Krai gently warned him, he only said, What? They continued to stuff their mouths with meat, sweets, and fruits. He was sweating profusely, steam pouring out of his head as he stuffed his mouth, and I could only see the god of boredom himself there. The elegant Paro's envoy turned his head away in dismay. The young Linus, the holy knight, was quite fond of Chan Fong Lan, and the two of them sat side by side, sipping vacha wine as they made fun of Ali Trevan's gluttony. As for his companion, the grey-eyed sorcerer, even though he was in the midst of a great feast, he only snacked on a couple of kalam nuts as a favor and did not eat anything else. This was in sharp contrast to Ali Trevan's busyness, but no one paid any attention to it. And if Valerius had nothing to eat, the beautiful envoys of Katai more than made up for it. The appetites of these slender beauties were as if they had a bottomless pit in their stomachs. But he was so dumbfounded that he began to say that you are not really eating but hiding with your magic tricks. In fact, not a single one or two of them actually ate more than Ollie Trevan, although their dignified appearance was deceiving. In addition, they drank more than Dryden. Everywhere in the gardens, bonfires were blazing and court musicians were playing music. The Emperor Achilles and the Princess Sylvia were accompanied by Gwyn, Zenon, the Marquis of Anten, the Marquis of Atosia, several generals, the Chief of the King's Guard, and about twenty others who walked equally from garden to garden, 
greeted and toasted, stayed a little while, and then went leisurely on their way to the other guests. They stayed for a little while and then went around to the other guests. They were a glittering company, comparable to the gods who had come down to earth. Not a single one of this select company ate or drank, no matter where they went. The Marquis d'Antoine, as dignified as the statues of the ancient emperors, was accompanied by his son, a handsome boy, and a bodyguard of the finest men to guard the heart of Chironia. The emperor ordered that those who shouted mock, and ordered them to nod, raise their cups, and enjoy themselves to the full. More and more food was added, and more and more unusual and elaborate dishes were served. But, as might be expected, the people began to fill up little by little. For them there was a boat in an artificial pond, music, and benches. The unsuspecting Linus decided to forget about his former fiancée for the time being, and went on a quiet boat ride with the beautiful flirtatious Chan Fong Lan. Valerius wandered noiselessly among the people like a drop of black stain at a banquet, listening to their talk, gathering information, and enjoying himself greatly in his own way. When Ollie Trevan went to the corner of the hill in the garden, he turned purple, began to roar, and put back all the food he had eaten. But when he regained a little energy, he went back and began to eat again. Valerius was wandering around the gardens, muttering something to himself, when he suddenly narrowed his eyes. His keen eye caught the shadowy figures of Gwyn and Xenon as they entered the garden. Achilles and his party were not to be seen. Valerius licked his lips softly. Then he crept into the garden, not making a sound. At that time, a cashier appeared at the entrance of each garden and began to shout that the invitees to the ball should line up inside the east gate of the Obsidian Palace. The Chironian waltz, once low, rises again, and the uninvited begin their interrupted merriment, seeking a continuation of the fun. Valerius waited, alone and unobserved. Chapter 4 The Chironia Waltz it is true that there are two kinds of people in this world, those who are aware of everything and those who are not. Of course, most people belong to the unseen side, and so things are usually peaceful. But with a man like Valerius, this is not enough. For a brief moment, he caught a glimpse of Gwyn and Xenon, unaccompanied and unaccompanied by the Emperor's party, hurrying into one of the gardens, something that would have given no thought to any other human being, and already Valerius' eyes narrowed, Valerius' eyes narrowed, and he followed them unnoticed. This garden, which Valerius could not have known, was called the Garden of Rosalia, and was somewhat smaller and more backward than the others, such as the Garden of Lenoria and the Garden of Moria. However, on this day, they also hung lanterns in a grand manner, laid out many feasts, and served drinks one after another, so that those who were sent here would not have thought that they were inferior to the others. But when he saw the bustle of the Garden of Runes, he could not help but think of it as small and lonely. Valerius lurked in the Garden of Rosalia, and suddenly his brow furrowed. Gwyn and Xenon thought for sure they went in here, but I don't see them. Even though it was a great commotion, there were two giants with a very conspicuous combination of a leopard head and red hair on top of that figure. Hatena. It's not like he disappeared. Valerius raises his eyebrows again. He glanced around. He always kept his face deeply hidden beneath his black cloak, but this was not the case when he was assisting the paro legate. His thin, pale face is completely revealed, his hair is neatly combed and brushed, and he wears a magician's ring. His clothes are a combination of the body suit and tunic of a lowly paro nobleman, very neat but at the same time somewhat borrowed. He is well aware of this, and seems to be unsettled by it. Oh. A shrill cry escaped from his mouth. That was the Uranian mission. Baron Leroy, the legate, and Lord Sardinia, the deputy. And Count Elia, deputy to Emperor Saul of Yulania. I thought the Yulania delegation was, well, I thought they were nowhere to be seen. Why was Yulania alone assigned to such a remote place and not to the Garden of Moria, where most of the foreign delegation was staying? There are many others, including the heads of a few free settlers and those bearing the mark of the Chironian guild, and of course there are many guests, so it is difficult to tell at first sight. But a closer look reveals that there are no other delegations of any foreign or great power. Maybe he didn't want to get in trouble with Kumu, or maybe. Valerius felt stranger and stranger. 
Two small men came over and bowed to Baron Leroy and Count Elia, who nodded and gave a signal. They nodded and gave a signal. Of course, they were about to go to the ball. Valerius left a little later, just as the Uranian delegation was leaving the garden in disarray. A little further away, he sits down on a bench, puts a cloth over his face, and quietly observes the scene through a gap in the cloth. The party of about twenty men, including the ambassadors of Eulania and their attendants, formed a line as they left the garden. This way, please. We're here to help. Is this the direction of the Obsidian Palace? I remember the Obsidian Palace was over there before. Rosalia's garden is a bit far from the entrance, so it's a long way to go around. We have been instructed to take you through the service gate and join the east gate. Okay. Good luck with that. The voice of Baron Leroy and the voice of the peasant. Valerius followed, still hidden from view. However, when we came to a point where the deep hedges around us completely obscured the group from the bustling park, I stiffened with a start. People approaching. Normally, you wouldn't notice, but Valerius is a wizard and he can see at night. A lot. Quickly, he stepped back and rummaged through the trees. Then he made a sign and disappeared. As if melting away, Valerius's thin figure was hidden among the trees. The line doesn't know that. Hey, it's pretty dark around here. You must have taken a wrong turn. A moment after I finished. No. A low voice answered. You are not mistaken. Baron Leroy, legate of Urania. Suddenly, when they saw what had emerged from the hedge, the Uranian delegation lost their color. The Order of the Golden Dog. Before I knew it, a group of the most valiant and fearless king's guard in all of Catalonia, fully armed and armed with crossbows and arrows, had surrounded the group. Oh, my God. Baron Leroy and Count Elia quickly stepped aside and put their hands on the swords at their waists. At the same time, the members of the delegation formed a circle to protect the two men. You, you, Gwyn. Seninu Shogun Zenon. Two giants, one in front and one behind, standing tall. What the hell is this? Now, you can make your case to the king later. Zenon said blankly. What? Which one of you is going to tell us? What do you want from us? It's not polite to be rough with a congratulatory delegation. Gwyn opened his mouth slowly. I beg your pardon for the urgency of the situation. It is already very clear to me from the dispatches from the Sard's border region that you, Eulania, have launched an insolent invasion against us in Chironia. And that your plot to assassinate His Majesty Achilles has been foiled. What? What? There must be something wrong with your head. What do you have to prove? Hear me now. Judius, Count Judith of Judither, the secret messenger and spies of Urania, and Roxta, the poisonous who served him, have both been accused in the Tower of Truth and have confessed to the whole plot. Furthermore, Empress Mariah, who allied herself with Count Judither and plotted the assassination of her husband, has already been imprisoned in her chamber. His Majesty Achilles is deeply disappointed by this latest act of treachery, which unilaterally betrays the trust that has been built up over many years, and at the conclusion of this celebration, he has decided to sever diplomatic relations with Eulania, to repent immediately, to withdraw his troops from the Sard's hills, and to make a formal apology. Otherwise, preparations for an immediate declaration of war are already underway. Be it so. Zeno took over. The envoys have no intention of harming you, and in the event of a breakdown in diplomatic relations between our two countries, they are to remain in the palace of Obsidian until they are disarmed and peace is made. I apologize for my behavior, but please understand that the international situation and your Grand Duke's intentions have caused this, and I ask that you surrender your swords immediately and follow our orders. I would also like to ask His Excellency, Count Elia, to remain in his separate quarters until it becomes clear to Emperor Gura that His Majesty, Emperor Saul, has not willingly participated in the Ulanian plot. Wait, wait, wait. You've got it all wrong. Judius, Count Judith, do not tell me that he is not your military commander. It is true that there is a Judius, Count Judith, in our country, but there is no way that you can call him that, much less. Excuse me, Baron Leroy. 
I'm sure we'll have occasion to discuss this later. Now that the preparations for a declaration of war against Urania have been issued, we will only faithfully carry out the orders of His Majesty Achilles. Gwyn stepped out. Baron Leroy, envoy of Eulania. Disarm you and leave you in the custody of the Order of the Golden Dog for the time being. Or, if you insist, you're dirty, leopard. Baron Leroy said firmly, but the armament was originally only a form of formal wear. He had no intention of resisting the elite of Chironia from the start. I'll pay you back one day, I promise. He spat out a slogan and violently removed the sword from his waist and threw it out. Seeing this, Rokatsu looked relieved, and the others followed suit. As Zenon squared his jaw, several knights ran to him and gathered their swords. A few of them also approached and checked to see if he had any swords or poisons in his possession. It looks good. All right, Pearson, I'll show you and your party to the Black Palace. Baron, I'll bring you your belongings in the morning. You'll be staying with us as guests of the Order of the Golden Dog until the order to end the war against Eulania is issued. Please forgive my rudeness. Louis. Count Elia to the Red Chamber of the Three Days Palace. The ambassadors did not take any further action. If you take it badly, it seems as if they had already anticipated this eventuality. After the group was taken away, Zeno looked up at Gwyn. Is this what you want, Gwyn? Yeah. Are you sure there's nothing wrong? And, I think. Please report to His Majesty. I'll make sure there's nothing wrong with the group's treatment. Return directly to the Hall of Mirrors, Lord Zeno. And you are. I'll do the same. And later, in the mirror room. Yeah. Gwyn and Xenon nodded at each other and disappeared in different directions. Slightly, so. He. There's a quiet exhalation and Valerius appears from the trees. He's grinning and stroking his chin. This guy's in trouble. He murmured. The Battle of Chironia has broken out. It's been less than a year since the Black Dragon War finally came to a complete end. This is great, all kinds of great. I must immediately contact the regent. I'm sure he'll come up with some more interesting uses for the tariff and the cum strategy. Lord Linus seems to be obsessed with Jang Fonglon. No one will notice if I'm not here. All right, I'll call Dylan now and have him fly to the crystal right away. I was about to step out, mumbling. Paro Deputy Valerius Mage Witch. A heavy, hoarse voice said. Hiya. Valerius literally jumped out of his skin. Gwyn. Looks like you got the whole story. Gwyn was standing there. Still calm and collected as ever. Oh, my God. Valerius patted his chest. What are you? Gwyn the Hundred Dragon Chief. You're a mage and you don't even notice me. No. Oh, and just so you know, I'm a mage, not a mage. Don't you? No, I don't. A knight, an archer, a soldier. A mage is a soldier who serves his country with witchcraft. A mage is licensed by the Mage Guild to teach magic to others. I'm a first-class mage licensed by the Crystal Mage Guild. I'd like you to join me. I'm sorry I didn't know that. Gwyn's eyes twinkled with some amusement. Be that as it may, you heard the whole thing. It was my fault for not paying attention but I had no choice since I didn't think the mage was hiding. Now that you've heard, I'm sorry to inconvenience you, but you'll have to stay with the Yolanian delegation for a while. Do you want to forbid me, Gwyn the Hundred Dragon Chief? Not for long. A formal declaration of war against Urania will be issued by Chironia in a day or two, at most. I'll send my regards to Lord Linus. Thank you for your company, Mage Valerius. No kidding. Valerius took a cautious step back from Gwyn. Linus will not be satisfied without me. No amount of reasoning will deceive him. Do you want me to send Chironia to wage war against Paro and Urania at once? I don't think so. Hmm. What what is that, creepy? Why are you staring at people like that and nodding like you mean it? You've changed a lot since the last time we had a party, but that's your true nature, isn't it? I see. What, what, I see. Valerius looked up at Gwyn's face, which was three heads higher than his own, with a strange, peculiar expression in his dark gray eyes. 
It was dark, sullen, and sullen, but at the same time it had a glittering light in it, as if it were strangely amused, and it had a look of irony, cynicism, and wisdom in it that could only be described as unique. I had my doubts, Mage Valerius. Gwyn said, watching Valerius closely with Topaz's eyes. What, Leopard? I'm sorry if I've offended you in any way, but this congratulatory mission of Paros, well, it's something, isn't it? What do you mean, what's out there? I'm sorry to say this, but Lord Linus, the legate, is a very bright and well-bred man with a nice personality, but he seems a bit too well-bred to be the emissary who sent the famous Paro into such a complicated situation. Otherwise, if your meekness is theatrics, you're as much of a mischief-maker as Lord Crystal himself, as they say. But then again, you are too lowly ranking to be a deputy, and too closely attached to the legate to be a mere attendant. What do you mean, Leopard? In other words, I was playing a trick on you. He's a mage, a true messenger of Paro, a crystal regent, and his eyes, ears, and nose, that's you, isn't it? Are you saying that I am Lord Nerus's spies, sent under the pretense of Lord Linus to spy on the goings-on in Chironia and the foreign nations involved in Chironia? No. Valerius was a little lost. Then he smirked. Think what you will, leopard. I have seen and heard many things, but I am under no obligation to report them all to you, Lord Nerus. And Paro has no intention of starting a war with Chironia now. Rest assured, if you want me to keep quiet about Eulania, I'll keep quiet until you say it's all right to report. And I'm Lord Linus' protege, not Paro's warlord or Aldo Nerus' mage to the Crystal Duke. I follow Linus like a shadow, just as the young lord has done since he was ten. I'm loyal to Paro, of course, but for now, making enemies of you and Chironia will do neither of my two most precious things, Paro or Lord Linus, any good. Do you believe me? Ho! Oh. Gwyn said with amusement, staring at Valerius. He flinched a little at the fierce power of the yellow eyes, but Valerius' gray eyes rebounded firmly. You seem to speak very frankly for Aparo. After a moment, Gwyn said. Why? When it's best to speak plainly, I will. Trust me, it's better for both of us if you give up house arrest. I don't want any trouble here, and you're very interesting. I'd like to show you to Lord Nerys and see what he has to say about you. Ho. Oh. And Gwyn said. You don't seem to like Lord Crystal, do you? No way. He's just too bright for a lowly mage like me. That's all. Valerius had grown somewhat comfortable and chuckled. It's a feast for the eyes, though. Well, no, Leopard, I won't tell anyone what I've seen here until you say it's okay. I think I'd be better off if I just loaned it to you. How's that? Once more Gwyn fixed Valerius with a trusting gaze. Then he nodded gravely. Very well. Good grief. I'm not that confident in witchcraft yet either. I don't want to get into a sword versus sword fight with you here. You're a funny man, aren't you? Gwyn says, as if to declare, gravely as ever. What's so funny? I don't think I've ever heard of a joke or an anecdote. No, not really. I just thought that Paro had some pretty interesting characters. Not as good as you, Leopard. Not as good as you. Valerius closed one eye. I've seen a lot more interesting things here tonight than the Battle of Urania. I'm talking about the big, fat Xenon. That lad's a thousand dog general and you're a hundred dragon chief. But that boy bowed to you and said, Are you sure there's nothing you can do to help me, Mr. Hayakuricho? In other words, it is not the generals but a leopard that controls the confinement of the Ulanian delegation and other military secrets of Chironia. It just so happens he's old enough to be respectful. That's how Paro people take care of themselves. You've only been here a few months, I'm told. Actually, I don't care about Eulania. You're the funny one, Gwyn the Dragon Chief. I don't know if I should tell Lord Nerys about him. Let me ask you something. Yeah, what is it? Do you think Remus will make a good king? Yeah. Valerius scratched his chin with one finger. Yes, you do. I don't think it's impossible. In any case, it's better to be a perfect king than a 16-year-old. We know that all too well. 
We pretend not to notice when you slip on the edge of your cloak. But there are two people who find it hard. Who is it? His Majesty Remus and Lady Nerith. Valerius chuckled. His Majesty has been so busy trying to maintain his dignity that he has forgotten how to laugh. My noble regent, who I don't think has any ulterior motives, has a habit of slipping and falling on the bark of a column and then gracefully stepping over it. If I were his majesty, I'd roll my eyes and applaud him and praise the duke. You're an interesting man, Valerius. Again, Gwyn said. But Remus worries me. I've always been worried about that strange, stubborn thing he has. Linda's not mature enough to make up for that. Rather, the more someone tried to help him, the more humiliated the boy would feel and the more he would retreat into his shell. Five more years, five more years is all that matters to Paro. You know his majesty better than I do. Valerius laughed, his face scrunched up in a smile. It would be greatly appreciated if Chironia would stay out of Eulania's way for another five years. And hey, isn't there a single young lord in Chironia who would be willing to marry a sixteen-year-old princess? Even a prince who is betrothed to his own country's princess is not a suitable choice. Gwyn laughed a short barking laugh. It's been a pleasure speaking with you, Valerius. The king will not be disappointed, Valerius murmured. Then, with great care, he gave the king the bow of the knee. Forgive me, my liege, Valerius said, smirking. When I return to Paro, I will advise Lord Nerys not to invade Chironia for the time being. Thank you for that. No, no need to thank me. As soon as I say so, the last thing the Prince of Saria will do is to send a secret agent to find out the weakness of Chironia. He needs to believe that he's got the upper hand by taking advantage of his opponent's weakness. It's the most impossible thing to trust a man and give him your clogs. He'd make a great prime minister. That's what makes him different from you. Valerius held out his skinny, bony hand. Let's shake hands. Soon you'll be a general in Chironia. I'll remember your name, Valerius. Pray to Janus that I don't remember that on the battlefield of Paro Silonia. I'd hate to have to fight you. I'll take that as a compliment. The ball is about to begin. You're not going. Valerius thought for a moment, and then shrugged his skinny shoulders. If Linus isn't hiding behind a curtain in some antechamber with that bitch, I'll bet a run you are. Come with me. Gwyn, if you don't mind. Otherwise, you might think I'm sending for Lord Nerys at once. I wouldn't do that. No, you're a cautious man. Apart from the fact that you have a lot of faith in people. Besides, I'd, I'd like to talk to you a little bit more. I know I'm not the only one who thinks that, but I've always had bad luck. The two walk side by side towards the Obsidian Palace. The huge leopard-headed warrior and the skinny gray-eyed mage, whose chest was only just below the waist, it was a very strange and contrasting combination. It seemed that the ball was about to begin. The wind carried the sound of gongs being struck, and the murmur of people could be heard far away. The night of the silence was still in its early hours. A series of gongs sounded, signaling the start of tonight's final event, the Grand Ball. At the end of the gongs, the trumpets were blown in unison, and the thick curtains that hung on all sides of the mirror room were quickly drawn up. The partitions have been removed so that the evening's festivities can be seen from the garden, and the mirror room is designed to appear as if it were the reverberations of the gods above. Countless lights dazzled in the sky, and the ladies of the court in one corner numbered as many as a hundred tonight. A crowd of nobles and foreign envoys lined up in front of the four entrances, waiting to enter. This was the last official event of the two-day celebration, and also the most spectacular, so people were dressed in all their glory as if this was the first step. And for the celebration and the parade, they had to wear the official attire. At the ball, they could wear whatever they wanted, and this was the showpiece for the ladies. Most of the noblewomen and the fashionable aristocrats, having reserved a room for the purpose, left the banquet in the middle of the day and changed their clothes for the first and last time on that day for the ball. Many of them did not wish to appear in the same costume for the banquet in the open air, where a large number of people were gathered, and in the palace, where only a select few were present. Here and there, costumes with elaborate designs could be seen. Some of the costumes were so elaborate that, to be honest, 
one could not help feeling that they were offensive. Originally, the Cilician people were rather fond of flamboyance and excess, and did not care for refinement that was almost too much, as in the case of Paro. There they lingered, in Kumulai costumes, in Katailai costumes, in Chironian folk costumes, and in every other manner. They looked at each other in secret, judging each other's goods, and if they were of the opposite sex, they asked each other in secret which of them they preferred, and if they were of the same sex. They looked at each other inquiringly to see which of them was the most fashionable, dapper, or beautiful of the night. Some of them, like Zhang Fang Ran and Linus, had not yet appeared here, but even though this was an official event, it was not a formal one, so they did not have to be there from the beginning, and could come and go as they pleased. However, except for such a somewhat insolent case, there was no one who did not want to take advantage of such a large ball and get as close as possible to the person of one's choice. Eventually, the head musician raised his hand. As soon as the trumpets were blown, the beautiful and sad melody of the Chironian waltz flowed out at once from fifty kithras, thirty lutes, and twenty flutes. The guests let out an inaudible cry. Please, come in, come in, come in. Even the murmurs of the peasants were drowned out. As expected of a group of high-ranking officials, aristocrats, and ladies, they did not crowd into the hall in a hurried manner and haggle with each other. They entered the hall in an orderly fashion, but with great anticipation, coming from all sides. The Hall of Mirrors had been specially decorated for this memorable event. In contrast to the previous day, countless lamps were attached to the walls, glittering brightly. The antechamber next door was again filled with sweets, fruits, drinks, and chairs, and many waiters were waiting to serve. In the mirror room, however, all the furniture has been removed in order to make way for the dance, and there is nothing but an abundance of flowers everywhere. The people stepped out hand in hand into this clean, spacious hall. The rousing Chironian waltz was now being played with great pomp. But there was still no one to dance. Everyone waited patiently. Eventually, a group of the twelve electors entered the hall, receiving applause. The dignified Marquis d'Antoine, the sun-godlike Marquis de Wallstead, the mild-mannered Marquis d'Atuquia, the hand-carried Marquis de Rhodes, the sharp-eyed Marquis de Verdeland, the dark-skinned Marquis de Ronsania, the diminutive Marquis de Sardes, the lithe and dapper Marquis de La Salle, the fearless Marquis de Hermit. The scholarly Marquis de Frigidaire with the exception of the Marquis of Langobard, Hazos, and the Marquis of Denay, Laos. The ten electors gathered together in this manner was like a gathering of the twelve gods of Janus, dignified and all. Then, once the Chironian waltz is stopped, the fanfare sounds again. Princess Chironia, Your Highness Sylvia. Princess Sylvia appeared in the midst of the people's applause and attention, flanked by a group of maidens. Sylvia also changed her clothes and put on a special dress for the occasion. All the costumes used for this celebration were designed by Caris of Paro and were mostly white. This last dress was also white, but with only Paro lace like frosted snow, and underneath she wore a slender dress of crimson silk, so that the pure white lace flowed easily through the crimson silk. It was a wonderful view. On the shoulders of the slender Sylvia, Huge rose-like ornaments of lace were fastened with pearls, and from them flowed down the lines of her graceful body, the lace bubbling with fluff. It was a very unusual dress, as if it had not been sewn or shaped at all, but of course it had been fastened so tightly by Paro's supreme skill that it had never lost its shape. Sylvia's golden-brown hair, adorned with flowers, jewels, and lace, was pulled down in a maidenly manner. Thanks to her well-thought-out appearance, which accentuated her beauty and hid her flaws, people were buzzing when she appeared, but tonight, to Sylvia's satisfaction, she looked beautiful, gorgeous, and worthy of being the star of the evening. And above all, she was innocent, pretty and dainty. Sylvia stepped out, her cheeks flushed, her heart thrilled with her secret intentions, and bowed like a butterfly, pinching the hem of her dress before stepping up to the raised throne. There was a fanfare. His Majesty Achilles Chironius, Emperor of Chironia, rise. Malk. Malk Chiron. Their cries stirred the mirror room. Some of them may have suspected that the Empress would show herself at least on this last good night, but no one made any secret of it for the time being. For now, it was more important to pursue the pleasure at hand. 
Malk, Malk, long live the emperor. Greeted by cheering voices, Achilles the Great was finally seated. Dressed in a scarlet velvet mantle with a fur rim, a short crown, and a king's tin, and led by two maidservants and flanked by two heroes, Gwyn and Zenon, and accompanied by the chief of the king's guard, the chief of the protectorate, the minister of the interior, and the chief lady of the court, the emperor Achilles entered, responded to the cheers of the people with a wave of his hand, and took his place on the throne. And then he lifted his right hand cautiously. Immediately, he tells the people, who have become still and silent, that this is the last of the celebrations to commemorate his accession to the throne, and that he hopes they will enjoy it fully, without any trivialities. When the emperor sat down again, the people erupted in laughter. The ball was about to begin. The chief musician's hand went up again, and the introduction to the Chironian waltz began. Quickly, the people fell to their knees. Finally, the moment of trouble was approaching. Who will Sylvia dance with at the very least? People know that this is no longer a direct result of the selection of a son-in-law. However, we also know that there is a strong possibility that the one chosen here will be the candidate for Sylvia's son-in-law again. The fact that Sylvia was in love with Demos, Marquis of Waldstad, was also a well-known fact but the whole court knew that even a princess could not keep up an unrequited love for a man with a wife and child, and that she would naturally think of her son-in-law differently. Therefore, the young, the not-so-young, the single, the little, whatever Sylvia might choose on a whim, she would wear to the full tonight, hoping to catch Sylvia's eye in any way she could, like a Baltic bird fluttering its feathers to attract a female. He was planning to get to the front somehow. Even if Sylvia was not a great beauty, the glory and wealth of greater Cylonia that she carried was more than enough to dazzle the people. Those who are in a position where they do not know the responsibility and burden that comes with being the ruler of a country are more attracted to the magnificence, the wealth and the power of the ruler. Some of them openly said that if they were the Marquis of Waldstad, they would leave their wives and become the sons-in-law of the princess, even at the risk of incurring the wrath of the Marquis of Antenne. And who will be Sylvia's first partner? There is no one in the court of Cylonia today who can be said to be a perfect match in terms of age, status, etc., for a 19-year-old princess. All of the twelve electors, with the exception of the Marquises Denay and Rhodes, were either old or married. But even among their sons, for example, Aulus Alain, son of the Marquis of Antenne, was 15, Viscount Malone, son of the Marquis of Accia was fourteen, and the rest were much younger. Zenon, a thousand-dog warlord, is a brave and single man of twenty years old, but he is not a nobleman of noble birth, having the blood of a Toluan, which people hate. The young Paulin is already engaged to the youngest daughter of the Marquis of Ronsania, and the emperor's distant relative Prince Caius will wed the only daughter of General Almerian next spring. That's why the young and lowly, the old and high, the divorced nobleman and the bereaved, who are usually not the target of the game, are so anxious to get into Sylvia's good graces. Everyone knows that Sylvia openly approaches the Marquis of Wallstad and declares that she doesn't want a man who isn't beautiful. Now that both the Marquis of Denay and Viscount Baldur had been shunned, no one had any idea where Sylvia's intentions lay. The Chironian waltz flows high and low. People are watching Sylvia with bated breath. Of course, at this time, no one noticed that some people who should have been there, such as the Eulanian envoys, Linus and Chan Van Lang, were not seen. On the contrary. On the contrary. At least Valerius, as usual, might have been aware of it, but on this occasion the people could not help noticing that Gwyn, one of the two heroes who stood like two statues behind Achilles the Great, was nowhere to be seen. Gwyn, one of the two heroes who stood like two statues behind Achilles the Great. The Chironian waltz sounded intriguing. Sylvia's eyes wandered, searching for someone, as if she was waiting for something. Only the beautiful Chironian waltz flows between the mirrors, where silence has fallen. The crowd was buzzing, people were buzzing. Sylvia looked around frantically. Her eyes dimmed with embarrassment, disappointment, and indignation. Chironia Waltz. The musicians went back to the beginning of the piece and started over again. People are standing around like the people of Canaan who were turned to stone. Sylvia's eyes were wide open, 
and she blinked repeatedly as if seeking salvation. But, what I saw did not appear in this hall at all. Only the melancholy melody of the Chironian waltz flows among the dead people. A little while ago, something crept up on Gwyn, who stood firmly at the right back of Achilles the Great. He is a minor surname of the Great Emperor, Hunter Dragon Chief. What? Come here for a minute. The Emperor nodded, and Gwyn slipped quietly into the curtain behind the throne, leaving the people to wait for Sylvia's selection of a son-in-law. The Lady of the House. Okay. In the darkness of the corridor stood Iris. She has the appearance of a courtesan of Darius, and her eyes glow in the darkness. It's good to see you, finally. She cried out and she said, I didn't know what to do. No matter how hard I looked during the party, I couldn't find him. I've been a little busy. What? Give me your strength. Marius. I finally found you. Where is it? Paris is bringing me to the princess's antechamber. I can't do this alone. Lead the way. Yes. Led by Octavia, Gwyn stood before the resting room for the princess. What are you going to do? There's no time for complacency. The Chironian waltz has begun. Take me to the hall and be done with it. There's the Paro embassy. Ha! Huh? No, it's nothing. Princess, in a woman's voice, call Paris and tell her it's for Sylvia. Yes. Madam Paris. Mr. Paris. Lady Sylvia commands you to come quickly. There was a cry from inside the room and the door was opened. Gwyn ducks behind a pillar. Paris seems not to have suspected Octavia, who has turned her face away. Paris had pulled the cloak over his head. Hurry up. It's the princess dress. There was a glimmer of fire in his little eyes and Paris said to him. Then, Og. A low moan escaped Paris's mouth. Gwyn's fist shot out and landed squarely in Paris. Midsection, knocking her unconscious and crumpled. Oh, my God. You really are. Octavia puts her hand over her mouth. This Paris is Sylvia's bodyguard because of her skill. He's like a child to you. There's no time for that. Take off the cape. No, someone's coming. In the small room over there. Yes, sir. They pulled the cloaked one into an empty room. They pull off the cloak, and from below appeared the figure of Marius. He is dressed as a nobleman of the court, his hair is combed, he wears a copper ring. He still wore his bandages, but they had been replaced with new ones. Marius, Marius, Octavia shouted when she saw it. Show, but no response from Marius. Her eyes were blank, like those of a doll. Marius, yes, my name is Marius the Bard. I adore you, Lady Sylvia, with all my heart. A muffled voice came out, not unlike Marius's. Octavia's willow brow furrowed. But Gwyn stopped her. I think you've been hypnotized. Once you're out, I think it'll go away when you wake up. Octavia screamed as Gwyn raised his huge fist once more. Stop, Gwyn. She's not like Paris. He's built too thin and he's sick. If you hit him, he'll die before the spell wears off. Don't worry. I'll go easy on you. Please, Gwyn, I have the potion. The Black Lotus Potion. It'll put you to sleep. A woman in love is a woman who can't help it. Gwyn chuckled. Okay. Then that's it. I've got to get back. Have you found a place to hide? Yes. I tricked Grand Duke Darius into opening one of his small rooms for me. Where is it? Five Days Palace. The Grand Duke has always been in the mirror room, so he's fine. All right. Stay there and hide until the ball is nearly over and the Emperor has left. Don't move. I'll accompany the Emperor as soon as he leaves and get you safely out of Wind Hill. What happens after that is for you to figure out. I'm done with this guy, Gwyn. I don't know anything about that. And the Emperor wants me to meet with his son after the great ceremony. I'm trying to figure out what to do. Until then, stay in the city and don't make any sudden moves. If you stir things up any further you'll never be able to get everything back. Okay, okay, for now, anyway, 
I'm not doing anything until we get Marius out of here. Oh, thank you, Gwyn. If there's one thing I've learned, it's that it's best to leave the silence with your loved ones and not cross any more dangerous bridges and mock the world, people and yourself. Didn't I tell you not to talk about it anymore? Octavia's mouth tightened. Gwyn shrugged. Then I'll go. The sooner you bring Marius to his senses and keep him asleep until I'm done, the better. Understood. Yeah. Okay. Be careful. Gwyn went outside, picked up Paris, who was still lying in the hallway, and went back to Octavia's room and put her on the couch. Come on, let's go. Yes. He watched as Octavia put her cloak on Marius, who obediently followed her, and took him by the hand as they ran off. As he drew nearer, the sound of the Chironian waltz enveloped him like a crashing wave. Clara! Sylvia shrieked. Yes, sir. Clara, go find Paris. Why don't you bring that thing here and tell him to come quick? Come on. Yes, sir. Clara's running away. But the people in the mirror room did not move. They stand uncomfortably still, their breaths hushed, their eyes glued to each other as they secretly comment on the situation. But even that silence. Gradually, the whispers, murmurs, blinks, and murmurs began to overwhelm me. Sylvia was somewhat pale, her hands twisting nervously as she stood there. As long as Sylvia did not begin to dance, the others could not dance either. In vain, only the Chironian waltz, played by the musicians, had already begun its third or fourth introduction. Here, here, Sylvia. The great empress called out to him. What's the matter? The ball can't start until you start. Take my hand and get in the middle. What's wrong? Yes, father. At that time, Sylvia realized that her carriage was not going well. She has always been a fickle girl, prone to mood swings. She was badly offended that things had not turned out as she had hoped. Her lips must have been drawn tightly together and her head leaned straight back. In that way she looked just like her mother. Sylvia tucked her chin, picked up the hem of her dress, and slowly walked down the two or three steps from the throne to the hall. The people on the full throne looked at Sylvia again. She looked around her as if she were thinking how she could make up for this, how she could make the people of the full house astonished. Young men, single men, divorced aristocrats, stepped forward casually, as if to show themselves off. The Chironian waltz is stirred to a rapid pitch. At last, as the people watch on, the tension is back. A fierce, challenging light flashed in Sylvia's eyes. She bit down on her lip and went straight down the hall. People are shaking. Her head bared proudly, the challenging light twinkling in her eyes. The young Princess Chironia looks straight at you. In the midst of the murmur of the people and the silence, Sylvia gracefully pinched the hem of her dress with her left hand. Will you dance with me, my lord? Lord Demos of Wolstad. Then she held out her crisp white right hand to the man's eyes. People were buzzing. Like a reed bed swept by the wind, the hall is filled with chattering, whispering, and creeping voices. In the midst of it all, Sylvia looks straight at Dimos, holds out her hand, and doesn't move. The Marquis of Waldstad's incomparably beautiful manly face turned as blue as paper. But Demos, in spite of his good health, did not look back at Alexandria, the great emperor, or his fellow electors. He had a tight smile on his face and bowed his knees in a gracious manner. I'm your servant, your highness, Demos said in a strained voice. I am unworthy to lay hands on your highness pure and noble hands. Please forgive the stain on my hands. Then Demos gently took the girl's hand and nuzzled the back of her hand, forcing her to return it. The air in the hall froze. One of the minstrels played a cacophony of crazy chords. Sylvia stood there with a blank face, like a child who has lost her way. Then, finally, she smiled faintly and looked at the people. Indeed, she had courage. My apologies, Lord Demos of Wolstad, she said, looking around the hall. Then, suddenly, a fighting light came back into her eyes, and she walked, head bobbing, to the other side of the hall under the gaze of the people once more. And just then, he motioned to his opponent, who was about to enter, to stop, and smiled at him. Do not dance with me. Gwyn, the dragon chief. 
people were in an uproar. Silvio looked up at the tall leopard-headed warrior with a faint smile on her face and a look in her eyes as if she were about to burst into tears. He looked up at the tall leopard-headed warrior with eyes that seemed on the verge of crying out, as if he were saying, I've already humiliated myself, so you'd better hurry up and humiliate me. Gwyn said carefully, If it's all right with you that I'm not a very nice person, I'd be happy to. He said, and took the girl's slender hand in his strong one. He led Sylvia, who seemed somewhat embarrassed by what she had done, out into the middle of the hall, where people were looking on noisily. The cloak fluttered. It was not a slippery gesture, but it was graceful enough for a man of his stature. Oh! A cloud of inaudible breaths splashed against the ceiling of the mirror room. The people were stunned, their mouths gaping or their eyes rolling up in their heads. Sylvia's eyes finally lit up with joy. It's music. Strangely, the voice of the Emperor Achilles rang out as if he had come to his senses. The people came to their senses. Then, one by one, they take the hands of their partners and follow this pair into the center of the hall. Once again, as the sound of the Chironian waltz increased, Achilles, alone, began to laugh aloud with amusement at what he thought. And, the hall was already a whirlpool of music, laughter, and dancing. The combination of the huge, leopard-headed, Silenian-looking centurion and the princess of Chironia, dressed in a white lace of snowflakes, was dancing quite beautifully, whirling and stepping and fluttering and twirling with Sylvia. Gwyn stood out from the crowd, and Sylvia's head was just below his armpit, like an adult and a child, but in that way she looked lovely. People rolled their eyes at them as they passed by, and mistook their steps. I didn't expect you to dance so well. Sylvia whispered into Gwyn's chest as she let herself be carried away by the music of the waltz. Ha! Huh. You look like you've never danced before, and I'm telling you, you never miss a step. I'm afraid so. I'm not complimenting you. I'm saying it's a shame that I chose you because I wanted to show you how stuck you are because you can't dance. Spinning, 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 Sylvia spun around like a flower in the wind and was held in Gwyn's hands without losing her breath. But you're so big, you know that. I feel like a little kid. Is your head so high up that you can't hear what I'm saying? Strangely enough, Sylvia had forgotten all about the humiliation of being rejected by Demos earlier, and was in a good mood. Because she realized that this was much more sensational than a minstrel for outwitting the whole court. And she could tell from the way they looked at her that all the women in the court were jealous and envious of her for succeeding in dragging Gwyn out. She was so proud of herself that even her frequent antipathy toward Gwyn melted away. I thought you only had a brain for swords. Can you play an instrument? No, it's a bad law. Nothing. Hmm, yeah. You can't sing, can you? Not with that leopard head. Fully on board, she turned her head away and laughed out loud. Oh. I can't sing. I can play the kithara. The lute, the flute, the twelve-string zither, the bamboo flute, everything. I can read and write in ten languages. I can embroider, knit lace, make garlands, design jewels, everything. Hey! Sylvia stared up at Gwyn and forgot to take a step. Is that a real head? I don't know. I want to know, too. Ugly, don't you think it's shameful to have such a strange figure? I think but there's nothing we can do about it. Oh, that's not true. Why don't you go to the spell path? There's more wizards there than anywhere else in the world. I'm sure someone will take the leopard's head. Yeah. I've been thinking about it for a while. The way you speak to me is insolent. You know I'm Princess Chelonia and I'm your lord's princess. Oh. If you don't like it, please forgive me. Well, I can't help it. You're a leopard, after all, and I've heard you talk like that to your father. I'll give you a special dispensation, usually I'm very particular about how I talk to you. You should be grateful. I'm afraid so. Hey. Sylvia let out a sweet voice and looked up at Gwyn. Why didn't you say no? You saw how I was rejected by Demos. I knew you'd humiliate me by saying no. What makes you think I would do such a thing? That's why. Sylvia looks up at Gwyn again. You're good friends with Hazos, which means you're good friends with Dimos, 
and I've been pretty hard on you in the past, haven't I? Didn't you ever think about getting back at me? It would have been the perfect opportunity. I have no wish to avenge her. As a young virgin, I think it only natural that you should feel sorry for such an aberration. Oh, Sylvia thought for a moment. Then he suddenly got angry. I'll never forgive you if you think you saw me humiliated and took pity on me. I don't want your pity. I'll throw myself to my death if I have to. No sympathy, no pity. Gwyn shook his head. Then why? The princess is a young and beautiful woman. A young, beautiful, noble woman has the right to make a man obey her commands. I believe that's the right Janice gave her. As long as it's not abused. Oh. And Sylvia said. Then he danced in silence for a little while, and then suddenly said. So, you think I'm young and beautiful? Of course. But but I. A little later, in a low voice, he said. But I'm not as beautiful as the much-vaunted Lady Amneris of Mongol or Princess Linda of Paro. That's none of your business. Every young girl has her own unique beauty. Different kinds of flowers have different scents, colors and shapes. But all flowers are beautiful. But it's no match for the dazzlingly gorgeous Amneria and the tiny Marinia of the field. That's not true. I'm sure there are many men who would find Molinia more endearing than Amneria. What about you? Sylvia said, fearfully. Gwyn's eyes grew soft. I don't like Amneria, who blooms in splendor and selfishness. From the beginning, I thought the princess was a pretty, innocent girl. Really? Sylvia said, and her cheeks flushed, and suddenly stopped in his tracks. I'm tired of dancing, Gwyn. She said arrogantly. I'm going to rest. Take me to the chair. Gwyn silently took Sylvia's hand and led her through the dancing people to a chair by the wall to sit down. I could really use a cold drink. I'll bring it to you. When Gwyn returned with a cool glass of column water from the waiter's hand, Sylvia gulped it down with a white throat. Then she looked up at Gwyn. Why don't you sit down instead of just standing there? If you don't mind. Or, if you want to dance with another woman, you can go to. No. Oh, my God, why? I'm not much of a dancer. I don't think so. You were dancing just now. Yeah. She looked at the whirling masses of people and was silent for a few moments, but then Sylvia said in a childlike tone, I don't know. Is it true what you said? I wonder which one. The question is, am I beautiful or not? Yeah. I think so. No one's ever said that to me before, ever. Sylvia clapped her eyes and shook her head. I've always known that I'm tiny, skinny, insignificant, and ordinary, that I'm nothing more than a princess of Chironia by accident of birth. The maidservants are always talking badly about me whenever they have time, and I don't think I'm as ugly as they make me out to be. I'm not as ugly as they make me out to be, but they talk about me as if I'm a parody of myself. But there's not a shred of truth in the court noble's claims of beauty. I, it's funny, I feel like I can believe anything you say. I feel as if all my worries have been lifted. The princess is beautiful and pretty enough. Honest and brave. You must be confident. And they're all surprised and envious of me. You're the hero of the court now. I'm relieved to see the look on your maids' faces even if it was out of pity. But, but please don't misunderstand me. I don't want you to think that just because I danced with you for the first time at this ball that that makes you a candidate for my son-in-law. After all, you're only a hundred dragon chief, a newcomer, and a leopard. I don't have to tell you, Gwyn said. I'm not misunderstanding you. Of course, if you were as ambitious as most people, you'd want to be Emperor of Chironia. I don't feel that way. I just want to know who I am and have this leopard head returned to human form, if possible. I heard the maids talking. You were an exiled king of Landoc. But now you're nothing but a mercenary. I don't know if he was banished or not, but apparently he was. All the maids are crazy about you. Even the leopard is talking about you, whether you have a human heart or not, your wonderful muscles, your attractiveness, and so on, these days. I heard you didn't dance with anyone last night. I was the first. Yeah. 
Gwyn. Yeah. Promise me you won't dance with anyone else tonight. Then you can dance with me again. I wasn't going to dance with any other women at all. Oh. So you're saying that I'm the reason you danced? Yeah. That's right. Why? Sylvia looked at Gwyn with a strange, searching look in her eyes. Because I'm your lord's daughter. Because I'm Princess Chelonia. Because you felt sorry for me, because I humiliated you. Or because, you thought I was beautiful. Well, any of them would. Sylvia tilted her head and stared at Gwyn. She was about to say something when a blue-faced man came in and knelt down in front of her, startling her and making her stop and furrow her brow. Oh, my God, Paris. Quietly, she said. What the hell are you doing? What do you think I told her to do? It's too late. I've already danced with this Gwyn. He's no use to me anymore. Give me a whip and I'll kick his ass to the silence. So, that. Paris looked at Gwyn and Sylvia with a pout on his lips and finally stammered out. That, Gwyn, the hunter dragon chief, stunned me, took back his men, and fled. What? Sylvia looked quickly at Gwyn. Tell me, Gwyn, the dragon chief. It's true. Yeah. Paris is right. You knew. Why did you have to do that? Sylvia stomped her little feet for the first time in a long time. Marius and I are friends by association, Gwyn said without hesitation. Besides, he's got a girl he's been dodging. So what? You keep getting in the way of everything I want to do. You mess with me every chance you get. I'm your daughter, your lord's daughter, your only daughter. Of course. And a young and beautiful maiden. There are plenty of men willing to become knights who would give up their lives for her if only she smiled at them. Just like me. It is an insult to the beauty and charm of the princess to use a man like Marius to act out a ruse. None of your business. You don't know what you're talking about but. Sylvia softened her tone a little. Then, um, then, Gwyn, you're willing to offer me a sword. Have you ever offered your sword to any girl before? Once, yes. But it was not for a sword, but for a knight to protect him and keep him safe. What would you think of me what would you think of? You know, with pleasure, Gwyn said, pulling the sword from its scabbard. He held out the hilt to Sylvia. Paris is watching all of this with her eyes rolled back in her head, seemingly unable to comprehend what is going on. Sylvia's eyes lit up. Almost bursting with pride, she shouted. See, Paris. The greatest warrior in the court, the greatest warrior in the world, who is a hundred times stronger than you, offers his sword to me for the first time. He will protect me and die when I tell him to. Do you see? I'm Sama, Paris said miserably. Sylvia kissed Gwyn's sword and returned it to its rightful owner. And Marius was completely forgotten. Dance for her one more time, Gwyn. Float, said Sylvia, and stood up. Deal with it. As you wish. Gwyn stands up and takes Sylvia's hand. When this pair of dancers entered the center of the hall, again to the murmur and buzz of the people, the music changed to Paro's elegant quadrille. Aulus. The Emperor Achilles, who had been sitting on his throne, drinking leisurely, stopped the Marquis de Alantane, who had come to greet him on his way out, and squared his shoulders toward the crowd in the hall. Ha! Very true. Marquis de Alentin smirks. What do you think? I think she's serious. He offered his sword to the princess. It's hard to keep him out of the way like that. Do you think Chironia will mind having Silenos as her king? What do you think, your majesty? What about Aulus? The two men looked at each other and exchanged a rather complicated laugh. It's a little premature. Aulus says. It's been less than six months since he arrived. I like him, you know. It is, sir, though I like it very much. So does Hazos, it seems. And his son-in-law, it seems. But, well, but, hmm. Well, that's fine. Women are always fickle. Anyway, when I went to Demos, my heart shrank. My son-in-law is completely distraught and has taken an early rest. He asks for your permission to return to his homeland immediately after the grand celebration. 
you'll be in peaceful Warstadt for a while. Till that splash girl's mind is put to rest. It seems to have quieted down for the moment. If it wasn't for that leopard head. I'd have no problem with it. Tomorrow, I'll call my good friend the mage and have him read your fortune. That's good. It's an unexpected turn of events. Maybe John's oracle. The great emperor followed him with his eyes. He looked strangely amused. Oh. Valerius, who had been perched on the wall like a black bat, turned around. Linus, who had approached him, gave him an embarrassed, resigned grin. Valerius. There you are. I've been looking for you. Valerius shrugged silently. Linus turned red. Ah, uh, you know. Cough it up and say. Don't tell Princess Minor. I'll give you whatever you want in exchange. I don't need anything. Be careful what happens next. No, it won't. Of course, tomorrow it'll be left and right. Still, it's true what they say about hot chicks. Eh, 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 eh. Look, I'm begging you, don't let Minor. All right, all right. You didn't leave any incriminating evidence, did you? It's not. Linus smiled a dumbfounded smile. What's all this noise? What's going on? There's a lot of commotion. It's not like you're spreading your wings, young man. Valeria said with a mixed feeling of sullenness and intense interest in what was going on before him. It's a big deal, all over the place. What's the matter with you? Maybe there's a new king in Chironia, sir. What? If things go smoothly, this could be a good thing or a bad thing for our country, the enemy seems to know our king very well. And with his strength and popularity he could be a formidable king. But will he really be? After all, he's a leopard. I wouldn't be at all surprised if he did. The way he acts it wouldn't surprise me at all if he were king now. I'm sure he'll be fine. But now, what are you mumbling about again, Valerius? Think of Chang Fong Lang, Master Linus. I'll tolerate you this time, but don't spread your wings too often or Valerius will punish you. I've never seen a princess like you, Minea, not even among all the noble ladies of Chironia. Oh, of course you're right. I love her very much, Valerius. I'm sure you do, Valerius replied blankly. His gray eyes blinked, fixed on one spot. There, needless to say, was a tall, deformed, leopard-headed warrior who stood out from the crowd. Have you noticed? When Marius opened his eyes, he saw a beautiful woman's face before him. What? For a moment Marius was puzzled. He thought he knew her very well, but for the life of him, he could not remember who she was. He had no idea where he was, or why he was here. After a few moments of stunned silence, Marius suddenly spoke up. Iris. Are you Iris? What's the matter with you, you look? Sure, I can hear you out there. Iris took control with her hand. There's a reason I'm dressed like this. We're in the Obsidian Palace. How do you feel? Bad. I feel like I have a bad hangover. What the hell's wrong with me? Paris caught me and was about to drag me to the ball as Sylvia's lover, and Gwyn, and I managed to save her. Iris explained the situation briefly. You know what? You're all going to get what's coming to you because you didn't listen to me or Gwyn. Ugh. Marius growled, dejected. Who is Paro's emissary? Linus, it's the Holy Knight Count. Yeah. Marius shuddered. He finally understood what he was on the brink of. Linus was the orphaned son of the vizier minister Ria. As a member of an extremely high-ranking noble family, he frequented the house of the holy kings and knew well the face of Aldo Neris' younger brother, Aldo Dean, of course. In fact, at one time, I even studied at the Royal Academy alongside him. Why? Oh, no, not really, Marius said, puzzled. Besides, that outfit, it's probably just a disguise but it's amazing. I don't know what's going on here. Maybe you were always a woman. You're beautiful. No, it's not beautiful. You're the woman of my dreams. Irana, yes, like Irana. Come on. Coolly, Iris said. I really don't want to do this, you know. But anyway, 
I have to hide myself from the public. Here, where? One of the rooms belonging to Grand Duke Darius in the Obsidian Palace. I'd really like you to leave here right now and leave the silence for good, but I can't leave tonight anyway and I don't want to leave you alone. It's a crowded place tonight. Gwyn said to lay low and that he'd come back when it was all over and take care of getting you out. I'm sure Gwyn will take care of everything. Until then, will you just sit tight? I don't think so. You're more curious than a child. If you were really bad, a little boy would pick you up and slap you on the butt. Ugh. I don't like the sound of such words coming from that beautiful woman's mouth. So, what are you going to do now? Me? Iris raised an eyebrow. I'm coming forward tonight. I'm coming before Empress Mariah as an accuser of my mother's murder and a claimant to what is rightfully mine, the throne. I don't have time for you anymore. Marius sniffed and, unusually, didn't say a word. Iris was also silent, looking at Marius with some concern. They sat in uncomfortable silence. The room was dark, and from the distance came the faint sound of the kithara and the murmur of the people. Caronia waltz. After a while, Marius murmured. His face looked so lonely that Iris was surprised. I remember. When you came to Hikariga Kako last night, this song flowed on the night wind from the window. Somehow, I always feel as if I'm singing this song alone, as a muffled echo of a happy murmur that is far away from the festival and doesn't let me in. I'll never sing anything but the Chironian waltz for the rest of my life. Iris. Yeah, Iris. Oh. Why, oh why, does Gwyn and you and everyone else want me to go away, to leave the silence, to go away? Is my existence such a hindrance to you? Am I really that much of a burden to you? You're not getting any, said an angry Iris. From now on, it's as if I'm on the battlefield too. I won't be able to wield my sword freely while protecting you. Am I really that much of a weakling? Marius said sadly. Yes, it's true that I'm not as strong as Gwyn, and I'm much weaker than you, Baldur, or Paris, but at least I can use a sword. I think I even helped you once. That's not the point. You don't like killing or bloodshed and you've never had a fighting spirit. There are plenty of mercenaries much weaker than you who've made their mark as mercenaries. Marius, I have a funny feeling about you. Sometimes I feel like you're a little girl. You don't want to fight, you don't want to hurt people, and you have no ambition to be a king or to make a name for yourself. It suits you to gaze at flowers, sing songs, love people and live in the sun. That's why you can't fight at all even if your sword is sharp. Seeing you like that makes my heart waver too. That's why I don't want you here anymore. I don't want you here. It's like leaving a girl on the battlefield. I'm not strong enough to fight and protect you. I'm much more desperate now. You have to understand, Marius. I'm not a woman. Marius said indignantly, I'm a man. I'm not a girl. I can take care of myself. What the hell are you doing protecting yourself? You're always giving me and Gwyn a hard time. I don't like it when you say that, but I'm still a man. As a man, I'm in love with you. And I know that's a funny thing to you, but I want to protect you. And you told me that you didn't hate me either. Then don't push me away like that. I don't want to change my way of life, but I'll change it for you. I'll give up the Kithra and become your sword and stay by your side. If you want to take the throne of Chironia, I'll go with you, even if I have to be killed by an assassin's sword, as a criminal and a traitor, and we can go up to the decapitation. Take me with you. I don't care about my life. Let me go with you to the hell of Dole, to the darkness of Solid, wherever you want. Just don't hate me. Don't tell me to get out of Silen. I really love you. Why? Why do you torment me so? Torment? Why? Because I'm trying to help you. If you don't want a man, I'm not gonna touch you. And I'm not asking you to like me. I'm just saying, I'll give my life for yours, and you can use it however you want. Like this. Marius fumbled at his waist. But he had no sword, so he was troubled. 
I don't have a sword here, and it doesn't look good, but if I had a sword here, I'd offer it to you. If it's in the way, you can push the hilt. Why don't you get it, you? Iris shouted, her blue eyes blazing with fury. You're not asking me to like you, are you? I love you. I love you. Don't you get it? I'm so screwed up, you've really gone off on me. I've never done anything so stupid in my life. Just when I thought I could finally get rid of my 25-year grudge and fulfill my destiny, a guy like you. Isn't that funny? Laugh all you like, but I'm crazy about you. That's why you're asking me to leave the silent world. I'm about to deal with all of Chironia, the twelve electors, the twelve heavenly generals, Chironia itself, the greatest country in the Middle Kingdom. At this point, if he catches me with some trivial idea that I'm crazy about you, and takes you hostage. Wait, 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 wait. Even Marius turned his head and shouted. Hey because, Iris, you're the prince of Achilles the Great, aren't you? The real one. You were ostracized by Empress Mariah's conspiracy, and now she's gone. So now you'll be crowned crown prince without question, won't you? How can you be rightly descended from Achilles, and have proof of it, and have no other son, and the Empress has fallen, and you're the enemy of Chironia? Do you have any idea why Achilles would object? Maybe you're not really Achilles' son, but a fraud who dares to take over Chironia as an imposter crown prince or... I don't want you to do anything stupid. I don't. Iris swallowed her spit. I have a secret. A secret you can't even dream of. Yes, I am in some ways a fraudulent imposter. I'm about to put on one of my biggest hoaxes ever for Kalonia. That's why I can't leave anything behind that might make me vulnerable. Understand. Marius stared at Iris, stunned. Then he clammed up and said, But, but if we go over that dangerous bridge, if we get caught. Decapitation, imprisonment for life, but it's worth it. I've lived my whole life to get what I wanted from my mother. I'd be happy to give up my life for it. Nonsense. There's nothing better than being alive. That's the kind of man you are, and I'll be damned if I fell in love with you. Iris said through clenched teeth. Please don't say another word. I don't care what you say, it doesn't change my mind. I've already said goodbye to you. I don't care if I miss you, that's not gonna hold me back. I'm leaving. I'm gonna go crazy if I stay here any longer. I don't care what happens to you. I'm going. Goodbye, Mr. Marius. Marius pondered. Iris gave it a crazy look and turned to leave with her hem flipped up. And, no. I can't let you go. Suddenly, Marius shouted. And he sprang up and stood before Iris. What are you doing, Marius? Don't play games with me. I'm not kidding. I didn't know. I thought you were the rightful crown prince, that you could take your place without any problems once the empress was out of the way. I thought that. If you were the crown prince of Chironia, you might not want to have a male lover, and that it would be better for me to leave. But if that's the case, you're not leaving. Don't make me laugh. You're not going. Iris is awful. You talk like a poet who doesn't know how to hold a sword. Do you want to be stunned once more? I may be weak, but I hate what's not right. I don't know what kind of secrets you have, but I'm not gonna let you pull off a scam like that. Move, Marius. It won't budge. I'm going to be really angry. Okay. I'd be happy to be killed by you. What good would it do me to cross the dangerous bridge and become an emperor? I'd much rather be a poet. Think again, Iris. Marius. Iris sniffed her lips just barely. Suddenly, his hand ran to the hem of his dress, and a dagger glinted in his hand. Iris put her sword to Marius' throat. Move. No. When I say move, move. I'm not gonna let anyone get in my way. I'm gonna stab you. Come in. I'd rather die than know that the woman I loved was not who I thought she was. I'd rather die than know that the man I loved was not what I thought he was. I'd rather die at your hands than see you decapitated. I'm never running away again. Marius. 
You think I can't kill you, don't you? I'm risking my life. I could kill you right now. I'm telling you to kill him. The two young men stared at each other like fire in a darkened room. Like a vision of a distant day, the flutter of the Chironian waltz danced in the air. But neither of us can hear it anymore. Iris's fingers clutched the dagger with such force that the joints turned white. What do you know, minstrel? Iris said, panting. How can I understand the feelings of a man who is undoubtedly of the blood of a rightful king, but who has been hindered, abused, and oppressed? How can a man who has no ambition, who plays idly with his kitera, understand the feelings of the flames of those who seek the throne of a kingdom? Can a man whore, who has no more than a lowly dream for the day, understand the anger of a king? It's you who don't understand. Anger turned Marius' bright eyes to black flames. He had not thought of himself, but as he turned pale and pursed his lips, he saw his brother's likeness. You don't know anything. You haven't seen the curse, the misfortune, the misery of being born into a royal family, the flesh and blood of brothers and sisters fighting for the throne, the people divided in two to fight for it, the transience and futility of the throne. You've only seen the dream in your mind. I say through my blood and tears. I don't want the throne. Royal blood be damned forever. I'd throw away my crown a thousand times to redeem a drop of blood from a boy of fourteen. I don't know what you're talking about, but you sound as if you've just abandoned your throne. Iris scoffed. The throne of a country is not the same as the seat of a merchant family's fortune or the seat of a local tycoon's successor. Don't talk as if you know something you don't. You're the one who doesn't know. In his anger, Marius didn't even notice that blood was flowing from his throat as he was hurt by the tip of Iris' sword. Why do you want me to tell you this? Why do you insist on bringing out and exposing the ghosts of my past, the ghosts I thought I had hidden away and buried? I'm not going to hide anything from you. Then if you accept my words as true, you'll never want the throne again. Yes. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. You can have me captured and held hostage or imprisoned or whatever you want. Marius, Marius, what's wrong? Something tells me you really not the same person. Hey, Marius what the? A little uneasy and frightened, Iris said and lowered her sword. But Marius paid no heed. His face had gone horribly pale. Now is the time to release the ghosts. And tell them the name you thought you'd never hear again. He whispered, his whole body shaking. I am not Marius. My name is Aldin, my father's name is Arsis, my mother's name is Debbie Elisa, prince of the holy kingdom of Paro in the middle kingdom and fourth in line to the throne. That is my true name.